Okay. All right. Hello, everyone. I'm Duncan Sparrow. I'm an old retired guy who, for the last eight years or so, has been running the predecessors to this village in this village. I uh, now in. Um, interesting. Is everyone on the Zoom seeing the meeting chat? Sure, we're not displaying your screen instead of mine. We're displaying your screen. It says there at the top. So it's displaying Duncan's screen. Yeah, except for I never saw the chat thing that was just yeah, up there. And I don't screen. see from Matt Roberts to everyone. Yeah, you don't, because that's on my screen. I mean, this is displaying your screen on my screen. Uh, sorry about that. We'll start over. Hello, everyone. I'm Duncan Sparrow. Uh, I'm a co-chair of the Southern Security Automation Village. Uh, welcome. This is now the sixth time we're running this or one of its predecessors. Um, we wanted to thank the sponsors of this event. Uh, we are here in physically, those of us in the room are here in Paraton's facility. We want to thank them for hosting. We'll turn it over to them for an intro in a minute. Uh, for those again in the room, we'll be having lunch as sponsored by Cyware. We'll thank them some more later. Just trying to avoid the audio. I don't know if the remote people are seeing it, but we're seeing some uh, visual issues here in the room. Uh, and then we also want to thank our logistics sponsor, the Open Cybersecurity Alliance and Open Project of Oasis. Um, some logistical issues, uh, particularly for those people in the room. Um, when we get to the Q&A sessions, most of the talks will be, first of all, let the speaker speak, and at the end, we'll ask for questions. If you're in the room, just physically raise your hand. Uh, if you're on Zoom, raise click the raise hand button in the Zoom. Uh, yes, you can ask questions in the chat and maybe other people will answer them in the chat, but we're gonna do the actual questions um, that will make it to the podium. Uh, we'll do the raise hand feature. Um, the schedule is available on the registration page um, for those who need it, for those in the room, there's some issue, there's uh, instructions here on how to log in. The screen will disappear in a minute. And if you have issues, contact some of the other people in the room and they will help you. For those of you in the room, the bathroom, this is a secure facility. The bathrooms are outside the secure door. So if you go out the door, you'll be able to get back in again, unless one of the local people are here with you. So tell them before you do that, if you want to get back in. Um, if you're hearing me, you're probably logged into the Zoom platform. A lot of people in the room may not be, they're allowed to be. Um, but if you are in the room and you do log into the Zoom, please shut off your speakers and please shut off your mic. We did some tests yesterday and it's really weird feedback stuff in here. Uh, and don't forget, there is a game associated with the um, uh, just an edu form of edutainment. Um, there's links to it. Um, if you can't find it, put it in the chat, put a link in the chat or whatever. Um, and there are prizes for those in the room. There's one contest for those in the room. You might win a $100 Amazon gift card, a $50 Barnes & Noble card, or a $50 Home Depot card. And sort of equivalent. Right now, right? So I'll... I'm... Oh, we need to meet somebody who's got their mic live. Oh, really? Do I, oh, I have this. Do I have this paper? Got a hot mic. Can we meet that? Somebody can maybe see who they can tell who's talking. Watch, is there a pin to start? I can't do it. I don't have that. The, the, for those, all right, for the game, while well, we're figuring out the audio stuff, the, uh, if you read the contest rules, which you probably should do before you start playing, you should read the how to play. If you read the contest rules, the pin for the people in the room is IRL. 411 in real life today's date uh, for the people on the phone. Um, it's hybrid 411. Um, and again, read read the rules. Um, it's a hacker game, so you probably shouldn't understand all the all the aspects before you do it. Um, and with that, why it's not advancing, I'm not sure. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Daniel Wackerman, who's the VP and GM of the National Aerospace Cybersecurity Business Unit on um, Paraton to welcome us to this facility. Do you have slides or no? Okay. All yours. Good morning. Welcome to the Plug Fest. Welcome, yeah. welcome to the Plum Fest. Yay! I'm still waiting on fireworks and strobe lights, and I don't <laughs> see them. Okay, draw a tool. I am not an old retired guy. I'm just an old guy. All right. <laughs> so, um, really, welcome to Plum Fest. I am Damien Wackerman, and I am the. Uh, it's okay. 
I'm the Vice President of the National and Aerospace Cybersecurity Business Unit. Um, why that's important is because at Paraton, we are focused on cyber. And very specifically, we have a whole sector dedicated to cyber, cybersecurity. We look at all aspects of it. The ingest, the enrichment, the collaboration, the correlation, got those reverse, and the dissemination. I always go back to the old TC pen from my IC days, but uh, I, I try to keep up with the times. We're all got. Okay, so we are very interested in this Plugfest. We are happy to be hosting this again. Uh, this is a very important event. A lot of good collaboration comes out of this cross talk and the sharing of ideas, which is really a lot of what this is all about, right? This is where we all gain knowledge and we're stronger for the nation as a group than we are as individuals. Um, if you have any questions during the day about the facility or about Paraton, find me, Rob, Matt, and where's Steve? There he is, right up front. I noticed this is just like uh, when I go to church, everybody sits towards the back. I get it. So I'm going to be followed by uh, Dr. Paul Lieber, and I'm going to have to read it because I did not memorize this one. But he is our chief data scientist for the cyber mission sector. As I said, we have a whole sector dedicated to cyber within uh, Paraton, and he's also an assist associate research faculty at UMD Arliss. And he's focused on shaping technology and strategic direction in areas such as information warfare, cyber, OSINT. And his expertise lies in data modeling model and decision making. And as part of being our, one of our chief architects at Paraton, we're across the intelligence community, the DOD, and very specifically in the area that I'm national aerospace on parts of the DOD and the federal cyber market. All right. So with that being said, Paul will be joining us virtually. Let's see if we get this technology down here. All righty. Let's see if everyone can hear me. Can you guys hear me all right? Yes. yes. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. I, I, I did turn on my camera. If you guys can see it, if not, that's okay. It would probably scare the people in person. Nope. There I am. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for, for joining me. Greetings from Tampa. I'd like to say maybe I'm not old and maybe I'm not retired, but uh, appreciate the uh, the warm introduction, uh, Damien. And I know it's always awkward uh, having been in the audience live and having these uh, remote presentations. So thank you for for humoring me um, during this presentation. So uh, I've got some some thoughts here. I, I do have a slide deck. I could share my screen. Um, I did ask if possible for the um, the team in person to host it, just so there aren't any hiccups. Um, if you uh, if anyone can do that, if not, I'll I'll start I'll start sharing if that's okay. Um, yeah, you guys think you could pull it up? I saw the thumbs up in the front row. So Damien already indicated who I am, and more importantly, how does that relate to everyone on this call? So being a chief data scientist, while it sounds really fancy, looks good in a business card, what that means is I help people like everyone in this meeting do their jobs better. So if there's a challenge that uh, corresponds to anything in data, and a large portion of that, as you guys know today, relies on the automation uh, problem set. So if there's an, uh, an opportunity, if there's a, a problem of which automation, um, of which obviously cyber is a uh, prominent aspect of that, which automation can be applied to create more efficiencies, to identify more threats, to locate more opportunities. Um, as uh, Damien indicated, uh, when we're solutioning, that's something that comes up now more than ever. I looked at the agenda, looked at the speakers that are there today. Of course, that's my due diligence as you're opening um, uh, a speaker. So I, I wanted to make sure that, um, uh, you know, that I covered off on the things that were important to you. So you're gonna get a lot of capability discussions uh, today, and but I wanted to start off with a more general view of what we're talking about here, which is the automation writ large, of which cyber falls uh, under that umbrella here. So I'm not seeing the slides. I'll give one more chance here if we could share it locally. If not, I'm going to pull it up um, if yeah, that's okay. Yeah, can, can you uh, forward it to the email I put into the chat? Uh, sure, no problem. Um, uh, well, let's see. Let's see if I could just share it. Okay. I didn't, I just didn't know what the... Let's see if I could just share it. Don't worry about it. Yeah, there you go. 
Hey, look at me. See, apparently a chief technologist, uh, chief, uh, you know, uh, chief uh, data scientist can share slides. That's one of my uh, great job functions here. So as I mentioned, um, I, I see cyber as part of a data, a greater data automation umbrella. You're going to have a lot of discussion today on things that are related to cybersecurity. I'm going to talk a bit about that in that presentation. But anybody that knows data knows you're never a subject matter expert on things that you don't know about. So what I try to do is be the objective subject matter expert and let the people who know their specific problem space in cybersecurity. There's a number of geniuses in this room and on this line. I would rather them be the experts while I help them build and create better solutions. First things first, uh, what are we talking about here? Uh, what, we're, what we've got is the, 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 the present. And the present is, as I started with, um, how do we use automation? Uh, there's a lot of folks that are running around scared uh, of the use of AI, artificial intelligence, or ML machine learning. Um, disclaimer, by the way, I spell out every single acronym I have, especially since this is being recorded, but also I never assume that people speak in the same language that I do and Lauren knows I'm in a lot of these presentations and I have no idea what somebody's talking about till afterwards, then I Google it and learn a new term or 25. So in this instance, I'm talking about AI and ML, again, artificial intelligence and machine learning, how to use automation to make better things, better processes, hopefully a better world. Um, we are constantly being told that it's good, but uh, not arguably enough attention is being given to the ideal application of it and how to address some of the challenges that are inherent when we're trying to increase capability at the speed of light, but not necessarily arguably giving enough thought to the best way of doing so. So in the cybersecurity space, we know, um, as you see there in the uh, end of the first paragraph, uh, peer competitors are uh, arguably ahead of us. They've, they've embraced the use of definitely offensive cyber uh, capability. We're on our back heels in the use of automation to try to address some of those um, threats uh, before, obviously, that they can create significant impact. But supply chain risk management is alive and well. We can't talk about cybersecurity and not have a discussion in what happens if and when the capability that we have to address it gets somewhat um, impacted or uh, thwarted some ways by supply chain risk management threats that emerge uh, literally from the adversaries that we're trying to counter. So I just want to bring that up there. I know the folks on this call uh, and in the room and on, online know about this, but it's just something that I, I believe that we should be talking about. And I'll get to that in a, in a moment there. Uh, I've already hit the second point, which is let's give it some more thought. So what I'm here today is to give you an overview. So we're, basically the 30,000 foot view to the 10 or 5,000 or lower that you're going to have on the rest of this um, this, uh, I would say this conversation that we're having today. And I wanted to take a step back. And again, as an objective subject matter expert, just to give uh, some, some needed, arguably needed discussion of ways of doing our jobs better. Um, also too, uh, I'm gonna cover off a little bit on external validity. If you're not familiar with the term, uh, I'll get down to that nitty gritty in a little bit. Most important, uh, this is a discussion and this is one person's professional opinion. So. Things that I present today, I'm certain some folks are going to want to throw uh, fruit at me, either online or in person. That's okay. I like fruit. Uh, it's healthy. Uh, but more importantly, this is just my opinion. Um, there's, your experiences may, may differ. Your opinions and definitions may vary. Uh, I respect that, and that is okay. Um, this is, again, just my take. It's not Periton's opinion. It's just one man's opinion from the middle of, of Tampa. All right, so I'm going to start off with what are the challenges that we have at present? What is the here and the now? What is the landscape that we're looking at for cybersecurity? Um, so we're talking about, first of all, first, first off, rather, the ease of use issues. And um, uh, practice workflows is something that isn't really brought up often, uh, user-centered design. Specifically, if we create cybersecurity or other types of automation solutions, not a lot of thought is given to how people use them and access them to do their job. And ultimately, what happens is you're left with a small number of users who understand how to use a technology and more importantly, how to maintain and upgrade it. So when you have burgeoning threats that emerge, it becomes quite a challenge then to try to figure out how to access it because we haven't really given enough thought to making things native to the end user. So if you think about all the tools and solutions, and I challenge the people in a gentle way, not challenge literally, that are going to present their solutions in these subsequent conversations today, uh, I, I wonder how much 
uh, in terms of uh, uh, focus has been given to practice workflows. And just something to keep in mind, make something that people are familiar using and integrate that into their over, overall solution. Also too, for cybersecurity um, in specific, uh, threat detection, proactive threat detection, insertion of other variables, other data streams that are of relevance, not a lot of discussion has been given on the complexity of data. And, and this is probably the, the number one challenge that I see when I'm creating solutions with Damien and others at Periton. It's that every um, data uh, stream, every piece of data type is very different. And creating the integration requires a lot of care and feeding. So that in the end ends up with a lot of individuals literally having to hand jam, how to organize, trial and error to make sure that the automation that we're trying to do works. And if you don't take keep in mind the data nuance from the front end, you end up with oodles of work and then the tech abandonment on the back end because it's just too much effort to try to do proactive detection and then we're behind once more. Um, and finally, uh, we all know this pretty well. There's not a lot of people that know how to do this well and let alone that are cleared. It's still a uh, an emerging field in many ways, the automation space, especially for cybersecurity. So the talent pool is not vast, which is why um, I encourage anybody and everyone that can collaborate, please do so and try to find solutions that really help our end users because there's not a lot of us out there. Next challenge is how and where to put the automated practices into place. So even if when we discovered that automation may work, for instance, a combination of specific variables may point to an increased presence or opportunity of a threat for an adversary to seize upon, we don't always have it, even if the workflows are correct at the right parts of the human machine teaming equation. I see this pretty often, especially when we're creating complex solutions. So we'll wanna put automation into the solution, but the automation precedes with the manual. The manual has to double check the um, the automation. And then when you keep in mind the stuff in the previous slide with the data nuance, it becomes a mess. So don't automate if it's going to require humans, especially cybersecurity. You don't have the time to fact check and double check your homework. Um, the next point is a really important one. Honestly, guys, I don't really even know the best method for validating AI and ML models. I, I just don't. I do know that there's a lot of good ones out there. I do know that the good ones are always being tested and retested to in, ensure that they're relevant and that they are compliant, either zero trust or also with new data streams. But if you don't have a game plan for how to care and feed your models, they have limited use and that's not good for cybersecurity as we know. Even with the most advised models from historical data, they become obsolete if we don't have a game plan in mind. And the last part may be complicated. I'm, I'm kind of a, as you may have gathered, um, a, a math nerd of sorts, but I mean, my threshold determinants, uh, if you know what this means, I, I hope I'm not offending anyone uh, on this call if you know what this means, but if, if you don't, hopefully this is of use. That means the decision points that you have in models in which when you hit this or hit that, um, uh, you, we can call it standard deviations, but it's, it's noting that when you have something of interest, Therefore, you, you're creating a realistic threshold for, for a reason to care, meaning at what point do you start to have to express some concern over a data presentation or an event? At what point is something worth noting? We, we struggle with that. Um, even with good data structures and plans and, and good models that are tested, our thresholds could be off. And you want to know why? It's because our adversaries are pretty smart. So they know how we think about thinking and they try to create false breadcrumbs and try to work outside of those limits. So threshold determinants are pretty important. Like I remember once I was helping create a, um, an ISR um, solution. So for um, uh, intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance, that is for a, an end user. And I asked a very simple question for counter threat detection and all that stuff. What is the default frequency out of the box? That sounds really crazy. But Acoma, then Okay, I uh, just heard a voice there. I wanted to stop for a second. So what is the fault frequency out of the box? And that means what is the normal threshold determinant for how our adversary starting because they have the same hardware and they have the same frequency. Um, this is something that's going to be very familiar to most in this, um, in this event. So we know that there's a lot of data out there and scaling is tough across different environments. Uh, we've talked about uh, a little bit about the the workflows, but of course the design piece is very, very important, not just 
how people make their decisions, but how they access their information when you start um, keeping in mind and factoring in the scalability factor. So it's very common for someone to say, hey, I want to sunset in this capability. I want to introduce this new one for cybersecurity. But at that point, what do you do with the existing systems and how do you create, as it's stated there, user-centered design so individuals can easily do the steps they need without creating disruption? Last part's really interesting. I'm sure everyone uh, or most of you that have um, uh, some aspect in your portfolio of solutioning for cybersecurity or sister problem sets have seen uh, a requirement. It's stated to store and even consider archival data. Uh, the largest cost I'm, I'm seeing at present for data is in maintaining and accessing archival data, because imagine your problem set and then multiply that by 20 years. At the very classified levels, that becomes very expensive. So um, I would say if you could do one thing, especially from the solutioning perspective and from cybersecurity, especially because you're want, you're going to want to train your models on historical threats, think early on how you're going to account literally and figuratively for archival data in your systems. So with all of these, uh, keeping these in, in mind and all these challenges, let's talk about what happens as an end result of either failure to account or limited accountability. I, I wanna give another disclaimer here. Um, yes, these are my opinions, but it's not that every organization is struggling for this. This is something that I have seen holistically as a problem set for automation in cybersecurity. So the reason I'm, I was asked to speak today is just to provide this type of overview and say, hey, maybe you, I can present some uh, an opinion on some, some challenges that we're seeing, some assumptions that maybe we take for granted, but more importantly, the end of this presentation, you'll see some avenues of potentially solving them, which is most important. So here's the thing, a lot of capability that we have right now is based in application programming interfaces or APIs, which is very expensive either for paying for the technology, for the integration costs, the data costs. I would love to see in the future, especially for cybersecurity, in which we're so reliant on connecting systems to create preventative mechanisms and early detection, to start talking to vendors and providers about exporting their data, getting out of the very heavy capability application lift. I was told in quotes by someone who shall remain nameless at a leadership level, at a company who shall remain nameless, that's a paradigm breaker because it changes the entire costing structure. But importantly, I, I would like to have that, that conversation now about how to think about doing things more efficiently. Otherwise, we're creating solutions that become outdated very quickly and that are over-reliant on a singular capability to keep the engine running. We don't want that to happen, that an entire data integration piece, especially for cybersecurity threat detection, breaks down because we can't afford one chain in a link. Uh, in tandem, what happens is when we see that we're falling behind, we start buying things without giving too much rhyme or reason to why we're buying. More importantly, that becomes difficult in standardizing, and then keeping the security protocols in place becomes a nightmare. You start inserting so many things into an equation, you don't know the different um, possibilities of, the, of in terms of where holes may emerge, challenges may emerge. It's just, it's an absolute, absolute nightmare. Uh, Damian mentioned, I, I do some other work for the University of Maryland. Um, I help uh, co-chair uh, an assessments working group sponsored by o OSD policy, and, and that's on assessments. And that's the number one challenge, guys. It's the standardization of data sets and of capability for assessment. That is what is the challenge. So you can imagine from cybersecurity, that is obviously going to be a challenge as well. If we just keep buying things or making things not realizing we're duplicating and also too that we haven't really given enough thought, perhaps due to the paradigm breaker notion of how to integrate. Um, the measures of effectiveness piece, we that is often brought up in areas such as information warfare. For instance, how do you know what you're doing has created an effective outcome on your target audience? But honestly, you can make the same claim for cybersecurity and ask the same question. So does your cybersecurity protocol, do, we, do your protections actually help other than thwarting an obvious problem? Are they, are, are they effective at what they're doing? Is your capability effective? Uh, last point, a little bit down in the weeds, entropy is the normal distribution of data, normalized chaos, pattern of life is what happens when you mix and match all these things together. We don't really take that into account with what we're doing when we're creating data systems. 
when we, even if we have good threshold determinants, we know what is normal, but normal is chaos. I mean, things happen in a system that just happen. And if we don't take into account what happens on a daily basis, we end up with type one and type two error, which is false positives, false negatives. And we start acting on things that aren't really measures of effectiveness, that aren't really threats, and we're ignoring the actual problem sets. We're ignoring the actual problem sets that are there. So it's just something to keep in mind. Again, this is tough. It requires a lot of thought getting people like everyone in this call in a room to start talking about the integration pieces and to try to tackle these and what a type one or type two error would look like, a common one. You guys are the subject matter experts. So when you have a, a uh, you get an alert that says there's a cybersecurity risk, threat, breach, everything, all the above, are you confident that there's no type one or type two error? Data provenance is important. How were those decisions made? And can you justify them objectively with another data set or another problem set. Okay, so here's the thing. I've presented you all the problems. And let's. Uh, these are the common conversations that I've seen in solutioning, but also to speaking with customers. The nice thing about being really an expert on nothing and trying to be objective is you can have pretty candid conversations with leadership, especially with customers, also partners and users, and you can listen and try to challenge some existing notions. So I'm going to go down uh, the, the most, um, I would say, common ones that I hear. And here's some, as stated, some quick fixes for it. Uh, honestly, the challenges that I presented to you are, it's a lot. And no one knows where to begin. Uh, the number one area of responsibility of which defense problem sets tend to emerge that is right at present is in the Indo-Pacific one or Indo-PACOM area of responsibility. It's so big, it covers a giant portion of the planet. It's so complex. And anytime I touch that area of responsibility, I'm told it's it's impossible to solve. Uh, and I respectfully disagree if you take it one step at a time. So for instance, we've got too many places to cover, too much data, too many threats. Slow down, guys. Let, let's take it one horse at a time before we start creating a steeplechase race. And let's figure out what our media problems are and create, as it's stated, a best practice for each and separate it one by one. Don't try to solve the entire jambalaya. Just create the best ingredients as you can one at a time. Related, when you start factoring in archival data, you start considering new capability and integration, it becomes completely overwhelming. In the information worker space, there's a myth that more information is good because if you have more awareness or cybersecurity, if you have more awareness and more data, you can make more informed decisions. Sure, if your data nuance is accounted for, the, there's an integration piece, the scalability is taken into account and you have a system of systems in which people are going to use it, it's native and it, everything is designed from thresholds that it works. See, that's my point. So before you start buying anything, don't buy anything, stop. Figure what out what you have, how you can use it better, how you can create some Automation efficiencies, figure out ways that you can create models on your existing programs and practices. Um, the other part goes into the type one and type two error, which is if you have outcomes there, it's kind of hodgepodge. As we talked about earlier, the paradigm breakers, a lot of people don't trust what they have. Even if you provide them with outcomes, I've seen the most validated outcomes with data providence, amount of confidence, percentages, the customers don't trust them. I uh, buried the lead earlier on about external validity. External validity means if you have a cybersecurity or other challenge that uses some aspect of automation and you put a new data set or a new customer in there based on the models and noting that everything is different, but is your best practice a best practice that you can have external validity that if you change the problem set, your methodology will still stand true and your practices will still stand true. If you do not have confidence in the external validity, meaning external from that specific problem set, from the get-go, start questioning whether or not your problem is driving your solution which is never a good place to be because you'll be in reactive mode all the time. Next thing is a hybrid cloud multi-cloud problem, uh, which happens a lot that you still have isolated solutions, isolated API or application programming interfaces. I hear this a lot with cross classification issues and there isn't a designated approach to how to deal with that. Make sure before you start solutioning that everything can potentially talk to each other. From a cybersecurity perspective, this is so important guys, because even if you have good automation, if you don't have a system of systems in which things are informing and advising each other, even if you have a, a great, great, great detection mechanism, a great protection scheme, if you don't have 
the data all advising each other, it's very isolated and you're missing something important potentially. It's just something to keep in mind before you start implementing something or upgrading it, really think about what you have and try to connect all of that stuff um, together. Now, the sunset issue, uh, this is not a Periton problem. I mentioned I'm not speaking for Periton. This is a, a global problem, commercial sector as well. Nobody likes sunk costs, um, honestly. And But I, I'm getting to five and six, I'm combining them because in cybersecurity, they, they really are interchangeable in some ways because cybersecurity, you have to be on the bleeding edge. There's no way of, of cheating. But with that being said, don't see any previous costs as things that are sunk. Best practices can emerge and use them and then test run them, working backwards to problem five on end users before you adopt it. Don't just replace version one with version two. Figure out what works at present that you want to, that you want to keep. Test it on new folks and then figure out ways going to the, the last point of educating end users, especially leadership, how and why you bought it, how to use it so you get advocacy. Advocacy is very, very important. You don't want the quote nerds of the world being the ones that are the only, uh, the only ones that feel responsibility for cybersecurity. Um, all the worst computer-based training, which we've all had to suffer through regardless of, of our job uh, and, and our location and positions, you know, they try to uh, espouse upon us why cybersecurity is so important, but we but let's go beyond that and say why should we advocate for? It? We need to understand how these things work and and have an army of armies really help educate the literally the the aspects of the solutioning that we've talked about there. This is kind of a cool one, and I'm one of the the rare individuals that do data science that I guess have a PhD, but importantly for this discussion, do research and use um, automated practices as part of that. And what that has taught me, um, I've been a tenured professor. I mentioned the UMD piece, forget about me. More importantly, I, I came into the data space because I saw the benefits from a research perspective and from a model validation and verification in place. You can use automation, not just Monte Carlo simulation where you run something through something a million times over, over and over again to see if it works, but you can actually use automation to learn by, by really maximizing the data that's out there, learning about an environment, learning about a system of systems, and then using the historical and archival data to really create something amazing. And if you create systems of knowledge in which the models are constantly learning and they're intelligent and they have that external validity, you could do some really cool stuff. I've seen someone that is a, was a PhD physicist in a previous job that uh, it sounds uh, kind of crazy, but was interested in like organic um, chemistry as well and looking at how fluid dynamics work and how just organic um, absorption of skin stuff works and things like that. You say, what does that have to do with cybersecurity threat detection? Well, a lot, because the aspect of how just general physical structures work and how they respond and how they, they react and how you can model that. Most importantly, she was smarter than me and she figured out, or is still smarter than me, and figured out that you can use models to simulate infinite aspects of a problem set that would otherwise cost you a fortune to simulate. So it's just to keep in mind that you can use automation to literally simulate gazillion dollar, I'm sure that's a dollar sign, amounts of, uh, of cost and of physical nuance in a space. And especially if you're looking at cybersecurity as part of a wider picture, you could do a lot of that simulation for a lot less. And um, by the way, the cool thing about it is that when she tested, but it's not just her, I've read a lot of research on it as well. When anyone who's in this space has tested the efficacy of these models, they are actually more effective in the physical modeling too. So if you have good models, you've got good data and it's pretty, pretty cool. Um, I mentioned about the use of fused data sets and the benefits. Um, you can fuse anything if you've done it intelligently uh, for understanding your target audience, for understanding adversary um, strategies, that's the last point. So we, we we start looking at what they do, what they say, what a cybersecurity threat looks like. Take a step back and look at the pattern of patterns. Forget content, look at contextual, look at that network distribution, look at the capability use, how and where, look at timing, look at proxy actors, look at the whole thing. And you could start being truly objective if you get away from let's simulate a war game to simulating the aspects of warfare themselves, which again, from cybersecurity is so important because that has how individuals do the multi-prong attacks and approaches to create disruption, to ultimately have a gain that we are not sure of yet. But we can do that if we start doing objective assessments. What that leads us to is the ability to think quicker. 
and smarter by being proactive. So if our models are well-informed, our data is well-structured, our user interface is, is organic enough that we have individuals using this, all of our data is being considered, we have good integration. What we have are models that are training in real time that are proactively identifying cybersecurity and other threats. In real time, it's not a perfect science, but what you're doing is you're getting ahead of the problem set. And that allows us to not only have great models, but be better users of it and just literally just smarter with the information that we are using. Historical data is huge. Um, in the present, we have an allure to focus on the present, but honestly, I'm kind of biased as a, as a scientist. I, I believe that, you know, obviously the present does predict, uh, sorry, the past predicts the present and the present predicts the future. Use that historical data. It's a cheap and easy way. You're going to have to store it and use it in some aspects of it by law. Use it to inform your models. Figure out how, what your thresholds are based on earlier challenges. Just because capability has changed doesn't mean your thresholds should adjust to the capability. There is a pattern of things that will emerge. Remember, entropy and pattern of life, of which historical data can really help and advise. Um, obviously, modeling is great for red teaming. Uh, you guys probably know this when you're creating cybersecurity measures, uh, you're going to red team a lot of it, but also too, from a research perspective, if you're creating traditional research, you can use automation to test where you otherwise would have to gather physical collection um, uh, uh, nuance, criteria. It, it's a great way to get out of that force fit of traditional collection. It doesn't mean it should exist in isolation, but it's a nice way of scaling. And of course, as I mentioned, it's objective. You can use that to take a look, run the models, figure out what it is. I have a colleague at Periton right now who's doing an amazing thing just with scraping and looking at just how information is presented in the unbeknownst to the people writing it in, a, in an environment of which are they aware of how they traditionally present information about information. And he's made the argument, I think it's a great idea on how to do an objective scrape of what that information looks like and try to learn from it and just learn about how we communicate. And honestly, I think that's a great thing and I'm a big fan of it. And it's someone who isn't even normally in that space. And it's a really cool concept of just really thinking outside the box to predict and learn. This isn't a cybersecurity problem that he's looking at, but it's pretty neat. The nice thing too, I mentioned about forming that community of interest. I've got a nice one of folks like you uh, that I, you know, I could talk to and I could share ideas with and being in Tampa, you know, I've got a whole cadre of people either from U.S. Special Operations Command or Central Command or other types of folks at McDill Air Force Base or other walks of life at Periton, other places. I can trade ideas. And it's important to trade ideas like you're doing here by sitting at this event. You've stated that you want to collaborate. Please collaborate and learn from each other. Don't see opportunities to service a client as, as, as a competition. See it as an ability that regardless of who's servicing it, collaborate, create those best practices like I mentioned, that assessments working group, shameless plug uh, for, um, for the OSD policy type of things. So what can we do today? Exactly what I mentioned. Work together, create things that are empowering the individuals that are the end users. Don't just have them rely on capability. Don't have one solution be the end solution. Give them something that is a best practice, but also keeps them safe. For cybersecurity, what is the goal? to be secure at the present and will forever future adversary threat that comes our way. Second point to rethink the way that you're using AI and ML models in this in disparate this capability, but figure out a way when all the data is joined together, how to create standardized models in a central location that all the data can talk to each other. It's very expensive to maintain models. Don't keep buying models. Don't keep buying artificial pro a program and interface capability. Figure out a way to centralize your solutioning so you understand what you're doing and you're making those models better over time. Because if you sunset a capability, you bring in a new one, you lose the knowledge of that model if it was native to that capability. That's not a good thing, and I see it a lot. Uh, I'm talked about tracking how you're making your decisions, and this is very, very important. You should be able with known confidence if you're relying on historical data and you're using it to go back and say, this is how I used it, this is why I used it, and this is the amount of confidence I have in the decisions made based on the data. And finally, roadmaps. Don't wait till the plane has left the proverbial runway to start figuring out what you wanna do later. And don't create roadmaps that are unrealistic. Um, figure out what you wanna do, make sure that it's gonna do what you wanna do and plan accordingly. So what does this all mean at the end of the day? First off, thank you for humoring me. Um, I really do appreciate that.
Um, I, I hope that this was useful for the rest of the discussions that were there. I was asked to provide a framing discussion to hopefully drive some of the conversations for the subsequent ones. Your program is fantastic. Thanks to the guys who organized it and put it together. And thanks, of course, to Periton for hosting it. But the best cyber security and data automation approach is one that you've literally given significant thought to. Don't hodgepodge it. Even if it's paradigm breaking, just give it some serious thought, work together. Oh, gosh. Um, I, no one's maybe in this room is going to like me when I say this. Try to be vendor agnostic if possible, meaning if there's good capability, you need to say, I'm not married so much to a specific vendor that I'm not looking at the best practice that's there. I'm not saying don't, don't take anybody. The exact opposite. I'm saying understand why you are using a capability. Don't have a don't have a capability drive your approach to cybersecurity. Rather, have your best practice be the reason you choose your capability. Uh, I'm I'm biased on the third point. I really really like understanding why you're building your models. Maintain them. Use considerable thought and 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 literally just be smart in how you're approaching the use of automation. And remember, there is an art form to data structuring, but there's also a science in understanding that there's an external validity factor that has to come into play. And finally, be scientists. Understand that what you want to do, keep learning. Always keep building that capability. Don't wait for an emerging requirement or something that's in crisis before you start understanding like, oh gosh, we need new cybersecurity protections. Be ahead of the game. Otherwise, you're going to be way behind the best practice curve that you want to do. So that is what I have. Um, I left some time here, I hope enough for some comments and questions. That's me. Happy to help anybody here. Um, you know, I was asked to speak not because um, you're being hosted by Periton, but more importantly, hopefully this content was relevant. I'd love to help anybody that I can. If you have any questions, that's how to reach me. And that is me stopping sharing. So I'm opening the floor to the folks in the room. Again, I hope that was helpful. Putting myself on mute and take it from there. So thank, thank you, Paul. You, that was excellent. Um, you, I will say you're preaching to the choir on some of your on some of your comments. Um, one of your your vendor agnostic comment that is sort of our purpose in life. We're basically a systems of systems of standards. It's sort of the purpose of this, this conference. So I really resonated with that. Um, your collaboration point is very valid. We, we sort of have a theme also the conference of incoming tide raises all boats. We're not here to compete with each other. We're here to do all of us to do better at this. Um, the competition actually hurts it. Um, could you, um, actually, could you reshare, I have a question or a comment I'd like to make and a question. Could you reshare your slides again and go back to the uh, problem challenges slide? The first one, of the, the one through four, I guess it was. Thanks. So one, yeah, that one. Um, so a lot of displays for the people in the room as well, because I think it does get sort of at the, the themes of, of the conference. Um, the sort of don't solve it all at once is why we have this whole collection of projects that are that are doing what exactly you said, you know, take issue by issue. So, you know, the TAC group solving a different thing than the um, Open C2 group, et cetera. So I think I think we are uh, following some of your solutions there. Um, my question I was going to ask you about, um, obviously you're a data science guy, your, your main focus is, is um, AI and ML. Um, a lot of what, uh, we're not that far yet with, some of what we're doing, you know, the famous quote, um, uh, the future is here, not even the distributed. Yes, there is some AI, ML in what we're doing, but for the most part, we're still more trying to get from manual to automation, not, not all the way replace the human with the artificial intelligence, just aid the human in what we're doing. Could you, um, could you give us your thoughts on, um, I'll say a less AI version of those particular problems or what, what would you suggest there knowing that we're eventually going to get to the AI part, but now we're still at the more automating what the human's doing so that the, uh, where we can help the human, what, what thoughts do you have there? Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. Just efficiencies. That's the, that's the easy button. So figure out what processes, once the data is clean enough to the manual processes that you can uh, create some efficiencies. There is no reason if you know what a threat looks like and you have validated processes that you have in place based on your subject matter expertise to not create some, some efficiency of a workflow for a detection system if something shows up. So anything that is done manually and mass is the greatest place to start just to create efficiencies. And I mentioned the human machine teaming thing. That's probably your number one lowest hanging fruit right now. 
So figure out ways of which you can use technology to empower your analysts, your operators, to put them on the right side of automation. So right now, there's a lot of people, I'm really glad you brought this up. So I'm, I'm you know, again, all of this is just my opinion, but I, I, I believe it, I really do, that the humans are on the wrong side of the human machine teaming and they're double checking the AI because people are force fitting automation into solutions because they want to say they're doing it. So I would say, forget that. The, the humans should be should, should be literally uh, using the the automation at the lowest hanging fruit to to create to accomplish the easy steps that don't require sophistication. There is no reason that if you've got categorical data or whatever data, continuous data, you want to restructure it, you want to repurpose it, put that those models in place right there, right then. Do some automated structuring, some automated integration that then allows the humans to work. So the easiest example I can give you for the folks in the room that are familiar with um, like directorates at Department of Defense. So J2 is intelligence, state three is operations, right? J5 is strategy and plans, traditionally defined as in, in US Department of Defense. So if you can figure out data sets that those people have that they work together and create some basic efficiencies using models that do some basic data structuring. So those three areas and how they typically collect data that they can talk to each other quickly and then visualize it, boom, low hanging fruit. Of course, for those that do that regularly, or in cybersecurity, if you're doing that in that space and you're looking at three types of data that say typically underlie a cybersecurity threat, what are you looking at a common operating picture? So you're automating key components of a common operating picture without any sophistication. That's low hanging fruit. Start with the efficiency. Don't worry about the other piece because as you said, um, Duncan, everyone is so focused on the allure of, wow, we can create artificial content and then go beyond the human. By the way, ChatGPT breaks very quickly because ChatGPT only relies on the convention of what it's being fed. Once you go outside of the convention, it tells you what you want to hear, it's broken. So there's only certain things that it can do before it breaks. So use your automation upfront for process efficiencies and to create a baseline that you can work off of to then give subsequent um, thought to where you may want to apply the automation at additional phases later on as threats evolve. Thank you. Uh, questions in the room, uh, raise hands, I'll walk the mic over. Identify yourself before. This is uh, Michael Phillips, I'm with SLG Innovation, and probably more appropriately, I'm uh, on the leadership group for the NEAM, NEAM uh, National Information Exchange Model Cyber Committee. And uh, you're singing our song, you know, in fact, I'm in Florida, and uh, I'm probably going to want to take you to lunch, Shanghai, to do on some of this work. But uh, we're looking at creating cybersecurity workflows and use cases, and, and your test research questions type of activity, and then creating a knowledge graph model, creating a reference model, um, which is right upon what you're trying to say. How are these things going to talk at the various data exchange points uh, in a standard way, like? tool to tool or whatever it is, whatever the use case is, and a vendor agnostic approach. So I'm going to get into this more tomorrow in my session, but I just want you to know that uh, we want to get you involved with us, so thank you. No, I'd love to, and I'm glad you brought that up, and I'm sorry that I'm shamelessly plugging that working group, which, by the way, uh, wearing my UMD Arliss hat, I'm partnered with the Georgia Tech Research Institute, and I'm there a lot, but more importantly from what you're saying, that, that we have people from Lincoln Labs, we've got Sandia, we've got um, commercial people that are part of this group. It's unpaid, it's volunteer, happy to include you in that. But more importantly, you echoed what my colleague from Lincoln Labs has been saying over and over and others have seconded, which is, um, I didn't bring this up here because um, I didn't want to steal your thunder, I guess. I'm glad I didn't, but it's a, it's a test lab um, to baseline data sets. And that is actually something that is a goal longer term for this working group that I mentioned. I don't think it can happen because OSDP is not really dedicated to that in specific, but that has been brought up uh, across several working groups as a way that to standardize, create a test bed, to standardize the data sets and also the models. So people like you and her that are smarter than me on this, they definitely see this as something that is a must be. So I'm just seconding what you just said that this is something that they've identified. I'm glad you brought that up. And and I yeah, amen to what you're going to say 
uh, you know, as a preview of the movie just ahead. Over. Thanks, and um, I don't know if you'll be able to attend some of the uh, other talks, Paul, but besides uh, his talk on me, which does seem to resonate with his talk, I think it's the one right before it, I'm setting up just the type of lab that you were talking about that for this group. So probably we need to combine labs would be a good idea. Uh, other questions in the room? Hi, uh, this is John Kavanaugh in the Infrastructure Services. So we built a knowledge graph platform and uh, We've been working on it for about three years. Our immediate focus has been around uh, the cyber world of uh, the components in a application release that create the data, right? And, and showing the, uh, the controls and showing which are compliant with uh, various regulations, right? Um, from a performance perspective, we've done some conventional graph sizing, we got to like scale two to the 31. So I'm just wondering from your work, have you seen what size data sets do you see uh, that would be in need for production? Yeah, really good question. I haven't seen very large data sets because I think people are afraid of the scale, the scalability aspects of it. Um, you know, they're, they're starting with what is, again, the black and white, way of testing the model. If an event occurs, this is what it is. These are the data sets. I don't think, gosh, I, I'm i sorry, I haven't seen large scale testing of the data sets that are there, but disclaimer, I am not a cybersecurity subject matter expert. I'm more of a data scientist. If there have been knowledge graphs that were tested on large scales, I have not been privy to them. The problem too is, sir, a lot of, I guess not a problem, it's reality. Uh, as the gentleman before you mentioned, I, I sit in Tampa. So literally you can be at, at the at the um, entrance to McDill Air Force Base in, in 10 to 12 minutes. So most of the stuff that I've done, and I'm a special operations guy, that's in, that's what I've done my whole, my whole career with the military, including with the Australians. So the problem sets that I touch tend to be in that space. So large scale data tends to not be their problem set. For knowledge graphs, they're more focused on emerging and evolving threats as determined by a specific mission parameter that's a priority for that command. So I guess what I'm saying is I'm a dummy and don't really have the answer to your question. Uh, I, I haven't been exposed to large scale validation using knowledge graphs. Uh, I know that with that being said, I do a lot of, of this conversations with very smart people and I like to learn. And I like to learn their capability. And I, and I love talking to people who design the knowledge graphs and tell me how the models work. How can we break them? And, and I do a lot of that. Uh, so I'm, once you start scaling up data, once you have complex processes that are in place, they start breaking, as you know. And they, and, but I, I do have those discussions, but I, I haven't actually fielded one at a high, at, using high levels of content. I haven't seen it. Now, of course, if you talk about anyone that is involved with signals intelligence or SIGINT, um, that is a core requirement. And I, we can't even have that conversation on this call. So, um, but I, 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 haven't, I haven't touched that at that level personally, I've been privy to it. So I'm sorry, I don't have the answer to your question. I guess the best lecture answer is I don't know when you don't know. And I haven't, I don't know, because I would assume people on this call are smarter than me. And I have found three questions that have proven that already. But I, I think it's a great question. Uh, I'd be happy to help you break your models uh, and and see what happens and uh, and mention and and how we can get avoid um, a type one to type two error because I think what you're talking about, sir, that's the pattern of life modeling and the entropy stuff. At what point do you insert enough data that you that you break the pattern of life modeling? I, I do know people who do that for a living and they're very good at it. Um, but I I have promised on this presentation by request. To be vendor agnostic, so I will not name names of anybody. I will leave the innocent unmentioned. So sorry, I don't have the answer to that question, but I, I agree with you. Okay. Thanks. Um, any questions, questions on the phone? phone? I don't see any raised hands. If you do, please raise your hand. Uh, any other questions in the room? Where's the back, anybody? Oh, got one. Thank you, sir, for your presentation. Very useful information. In terms of training large language, oh, I'm sorry. I'm, uh, look, everybody, I'm Pat Burning. I'm with AT&T. Uh, happy to 
be here with everybody and following up on the training of the LLM. So Chat GPT and some of the other ones out there have been trained on you know the general public knowledge, and there's an extreme amount of expense that most of us you know don't have those kinds of resources to spend millions of dollars on how you would do that. So how how do we take intelligence? Cyber specific, threat actor specific, non public information. How do we collectively find a way to get the resources to create the language model? Any thoughts on the strategy of how we could go about doing that? Thanks. Yeah, that's a great idea. I think your, your colleague already answered that question, or the, the two of them before you collaboration. Because the way to create, in my professional opinion, again, I'm taking, I'm not an um, LLM large language model expert on any, on any of that stuff. Uh, I, I, if you show me your model, I can objectively assess whether or not it's indicative of the problem. But with that being said, honestly, sir, I would get the smart people like you that are focused on this problem together, that have shared customers, and figure out how to create the most representative models. Because the problem is when you create them in isolation, what you're doing is you're focusing on the customer that you have, or maybe internally that the problem that you're trying to solve. And most LLMs, large language models, I know I'm, I'm beating the horse dead, but this is being recorded. So I, I always want to repeat acronyms over and over again. Uh, so the LLMs are being trained on what is available there. And most of LLM solutions are out of the box solutions by major providers or vendors and everyone's using the same ones. So the issue is when you start focusing on niche content, the only way to ensure your LLMs are answering the call is to work with partners that have the same requirement and adjust them. A lot of times what happens is individuals will assert, insert rather, um, or and they'll assert as well, <laughs> that their uh, LLMs are are out of the box, are, are fine. They're indicative of what it is. And I, I say, no, 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 no. Um, uh, I, I see that a lot. So the LLMs tend to focus on, of course, translation, conversational nuance, semantics, uh, those types of things. You know, like, uh, you know, like you'll, you'll find a teenager and say, oh, that was, uh, thanks, Boomer. That's great. Um, you know, that's that's not going to help. I mean, those, they're outdated. Uh, that's just basic conversational nuance that we had that technology literally 15 years ago. It's useless. So the only way to create good LLMs is maybe take the out of the box, have a baseline that most people use. Don't start from scratch. Please don't create a new LLM. But, but that's just such a waste of time and money. Um, you know, there's major, major, major people that providers that have done that and we know who they are. Again, I'm not naming vendors. And so start getting the people together that you have in a shared space, do a tech exchange with people that you have relationships with your NDAs or otherwise, and start creating niche LLMs that actually solve your problem. Goes back to type one and type two error. Are your LLMs doing what you want out of the box plus your flavor that you want to add? Um, make it your ice cream. Don't make it Baskin Robbins. You know, figure out a way of of making it that it's that it has that external validity. And your colleagues answered it. I guys, I would strongly encourage. Um, you know, I mean, I'm sure the open plug people like me saying this. I would strongly encourage that you all trade contact information as much as possible. Uh, you know, if you have people in your shared space, don't don't create poor practice because what happens is if you don't create valid models, your end users, your customers will all suffer, and then everybody falls. And then you're back to going to those original vendors and using bad LLMs over and over again until you fix it. I, I'm sorry, again, I didn't give you the answer, but I kind of did, which the answer is through collaboration and starting with a baseline of the LLMs that are mainstream. Don't create baseline LLMs and, and take it from there. I, I wanted to say this too, while, while you brought that up, for the people on the phone uh, or the, uh, the video, sorry, I'm old school. Um, you have my contact information. Please reach out or anyone as well afterwards. Sometimes people don't like to, to chat to a screen. It's weird. I, I, I feel like I'm in some some Matrix movie or something, you know, like uh, the Will Ferrell skit that he did on Saturday Night Live, um, you know, uh, or, uh, you know, from the, the, the Ergo something. But if you have a question you don't want to answer, ask it here, please reach out. Um, I'm pretty responsive over, over email. But thank you for that. I, I, I hope that answers your question. Over. Well, Paul, uh, I think we're about out of time and ready for the next one. So thank you very much. Uh, good round of applause. Thank you, Matt. Have a good day. I will turn it back over to Matt to turn it back over to Mike. And to start sharing your screen, you'll be good to go. Oh, I don't even need to hook into the HDMI then. Are you hooked into the HDMI? I am hooked into the HDMI. Just share your screen.
Doesn't have to be for sharing the screen, but whatever. <laughs> All right. Uh, moving on to the next agenda, I'll introduce myself as the next speaker. Um, and I'll be talking about sort of why are we here? What, what, where did the village come from? Why are we doing it? And a little bit about the structure of how we have the work organized. Um, so the names have evolved over the years, but we, we sort of changed to, to the village name because we are a village. It takes village to do cybersecurity. We have a bunch <laughs> of different acronyms that I am not going to explain in this talk. Um, a bunch of projects. We'll actually get a talk a couple of talks from now where we'll sort of do a, a quick sprint through all of these and sort of explain uh, what all these different projects are. But as the previous speaker said, um, a, a major component of why we're doing this is to get these things to work together. Um, we, we have taken the problem, broken it down into a bunch of separate uh, spaces, and each one of them solves a particular problem that is helpful, but together they are much more um, much more powerful. And uh, we are trying to follow the vendor agnostic method. We're trying to try and do as much as possible uh, build standards that are um, vendor agnostic. <laughs> um, so we have we have a bunch of projects. We have a huge you know alphabet soup of, of acronyms that we're going to explain um, that I'm not going to explain as part of my talk. I want to explain why you should care about all these acronyms. Probably most of the people in the room know one of them, maybe you know a couple more of them, um, and want to um, <laughs> know more of them. Now, one of the um, sort of takeaways from the, the overall having done this for a number of years is that we do tend to work in our own silos and that we don't even know about each other's stuff. Once we sort of get over that hurdle, which we've gotten over in, in many cases, um, our stuff then doesn't talk to each other. And it talks to each other, at least in theory, but not in practice. So one aspect of the, of the doing of this is sort of awareness and adoption so everybody knows what's going on and knows what the value of it is. Um, but another aspect of what we're doing is an actual plug fest where um, yesterday the prep for this, we had a bunch of people literally know, you know, my court isn't open and whatever, all the, all the things it takes to make this stuff actually talk together. And in doing so, we find problems. We find problems with, you know, my software on my end or find problems with the other person's software on the other end. But more importantly, even for this, you know, this very village, we've already found problems in some of these specifications. That, that well, no, I did do it to the spec. It, it didn't specify the color, and I picked red. And somebody else says, well, I did it to the spec, and didn't specify the color, so I picked blue. And now everybody doesn't talk to blue. Um, and so we have actually already uncovered some of these for this. So, so I'll declare this village a success before we even start. <laughs> now, the other thing that we sort of learned from um, as we've been doing this is um, we're a bunch of geeks that sort of specialize in any one of these different alphabet soup algorithms. And we sort of know it inside and out. And we're not very good at explaining to everybody else what, what good advice you. So we had some early on use cases that were, I'll say, down in the weeds. And we discovered that we sort of want to you know, bring it up a level. And so we now have sort of a, a layered approach to um, why we're doing this. And we always start with, Show me the money. Okay, so what anyone really cares about when you're trying to explain, hey, you need to adopt whatever it is we're doing, they're saying, why? Well, why is, because all said and done, it'll eventually save somebody money somewhere. And so um, where's all that money coming from? Um, a lot of this work started many years ago. I should look it up and figure out how long ago it was. But there was some work done at um, Johns Hopkins University, the Applied Physics Lab, um, on what was the value of cybersecurity automation. And, and very academic work, had a lot of gory detail that I sort of then you know, pulled up and summarized. But really, the real summarization is it discovered that there was a two order of magnitude decrease in the amount of time the hackers were in the system. So they happened to work on very, very secure stuff. So in their particular case, the, the, uh, the red teaming and stuff, the hackers could get in, say, for a couple of weeks before they got caught. Most systems people say for months before they get caught. Um, in their case, it was a couple of weeks and they got it down to hours. Well, in a couple of weeks, people can do a lot of damage. In a couple of hours, they're still trying to figure out what they're doing. So it basically reduces the damages really dramatically. So that's where the, you know, show me the money, that's where the money comes from. That's what's sort of driving all our activity. <laughs> so all our work should sort of get turned back into those terms. So we sort of have the big picture, we want to save a lot of money. We sort of started at, these really gory, what we now call practitioner use cases. Okay. So we started with flowcharts. So this is literally a flowchart from one of the villages from, I think, five years ago. Um, and it was a <coughs> Compliance Connect 
use case, the client can act to a certain crowd, mean something that people understand. First order, you can understand it as, yes, to, 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 before you hook your system to another system, you should know what you're hooking to and what's in it. There was some early work in, in that um, associated with software supply chain, S-bombs, they were getting worked into it. And this turns out is actually one of the use cases we'll still be using um, throughout the next two days. But we've now sort of incorporated it into a bigger picture use case of, you know, why do you have stuff like that? Why, why do you want to do these things? But the concept is the practitioner use case is sort of a level we practitioners deal at. And the what we call the um, value proposition and this is a, a, a summary from the last village um, that was held uh, last June in out at USC, um, co-hosted by USC, RIT, and CISA, and associated with um, one of CISA's s Moramas. And we made this a little bit hokey, made up, um, which I'll go through in a little brief detail. We'll go into too much detail because, again, we did it a lot at the last village, but it still applies to this village. Uh, we did a, a ransomware case, and we made up a ransomware name that's not a real ransomware case i hope um and we divided into five separate scenarios and we sort of chronologically occurred over over six days and i'll, I'll go through them really briefly um, but this is literally the slide from uh the last time we did it and you can't sort of totally see because the the bottom gets chopped off there the zoom people can see but the overall objective was to get as many of that alphabet soup that we we're describing um, talking to each other and showing how they fit in to these higher level um, value propositions. And some of it was with, you know, machine machines, APIs following the various standards. Some of it had humans in the loop. We talked in one of the previous talks about humans, and there's a time when you need humans in the loop. We try to get humans on the loop as opposed to in the loop, um, so they're not holding it up. Um, and in times, there's anyway. You'll see on one of the future slides, we actually have you know, little acronyms for each these when we use it. Because particularly when we started all this, um, let's take the software supply chain example. It was all, we literally had no s -bombs. We had no capacity process. We had the concept of what we wanted to do. That's where we were at, I think it was four years ago, when, no, it's actually pre-COVID, so it's longer than that, ago when we made that comply to connect use case. Um, you'll see in tomorrow's talks, we'll have six different vendors showing you where we now have commercial products that do those actual things that we're hand-waving at our, our case. Now we'll be doing some hand waving over the next two days, but that's because hopefully in the upcoming years, again, we'll develop the standards, we'll develop the inner working, we'll get people to see the value of doing this and we'll end up with real products to do all these things. So that, that's sort of why we're here. Um, so this particular day one, um, Murphy's Law LLP, this is again, literally a chart from, uh, from the previous uh, plug fest where Get into the text in a minute. You don't have to read it. Um, it is on the GitHub for people who actually want to read it. So it's, it's sort of a linear story you're supposed to read. Um, but the point is, at that last plug fest, we sort of had all these different project acronyms on the bottom talking to each other. And the people on the Zoom can see it, I think. But I think the people in the room have the black in the bar. But underneath it, there's three little, um, there's a, a little you know, set of gears for machine to machine API. Some of it actually worked with different products from different people talk to each other. Um, there's a little human, because some of it was, yeah, we had to have the human sit there and show you how we did something manually, you know, not on it yet. And there's a little hand waving, because you got a little certain amount of hand waving. Well. And over the years, as we've been doing this more and more, we sort of evolved from the hand waving to the human to the, uh, to the machine to machine. <laughs> so this is for this particular, you know, for the, these two days. Just basically, we, we're reusing these use cases. This is literally just a screenshot of the of the GitHub where we're, where we're keeping all this stuff. Again, I'll, I'll verbalize a little bit of it. You don't have to read the details. But a way we've sort of evolved is besides having sort of this text that we wanted people to play in, there's sort of hooks in it. And you know, there's words in the in the um, high level use case that's a high level value proposition to say something like immediate kestrel threat hunt. You know, finds the hacker. Okay. Well, it's got a little you know, star A on it where you click to it, and that brings you to the practitioner use cases, which we'll spend, you know, literally an hour and a half on later today on the actual how you actually do that. So to the to the high level business manager that's sort of reading this to say, oh yeah, I see why they didn't get hacked, because you 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 know did a cash threat hunt. 
how do you actually do it? That's where we get into the details. So we, we discovered that it was better to sort of separate the value proposition from the detailed use cases because we were spending all our time in the practitioner use cases and people were sort of missing the why, why are you even doing that? So we're, we're trying to sort of do that. Another particular example from the same one is, you know, kicks the attacker out of the system using the calculator books. Again, you can say it in seven words, real life doing that, there's first of all, a real lot of different ways to do it. Again, whole, you know, hour, hour and a half, I think maybe even more between various talks because uh, we use playbooks a lot throughout this stuff and how to do that. So again, so that's sort of give the structure of what we're doing. The actual, you know, I'm going to do a little bit brief detail on this particular um, value prop, and then the talk following line will be covering another. Um, we're sort of focusing on two different value props. One is the witchy washy ransomware. Another is the Olympic destroyer, um, and it's using actual real data, data from a real life incident. And I'll let uh, Charlie talk more about that in the talk after me. But for some of the supply chain stuff, we're using the Uchi Wachi Zero Day. Um, again, a little bit of tongue in cheek, trying to get people's attention. Um, it's the Murphy's Law Firm. So Murphy's Law LLP. And then it starts out with, um, you know, during someone's, during his daughter's wedding, uh, he has an emergency root canal and it's Christmas morning. Um, and that's when the hack is curved. So, you know, Murphy's Law, it's always at the worst time. We try and do a little bit of play, make it a little bit interesting to people who want to do that. Um, but in the, the particular value props we're showing, we're showing sunny day scenarios where, and nothing bad happened. The reason nothing bad happened is because they discovered that they were being hacked. They kicked off a test rolls around how to use all this alphabet suit that we're gonna explain a couple talks from now to actually show the value of what we're doing here. So again, not gonna go into a whole lot of the detail of it, but in this particular case, it is a zero day. Uh, it is a particular type of ransomware that had never been seen before. They did manage to find it. They did manage to kick it out. They did share their information using six to their ISAC. Again, acronyms we'll explain later. Um, they did that shared information that allowed that on what we call day two, a different company on deck holdings and a little, little play on their on deck. You know, they're, they're, the, they're the day after and they're also the day before the long term. Uh, so it's still a zero day, but they know that it exists because their ISAC told them again, choose through shares, you will, sticks information, um, what to do. And they, they learn from the previous day's events how that other organization dealt with the problem. So not only did they know they had a, they could potentially have a problem, they know there are solutions and they can apply them. So again, they deal with it very quickly. Day three, triumphant cleanup, and play on words there that it's, it's, it's the third day, so it's triumphant, it's a cleanup company. Um, but again, this is now longer down the path, the stuff's been shared in the ISAC, people know that it's there. So this company can actually avoid even having the underlying problem the hackers were taking advantage of. And this gets more into these um, software supply chain systems, um, PACE and test bombs and CVEs and other acronyms we'll explain later. Um, but this is sort of how you avoid even having the problem in the first place. The thing the hackers got the handle on is cleaned up here. Again, we show a bunch of acronyms down at the bottom and how they play together. Again, we'll get into all more of this later. Um, day four is a, they never say anything at no such agency, uh, a totally fictitious government agency in the <laughs> Department of Useless Factoids has the need to do this comply and connect. I'll either uh, personally either confirm or deny that the acronym sort of look like an existing US agency that does actually have a comply and connect. Um, and one of their uh, senior managers has, has keynoted this conference frequently. So that's why we sort of pick on them. But, um, but again, they, they have the, the, the responsibility for protecting the government. So they want to keep their systems clean. Again, this is a sort of supply chain scenario um, and ties into that fancy um, flow chart that we showed before. Again, makes use of a bunch of the acronyms, introduces some new ones, um, because it's not only dealing with the handling of it, it's dealing with the sharing across the US government, for example. That's why this open stuff comes in, because uh, they then share it with the you know, state, local, et cetera. Um, again, the bad guys are doing this since the beginning. If you read closely on the day one stuff, you'll see that the state scene also went into law enforcement because hey, bad guys were doing something to them. So obviously, um, 
law enforcement gets involved again makes use of some particular um, standards that we're talking about here to actually exchange the law enforcement data associated with this and again sort of because we want to keep people's interest we get the mounties involved in Europol and Europol and they take down uh, criminals across six countries and put a bunch of people behind bars and then because we're never allowed to talk about stuff like this the information also could potentially, we can either confirm or deny whether it got shared with mill ops and a rogue nation state was involved and, and various you know, cyber hunt activities occurred that took out the uh, bad guys. Um, so again, just sort of a um, big picture that we think most people would understand. You don't have to understand all our acronyms to be able to see the value of doing this, um, but does allow us to put those hooks in to tie to the actual practitioner use cases where we'll be spending a lot of time um, over the next couple of days. As I mentioned, the talk following mine will be on Olympic Destroyer um, using actual real life data. I will say that for Charlie, and that's sort of the new thing for this. Uh, we are redoing some of the stuff that we did at the last, each one of these villages sort of builds on the previous one. So on the um, Wichi Washi stuff, we're sort of building on work that we've done before, but we you know advanced it a year and we're really showing it for awareness and adoption viewpoints because there are again more people involved and different people involved. Um, Olympic Destroyer is a new thing for this particular village. Um, and so we'll be getting a lot more detail, but a, a sort of major um, advancement since we did this a year ago is we we have a lot more players involved, we have a lot more. Um, actual separate organizations and a lot more separate projects because we're actually tying a lot more pieces together. So it, it's, um, uh, again, showing the value of doing this collaboration um, over time. Going through this way faster than the time I needed, but I think I started a minute or two early. Um, but one other thing that I will say from a big picture viewpoint, because again, it's, it's, um, I have the floor and I can do it. We do have this game that you can play. Uh, quad block quiz. It was originally developed for um, RSAC back on the first time they had RSA BC. So the first time they had RSA, they had the conference hybrid, um, not hybrid, totally virtual um, and involved in supply chain village. Um, and so our particular use case um, on the supply chain stuff, um, we were involved in making some physical games when we were there. Um, so we went ahead and made a, um, or I went ahead and made a a software game that's a form of edutainment that um, that we do have, like I said, real life prizes, real life gift cards for people in the room. We'll um, email uh, gift certificates to the, to the people who went online. Um, and the purpose of the game is to sort of teach you a little bit about supply chain security and all of the sort of acronym suit that we'll explain later is also explaining the game. You don't have to know anything to play the game um, because all of the, the questions that it asks you have the answers on the actual question. So if you know it says blah 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 software build materials open print S bomb closed print da 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 then now the question is what does the acronym S bomb stand for it gives you four choices one of which is software build materials and stuff like that but it's also got built into it some you know vulnerabilities and license hits and attacks occur and stuff like that um, it's even got random things that can can break your machine not your real machine but the game if you need me um, so with that I will pause and ask if there are any questions on sort of how we're doing stuff. So we could, I think, turn it over to Charlie, who is next up. I will stop sharing. Stop this first. It is quick logistics note. Um, if someone, if one of the hosts from Zoom can uh, stop Duncan's uh, screen share, I'll be able to bring mine up. Uh, but start off with good morning, everybody. My name is Charlie Brink. I'm a cybersecurity researcher at Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab. And along with that job, I, one second, let's see if I can, I cannot talk and click at the same time. I have learned this about myself. But I 
ideally, mm -hmm. be able to, yeah, yeah, have some slides. But as I said, I'm a cyber security researcher at Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. I also serve as the chair for the indicator of behavior subproject, and we'll be talking more about IOB during the standard sprint in a little bit, as well as we'll be doing a nice little demo showcasing that towards uh, after lunch time today. But I also acknowledge that I am the speaker that is between you and your first bathroom break. So we're going to get into this. We're going to talk a little bit today about uh, unveiling an Olympic destroyer, its impact and implications. As Duncan alluded to, we wanted to have a realistic scenario that we could base several of our demonstrations off of for this year's Splunkfest. Now, I just thought it was a good quote, so I won't call the person out, but a friend of mine from OCA uh, this morning looked at the agenda and said, Charlie, uh, how are you going to cover uh, Olympic Destroyer in 15 minutes? And I said to him, and I'll say to all of you, badly. I have a few extra minutes, though. I have a few extra minutes, but I might decide to earn some good karma and get more bathroom time. So, Anyhow, let's dive in a little bit. And this is why we have. All right. So, like I said, we're going to have to talk about Olympic Destroyer. Obviously, and what's planned to be a 15 minute talk for you, for you good folks, this is going to be a big high level. If anybody, if anybody wishes, we'll have a few minutes for QA. Once I have to have questions on my summary here, you'd like to have a detailed breakdown into my choice of TTPs, minor attack number references, or specific nuances. I am happy to have that conversation, but I will ask that we probably don't subject the entire crowd to it. Anyhow, so Olympic Destroyer is our scenario that we were looking at. It is an advanced persistence break campaign that targeted the 2018 Pyeongchang Winter Olympics. It was a network worm that Oh, and I'm going to step back for a moment because I forgot one of the most important things I wanted to do was give thanks. Uh, again, no pun intended, but it does take a village. Uh, Jane Gen uh, did a lot of work here to put this together, uh, as well as, and somebody's got their mic or speakers. That was me. I got kicked off. Yeah, it's not going to happen. Thank you. All right. So Jane Gen, uh, Jason Houston, David Vizio. All the cast community, they did a lot of work to help provide us some of the threat intel on Olympic Destroyer and put together a lot of the graphics and data that I'm using today in today's presentation. So I thought it was important to make sure I covered that. And give thank you to our OCA community. As I said, Olympic Destroyer was a network worm uh, propagating through Windows shares, stealing passwords, and its aim was to purge uh, files and shut down infected systems, causing a essential denial of service to allow the infrastructure for the games. There are many, many more nuances. Uh, there's a lot of very interesting data that I will not be getting into uh, towards threat attribution uh, and things like that. But what I will do is give a very bad flow chart of trying to summarize a super complex campaign in a total of nine steps. And I'll explain why I simplified it this much in a few more slides. But essentially, there were many aspects of this campaign, but one of the main entry vectors was spear phishing. And we saw spear phish with uh, malicious office macros. Uh, so that would be attaching a Word document with that's macro enabled. When one enables that macro, normally people will click that little yellow, many people will click that little yellow bar inside Word to enable the document. Enabling that document runs a macro that establishes a reverse shell to an attacker's infrastructure. And what we saw in Olympic Destroyer was the installation of um, interpreter payloads. If someone wants to know what the heck an interpreter is, that is a default payload for something known as the Metasploit framework. Traditionally, Metasploit is used by the good guys and sometimes the bad guys, but Metasploit's purpose in life is to emulate uh, cyber exploitation of various pieces of software. It's often used by defenders because when a new exploit is unveiled in the world, we need a way to test our infrastructure and our defenses against that exploit. And in the bad old days, the 90s, or good old days if you're a hacker, um, it was really hard for defenders to ever test their defenses. 
because you had to know how to write an entire attack in order to test. That exploit made that simple. Unfortunately, it also made it simpler for the bad guys. In Metasploit, one of the primary payloads that it will use is the thing called Meterpreter. And this is the case where we saw the bad guys using Meterpreter, which they were able to then enable another uh, very interesting program called Mimicats, which does a lot of things. But one of the most common things it does is it is a function inside the payload that will let you steal credentials. And that's what the attackers did during a like, short. This gets, and some, not to, you know, not to too much of my own life, but outside of my day-to-day -day job, I also run a small workshop to teach cybersecurity to high school students and introductions to ethical hacking. And this is a point, I'm, I have a reason for saying all this, but one of the main things I convey when I teach hacking, for those who don't do a lot of hacking, you don't want to do lots and lots and lots of exploitation when you're breaking into a network. Because exploitation is making software do things that it's not designed to do. That's great for getting access from the outside. It's really cruddy for stability. So our adversaries and the destroyer definitely understood this because they broke in, they did those you know, exploits with the macros, and they used Mimicats to steal credentials. If you want to steal those identity credentials, and this might be old hat to many people here, but I'm just saying, for those that aren't familiar with this approach, you steal valid credentials, valid usernames, passwords, and tokens, so that you stop destabilizing your target environment and start using the things that are already there. And so that's where we see this thing called lateral, lateral movement via PS exec. PS exec is a standard utility inside Windows networks that allows you to remotely execute commands. There are many legitimate reasons why you want to remotely execute commands. Anybody that's ever had to walk into a physical data center at 1 a.m. in the morning can tell you all about it. But anyhow, what we saw in the destroyer was the adversary used PSXEC to take that legitimate credentials and begin traversing it across the network. Once they were there, they began Doing what bad guys normally do. They'll steal data and they'll destroy data. They also started deleting logs and removing backups. And they were modifying the security settings of the victim machines to better enable their ability to persist and spread their chaos throughout the Olympics. And the final step of the chain that I've talked about today is after making all those modifications, they would often reboot the systems so that their changes to their victims would be persistent. There are many, 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 many more details in Olympic Destroyer, but I wanted to go over just that general workflow with you to help explain how we used it to support this year's uh, automation village. For those that are interested, we do have several common tactics, techniques, and procedures identified. Many of these align with the MITRE attack framework, as you'll see many of the knowledge bases and taxonomies and representations of threat data will reference MITRE attack. It's become a very common taxonomy that we all like to use to have common words for the tactics and techniques. So, and these slides will be made, will be made available. They're already in the sweat equity folder, but I'm certain that we'll have a we'll roll up all these uh, together to, after the end of the village. But here is a set of the MITRE attack, attack patterns that were identified. And but at least we do, what did we do with it? And so that led to where I wanted to take a moment to talk about different contributions to the village. First and foremost, again, I gave the, the big thanks to Jane Ginn out there. Uh, Jane put together a nice front report on the Olympic story that goes in a lot more detail than what I've been able to do today. And we also had many of, many of our members, again, I'm saying vendor agnostic, but many of our members work in the threat intel platform community and work in cyber threat intelligence information fields. And they've used a variety of their products to provide us summaries of the cyber threat intelligence related to Olympic the shore. And some of them use products that process the written reports and generate 
machine readable bundles in six structured threat information exchange uh, standardized format. We'll hear a lot more about six over the next two days. But giving thanks that we came together and we put these together, and there was a small little virtual test lab uh, that my team at the lab put together, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, where we knew that we have tools here that share threat anytime. We have tools that create response playbooks. We have tools that do threat hunting. And it's really boring to have an integration event where you can't really run the tools because you can have the data. So we're like, we're going to need data. And for those of us working in security operations, normally that means you're going to need some things like system logs, network logs, traffic summaries. And it's really tricky a lot of times to go integrate up the whole work virtual environment. We're going to have a great talk on the need for a more persistent one of those. But normally, when we're all going to get together for two days, we don't want to spend 18 hours getting a bunch of virtual machines networked to configure properly and figuring out you know, that everybody brought the right version of the code. We want to be able to do some of that prep ahead of time. And so my team back to the lab in one of our virtual test ranges, we set up a very small uh, Windows network with just a basic Active Directory controller, and we use a LXAC, no major endorsement here. It was an open source uh, seam that we could use. So we installed that as well as collecting NetFlow from some, some uh, OpenSense uh, virtual switches and firewalls that we had installed, and a basic uh, adversary running Metasploit framework. And we did all that so that we could be extracting uh, Microsoft Syslon logs and the standard Windows security logs and send those to a scene as well as collecting uh, NetFlow data and storing that in the scene while we conducted an emulated version of the attack. We did all that so that we could then export those Elastic logs and share them across the CAS community to support everybody else's demos. And those logs uh, they're in standard um, Elastic Common Schema. They are available for download on the CASP Sweat Equity GitHub, and anybody is free to use them. And that was able to allow our teams to really work asynchronously while being collaborative. And so those are things we have together that helped us build the IOB bundles that I'll talk about this afternoon. Uh, the six shifter detection analytics, the potential workbooks, and several kind of workbooks, and, and others as well. But that's how we took some of our representations of Olympic Destroyer and integrated that for this year's village. And I'm wrapping up very early on yet, but that's okay because we might have a couple of questions, and I bet people do want to go to the bathroom. So this is a really special opportunity. Many of us here, we all have integration labs and we all tie things together to figure out how to go against use, certain use cases. And we all mess up somebody else's tool that we didn't write at some point. This is a really unique place where we're not all, we're working together, we're not fighting each other, we're not competitors here, we're collaborators. And we're able to let the experts from all the different pieces participate, contribute, because our goal here is promoting the open standards that allow us to interconnect our capabilities. We're not one, I'm not claiming to be a wild Marxist here, but we do work better when we are not all locked into. 15,000 proprietary interfaces that are going to cost people $100,000 a year to be allowed to read them. That's why we need. And this is a very, and I'm grateful to you, Duncan, for giving us these opportunities where we can showcase that. You're going to see lots of things come back today that we built in a matter of weeks that would normally from my experience in multiple pilots and experiments, I've had, had to take six, nine months to integrate 12 things together. 
And 90% of that time was just waiting on the meetings, the CRAs, the NDAs, and all the different licensing discussions we needed to have before we were allowed to even talk to them. And once we get talking, we can do a lot. And we're doing a lot here. But it helps a ton to have common scenarios. The wishy-washy scenario was great for last year's and helped carry into a lot of events for this year. But it looked short, we wanted to be able to get to that level of detail where we start saying, okay, what are the system logs for you know, somebody executing malicious office macros on a Windows victim? What does the network traffic look like with the terminal? And because those do ethical hacking, like everybody knows that. Everybody does not know that. And now we have those that we can share and start using the common reference. And it's a good start, and it's something that I think will help us a lot. And again, I haven't said it enough. Thank you to the entire cast project. Thank you to all of you attending. Thank you to everybody out there on the Zoom. We're grateful. We're stronger together. And with that, I have a few moments for questions before we get to take a break for the bathroom. Then we will take, go until 11 o'clock for the next session. Let's start here. I'll, I'll raise my hand and call myself. Uh, so, um, could, could you say, so first of all, thank, thank you very much. much. Uh, explanation everywhere else is we haven't explained the upload. So, yeah, CAST is the um, cybersecurity automation sub project of the Open Cybersecurity Alliance, who is running this whole thing. Um, and so, which I'm a coach of. Um, so, the question I want to ask is, uh, is and this is also particularly for the recording, because probably most of the people in the room know this answer, but um, so great. You have this stuff, and you've been showing how you could have prevented uh, bad things happening to the Olympics years ago. Why is company shining here? What, what's the value of this to me? The value of it to you is twofold. One, these attacks are still being done successfully today, and they are still getting around our defenses. And the other reason you should care, I think one example to stop. We're picking one example to show how we collaborate and stop an attack. This isn't the last attack ever happening on planet Earth, and we still have these defensive capabilities, and we still need them to work together. If you can, if you feel like, great, Charlie did a really lousy hack on Metasploit, represent this. Okay, do a better one. The goal isn't to, you know, show how great a uh, threat our developers are, is to show how we combine our products to process the data that we have available to find the threat. And if you look at one of our examples and think, geez, I can write a better analytic like that in my sleep, and I have, then we win. Just tell us how to do it better and share it. You want to sell it? You sell, it. sell your good work. But this is a way that we can get this capability out to you and show how show the value of combining these things rather than waiting 24 months in your acquisition cycle to be able to buy an update to your existing security set. It's, as the earlier speaker said, don't run, always run on the license, but you learn what you have and learn how to use it. We're helping to show our community how we can use our tools together. And it works best when there's some common interfaces between them so that they can function. Thank you. Uh, questions for Charlie in the room. Since I'm standing up, I'm not seeing my screen. Anybody raising a hand online? Can you tell? I don't see any hands. All righty. I'll turn it back over to you to announce the break. All right. In that case, we are taking a break until 11 o'clock. So we have some escorts to help us get out to the restrooms around the hall. And at that point, it will be, the, I believe, it's the standards sprints. Correct, and there is uh, water and cokes and pastries and things in the room too. Thank you everyone, we'll see you at 11. For those on the call, uh, we're sort of gonna disappear for a while. Uh, for those on the recording, hopefully we'll shut the recording off now. Hopefully on the uh, phone can hear us okay. Uh, the next section up is what we call a village standard sprint. We've uh, mentioned a little bit about this acronym suit that we've been talking about. We're going to have five different talks on many of the acronyms here. I'm going to be a little bit of a um, 
dragging on the holding them to five minutes. So hopefully we'll have some time for questions at the end. There will be a little bit of transition. Many of the people will be presenting are in the room, but some of them are virtual. So we'll have to do a little bit of switching back and forth. Um, but with that, I will turn it over to the first speakers. Introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Marlon Taylor. I'm co-chair of CTICC. I cover the state of Texas. I'm Cardi Desai, and I'm the co-chair for the Interoperability Subcommittee within the CDIPC. All right, we're going to try to stick to that five minutes sugar. So we wanted to go ahead and give a quick start for everyone that wasn't aware, for those that have been watching this recording later on. Um, the CDIPC we've been governed to set, provide a set of information of um, represent, representations and protocols um, so that you can model, analyze, and share cyber intelligence. We also wanted to be able to um, provide a way that you could share that cyber threat intelligence as well. So not just representing the cyber threat intelligence, but ways that you could share that. That's something else to sometimes ask. The other things that we um, do within the cyber threat intelligence CC, which is also mentioned by our guest speaker earlier today, we want to make sure that we're vendor agnostic. Um, we really want to make sure that we're standards based so that the community can go ahead and provide the different implementations that they need for their use case. And that's something you also see as we go through this entire session today and tomorrow, how folks have taken the standard that we've provided and they've implemented extensions on top of them for their use cases to be able to achieve their cyber threat intelligence goals. The audience that we want to focus on, we do have vendors here, but this is also for the um, academic and research communities as well. Anyone that is involved in producing or consuming CTI, that's really what we focus on. So we've covered the large um, spectrum of those that are really implementing different products, those that are actually doing intelligence products, those that are doing analysis, those that are responsible for the implementation of the solutions beyond that, the network defenders, the analysts. These are all the folks that we want to take into consideration. First, we're looking at those that are providing services um, to manage those things, and then also products that they can then leverage. Um, this is seen by different organizations. So we're not just focusing on the actual technical solutions, which was also mentioned by our keynote earlier today, but we really want to focus on those organizations that are leveraging those things as well. Um, and then the last one we're really starting to communities, we really want to be able to help focus on these different trust communities. For those of you that are involved, you may have different partners that you share information with, and that's really what we want to focus. We want to enable you to be productive in the communities and where you share information today and broaden those communities by having an interoperable solution, which we're leveraging today through our standards. And then to help achieve some of that, we have various work products. So two that are mentioned up here, that we have six and half these standards. Uh, and then we also have things like the best practices guide uh, for how to de best deal with uh, state and taxi. And then we also have six and taxi interoperability uh, standards, um, which I'll cover later. Just going over a quick timeline for those who are tracking. Um, the CTIPC is came to fruition in 2015 when the work that was originally on um, and tax was transitioned from the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. It was transitioned because we really wanted that work, which I also would persist, as I mentioned earlier. Um, we transitioned that work because we wanted that work to be governed by the people. We didn't want it to be locked down by a government body. Um, we really wanted it to be an international standard that can be leveraged by the community at mass. We'll talk about that later on as well. Um, so we transitioned that over to Oasis, which truly has open standards. We wanted it to remain that way. That's the reason for that. Um, over the years, we've moved on to develop SIGS and TAXI versions 2.1, which have now become official OAC standards. And moving beyond that, we're now in conversation with ITU to formally adopting those standards so that that could be more um, broadly accessible through the ITU and translation into different languages. Um, so that other communities, um, besides those that are already participating in OASIS, which is an international community, could then also reap the benefit of the work that we've done by having it in their native language and then being able to be leveraged by different um, authoritation of different authorities based off those countries for being able to implement standards. So that's the work that we have there so far. Um, so some of our goals, is we are standards-based, as I mentioned before. Some of those standards are six and taxi. Those are the ones that we have so far. Um, we really focus on extensibility. You see that within six. Um, we are currently working on an extension to the incident object. You'll see that um, throughout the session as well. And they also had the ability to provide new um, New objects or relationships within six. So while six does provide a set of top level objects and relationships, we also have it as sensible so that you can create new objects and new relationships to um, support your needs. Um, and then also on the taxi side, we've also provided additional um, filtering capability besides those that are within the standard. Those are also seen in the interop documents so that folks can provide additional um, nuances such as querying and things like that when they're trying to leverage that taxi for their 
And then for interoperability, so as I mentioned before, we also have the six two one one and taxi two one one interoperability test documents, and those outline a variety of tests that uh, you can go through as kind of the checklist and make sure that you're interoperable with anyone else that would uh, that produces uh, tools that use six or taxi. Um, and in fact. We've uh, had a conversation uh, with, uh, with people within Oasis about uh, their approach to interoperability and that is still in development, but um, so it does look interesting. And um, yeah, we look forward to uh, working with everyone here to make sure that um, intelligence sharing can go, we can and further enhance it and take it forward. Thank you. Great. Charlie. Off to you and you can introduce yourself. Uh, Hello again, everybody. So, uh, for the next couple of minutes, I'm going to discuss the indicator of behavior sub project for you. I will be, uh, as Marlon mentioned just a second ago, one of the great features of SIX is that it can be extended, and that allows us to create some custom objects. And the work on IOB was looking at how we could take advantage of that and publicly share some extended six objects to better represent cyber adversary behaviors. So IOB is a structured representation of reusable adversary behaviors tied to detections and correlation workflows, as well as response. If we can go forward one slide. I just have one slide on the topic. Oh, sorry, I'm sure I got it. And so the motivation we were having for this was that even today, our network operations, our security ops teams, they really struggle to obtain and use CTI. We have lots of people obtaining lots of CTI. I've got lots of places that have paid for tons of fees. And when I really look deep down at it, I've got, at the best case scenario, often two or three people who copy or use automation copy thousands of indicators of compromise and search for them or block them. Now, this assumes a couple of things. Now, you have to look for IOCs, but it also assumes that all of our attackers are complete morons. If I am a bad guy and someone has publicly broadcasted my domain name and my IP address as actively attacking things, and if it only takes me 30 seconds to get a new one, I'm probably attacking your company from a different one. Yet we still hunt for these. File hashes are very valuable intel, but also they're very easy to change on malware. So we need something that's more use and reason people keep looking at indicators of compromise is because they're currently the most actionable data that we send machine to machine. IOB exists to change that. We use attack patterns from minor attack, and we begin attack, attack those tactics and techniques. I wish we had one detection for every entry on the minor attack grid. We do not. It's too high level. It's not intended to be done that way. So we look at how we translate those into repeatable behaviors. And I'll talk more on that during the demo this afternoon. And then we look at detections that we would want to feed to automation. These are not the type of detections we currently look for, because I'm talking about a set where each individual detection has a really high false positive rate. Nobody likes that, because you're assuming, we assume a human is going to have to stare at 300,000 false positives per day. I don't want a human to look at that. I want a computer to look across the set of five and tell me when the same computer that just opened up a web browser to download a macro document, the same computer that opened a Word macro document that spawned a command shell, which is the same computer that started sending some strange network traffic to the domain controller, pretending that it was a domain controller. Because when those three things happen, something not right is gone. That is what I want to alert my security ops team about. But 
There's also, in the, as I say this as a researcher, we have a stupid belief in research that every SOC team is filled with all these programmers. They're not. They're filled with analysts. So let's share a machine-readable workflow that they could ingest into the tools to correlate those alerts, tell them the searches to run in their scenes that's not tied to one platform, and let's use open standards like Cacao, which will be coming up in a little bit, to tell them how to take action on it. That's our concept. And we are utilizing Six to standardize it so it's not tied to any one platform. And we are putting reference implementations all up on our GitHub, as well as a few other tools and things that I will show this afternoon. With that, my watch is telling me that I need to shut up and get to the next project. So with that, I'm going to hand it off to Ryan to talk about TAC TC. Thank you. Thanks, Jeremy. So I am Ryan Wolheimer. I'm co-chair of the Threat Actor Context Technical Committee, uh, co-chair with the CILIOs. And uh, I will see how technologically savvy I am here. Apparently not. So the down arrow. There we go. So the, the problem, and I'm going to keep this uh, brief and, and short. I wrote these uh, slides weeks ago, so they may or may not be relevant at this point. But the, the major problem that we've got in cybersecurity is the speed, the veracity, the size of the data that we've got to consider. Um, and we don't have enough talented human analysts to analyze this stuff. And so the challenge that we have is how can we help through automation to, to do um, the, the basic analytics, the, the, the triage of the data to help us automate those capabilities and get to um, upper level analysis quicker. But what we want is a technology that's accomplish, accomplishable by machine, it's machine readable, and we we want the the data to we want to be able to embed in our data the the logic and the analytics capability that humans have in that automation, and we want that knowledge to to be considering the same kinds of elements that uh, the humans are considering. So what we've done with originally in the TAC uh, TC was we wanted to wrap the sticks exchange language uh, in, a, in a, a format, in a capability that took it to that next level where we could embed not only the data transfer, but embed the logic of the analyst as well. And so the challenge that we addressed was taking the 6.2.1 JSON format and extending that to a full knowledge graph or an ontology that was capable of embedding that logic and that knowledge and that experience of the human analyst so that we can describe the context around the threat actors. We found that in order to interpret the context around the threat actor, we needed some external data. So we started to harvest some of that data from the uh, from MITRE, from NIST, from private sector, um, so that we had the elements to describe the context around the threat actor. What this all turned out to be in the last number of, we've been at this for five years now, but in the last six months, the explosion has kind of happened. We've kind of hit that point where things took off because we, we started to put the six content into knowledge graph format and the capabilities exploded from there. So this afternoon, uh, I'll demonstrate some of where this has gone, but the key element here to explain in this five minutes that I got 
is that through the threat actor context uh, technical committee, we've started to move from describing things just for exchange and move them into a language or knowledge graphs for analytics. And this is an important feature. Actually, I'm going to relinquish the extra minute and we'll, we'll go to the next speaker. I will take over because the next speaker will be. Oh, I, I did have another slide. So go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the last 30 seconds. And, and this is the essence of what I was just saying. The threat actor context uh, technical committee, we moved from taking the six 2.1 JSON format and moving it into a six RDF graph representation of that data and gave it an easy, intuitive, graph analytics format to display that information so that we could start to give a contextual understanding, a situational awareness from that data. Uh, thank you. The uh, next speaker will be remote. I will do the uh, clicking of the slides when he wants them, and hopefully they are can now unmute and start speaking. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Azam. Uh, I'll be talking about the stick shifter uh, project. Uh, I'm the maintainer of this project uh, at the moment. So this this open source Python library is basically uh, takes sticks to pattern as an input and finds data that matches the pattern inside various products that house data repositories, uh, mainly cybersecurity data. So example of this product could be any SIM system, endpoint management system, threat intelligence platform, orchestration, network control points, data lakes, yeah, anything mainly. So uh, in addition to finding object uh, by using this pattern, a stick shift will also transform the output into six to observables. Uh, next slide, please. So this is mainly the workflow of this uh, library. So once you, someone uh, submit a sticks pattern, it translates into the native data source query that the API understands. Then we send the query, translate the query to the yeah, through the API to the data source. Then it is the results are fetched after getting the results in a JSON format. The results are basically translated into um, uh, bundles of sticks objects. Uh, this is the simple workflow that um, we have in the library. Uh, next slide, please. So what can we do mainly with stick shipper? It can be used in various ways. Uh, it can be used as a CLI tool. You can run commands with it. it can, those commands can be included in your any uh, playbook, um, any tools, any orchestration of any script that you may have. Uh, to run or find different uh, different cybersecurity data. So it also can be used as a library. Um, you can include that in your project code, product code, and, and use it as you need it. Uh, there are use cases of federated search out there. Um, and also we can enrich the data by the different translation modules that this library offers. So there are various connectors that we have in the project currently more than 35 um, various different kinds of data service uh, data sources it can connect to and search data starting AWS Azure CrowdStrike Carbon Black and you name it so I put a link up there as well but you can go uh, check it out the project see uh, uh, what's in there maybe um, try it out as a CLI tool first and then if you like it then you can use it as a library in the product um, you uh, the the people uh, will be talking about Castrol next. I think um, they are one of the consumer of this library. They use it in threat hunting. That's one of the main use case. Um, and yeah, this is it for me. I'm not taking too long. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. So glad. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Xiao Wei Shu from IBM Research, and I'm a co-founder of Project Castro. Cyber hunting is a procedure and art to craft, strategize, and test them. 
So, so the two important parties in cyber strategy are human and machine. So human is responsible for creating the threat policies and thinking about what the attacker is doing. And the machines here are responsible for executing and test, testing the threat policies to see whether this is something really happened and give human an idea whether we want to revise the hypothesis, we want to hunt in some other directions. Potential is a layer of abstraction that help to bridge the human and the machine in the cyber threat hunting world. Usually for a threat, on the right side you can see, human view the threat in an entity relation view. For example, what is the process, what is the file, how the process has a file, how the actor moves through the network. This is the entity view, relation view. However, the data on the machine side is usually raw logs in a very, very uh, raw format that every process, every machine emit their own logs unrelated, they are messed together in different formats. So there is a huge gap between human view and machine view of how to hunt. In other fields, such as um, general problem solving or mathematics, people are using languages such as Python, such as Wolfram Mathematica, to abstract some of the low-level details from the very low-level uh, raw data so that human or even generated AI on the top can reason about the things easily. Can we have something similar for the cybersecurity domain? That is the start of Kestrel. So Kestrel is both a language and a compiler. So the Kestrel language abstract away the very detailed low-level schemas, APIs, semantics, and how to execute the things so that the human or gender AI on the top can put their thoughts in a more abstract format that is composable, that is shareable, reusable for different systems, vendor agnostic. And the com catcher compiler then takes in the catcher hunt flows or hunt books, compile them precisely and efficiently onto the low level queries and execute them, fetch the data back and get one step to another. Charles talked about the inhaler behavior project. Inhaler behavior is a perfect example of an individual concept that we will see in the afternoon demo. That how are we going to execute the hunt through OpenSea using OpenSea 2 to get some of the Olympia destroyer uh, detected? Of course, there are other concepts that the capture hunt flow will be able to organize together that you will see. So we announced the cash draw at RC 2021st, and then um, we were doing multiple development and involvement since then. Um, we showcased cash draw at Red Hat, and we do the first customization of OpenCQ at Red Hat 2022 to showcase the connection between cash draw and OpenCQ to automate the procedure of hunting and even mitigation and uh, other uh, type of responses. And last year, we were very pleasant that we gave the draft about the OpenSea Docker profile. Finally, what we done was we showed it that Black Hat 2022 get into the OpenSea issue standard little by little. And today, in the afternoon, we are going to show the latest progress. And um, yeah, that's for that thing. The uh, next speaker is remote. So I will turn it over to them and click slides. Sorry. Thank you very much. Good morning and good afternoon and good evening to everyone. So I'm Alexandre Luno, I'm uh, the head of Circle and I'm co chairing the CTITC with Marlon. Hi, I'm Christian. I'm also working with uh, Alexandre on the Circle team, mostly on uh, the development of MISP and the integrations. 
Yeah, so, so MISP is, is an open source platform. Maybe some of you already know the platforms and um, uh, we design a standard where this can be used for uh, trade, in, trade intelligence sharing, uh, providing a structured environment to aggregate, uh, model, store and distribute information. Uh, next slide, please. So what we decided to do for the past 13 years is a full ecosystem. Um, the idea behind is really relying on, on the uh, strong open source community that we have uh, over the past years in different uh, group of activities. And especially that um, the first, I was early beginning of the platforms, we wanted to have a strong automation. So I really enjoy the different presentation and getting automations and that's really one of the key elements. And uh, for MISP, we uh, wanted to be sure that we have an advanced API, uh, we have a, a, a flexible integrations with many other tools and formats. But in addition to that, and I think that came after, I would say, a uh, uh, thing that interoperability was a very uh, important aspect of, of the platforms. We basically uh, uh, design a standard format, uh, which is a JSON format, uh, which basically provide a, a long-term consistent format that we can use for interoperability. And next to that, we have a set of contextualization libraries. Um, so-called taxonomies, galaxies, and so on, um, which basically can be contributed by third parties. Um, and the idea behind is basically with the complete ecosystem, you can basically reuse some of the components that we provide as open source tools or open data that can be reused by other platforms. And that for us was one of the key elements is basically having this kind of full ecosystems allow us to have a complete integrations with other tools, either proprietary tools or uh, open source tool. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the, I would say, more important, important challenges that we had uh, for the past uh, no, 30, 13 years um, is really to build a community around uh, the information that is shared, but especially to facilitate, facilitate contributions. Um, what we have seen over the times is a, a lot of organizations, uh, countries, uh, people actually using intelligence tools and so on, have different mindsets, different cultures, and so on. And that's really important to basically encompass this kind of differences into our system. So we did from the early beginning facilitate the contribution to the software, but not only, but also to the knowledge base. And people can actually contribute um, uh, different things. For us, the thing that is really important too is relating the, the stability of standards. And I'm, I'm basically uh, uh, following what has been said for the past uh, hours regarding the stability of the open source standard, which is really an open uh, open standard, which is really important, which basically kind of the role of Oasis too. Um, and uh, for the past uh, years, we basically provide a, a long-term stability on the uh, on the standards. Um, maybe Christian will talk about MIS uh, Sticks, which is basically a, a library for uh, interoperability between the MIS standard and uh, the Sticks uh, standard too, because for us, it's really important to maintain long-term compatibility uh, with existing tool sets, uh, pipelines, and automation that people have developed over time. And what we want to be sure that is to extend to uh, new open standards. Um, we saw Kerstrel, for example, just before, and uh, we are really, uh, really happy to see new standards, really, uh, really focused standards on different languages and so on. And for us, ensuring stability and compatibility among them is really one of the core elements in the MISP, uh, in the MISP project. Um, so we are really eager to assist other software uh, to actually reuse some of our components, uh, like the, the MISTIX library, uh, to basically facilitate the uh, integration and interoperability um, over time. Next slide, please. So yeah, without going uh, in, into the, all the details shown here in the timeline, the, it, it just shows uh, that we are um, involved in uh, developing uh, a tool to basically share information in a modular way with um, uh, generic components that can be reused that are um, aligned with uh, other uh, standards. And the the idea really is to, to build some uh, sharing communities to provide the tools for people to uh, being able to share information for um, uh, connecting their other tools as uh, as um, as well as they uh, as we can um, develop some um, automation tools with them, and 
yeah, the 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 goal really is to uh, make this uh, available for people to use and to uh, go with their own workflow. Um, yeah, do you have any other uh, comments on this, uh, Alexandre? No, that's it. I think it was a good summary. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker um, will also be remote. I have to uh, refresh. I can do that while it's still live. <laughs> yeah, it was it was a live one. <laughs> um, hello, everyone. Um, so I'm Samuel. Uh, I'm the CEO and the co-founder of Filigran, which is uh, the company behind like Open CTI. Um, so OpenCTI is an open source platform. Uh, our colleagues from MISP just uh, just presented MISP, and this open source platform were really designed um, to to have like a thing about like threat knowledge capability um, uh, from like more like technical to strategic use cases. So please like next slide. Uh, so what is OpenCTI? So basically, like the platform is based on the stick standard. So we talked just like just before about like the stick standard. So for us and for the developers uh, of the platform, so it's an open source platform, and it has been really really designed to uh, to maximize the compatibility between um, between the SecOps community and the stick standard. So the first thing is it's organizing and managing like large threat intelligence data sets from the technical aspects, indicators, signatures of detections to the more like strategic level with victimologies and TPPs. Uh, the platform also um, provides data visualizations, capabilities such as like, you know, complex patterns, insights, graphs, um, a lot of like timelines and mitre attack matrices. Um, the platform also comes with indicators lifecycle uh, automation so you can really automate like the management of the indicators and i think as as Alexander, like told you uh, most of the thing in threat intelligence now is about automations and about like how you can streamline detection and life cycle without like just uh blow blow up let's say detection um detection uh, um engines and, and mechanisms with like some let's say low level iocs uh, case management is also part of the platform to to be able like to have more incident response capabilities within the platform because we really really think that basically threat intelligence case management with requests for information and a request for takedown is quite like the same thing as handling an incident response case. Um, it comes like just with response orchestration workflows and the ability to match between threat intelligence coming from external vendors and sources and threat intelligence also coming from the internal incidents that an organization may face. Um, integration with a lot of things and basically also intelligence sharing using the stick standard, using taxi collection, or using like simple CSV feeds. Next slide, please. Uh, so the platform is basically really an input output platform. So you can bring a lot of like different data, uh, always using uh, the stick 2.1 standard whether it is, you know, threat intelligence, sightings and incidents, um, case including like, you know, investigations that you can do directly in the platform. So you can really like produce intelligence directly into the platform using, for instance, content mapping or natural language processing capabilities. Uh, you can have like all the vulnerabilities aspect. For instance, one of the use cases we saw within the platform and, um, and one of the challenge threat intelligence team has is just to say, um, are you able like to give me, okay, I have like those vulnerabilities in my IT. I have like this roadmap in terms of patching. Are you able to tell me if I have like threat actors in the wide exploiting that vulnerabilities and those threat actors are also targeting my industry, which is the kind of like questions the platform um, aims to answer um, for complex, you know, IT systems and organizations. Uh, so assets and operational artifacts, you can also bring that into the platform and then Within the platforms, you have basically outputs, which can be outputs outside the platform, so maintained by um, um, connectors or inside the platform. So threat intelligence analysis, uh, feeding detection capabilities and detection One engineering, um, incident response, reports that we're doing risk analysis and anticipation.
You still there? Yep. Next one. Okay, 30 seconds. Uh, yeah, sorry, I, I'm out of time. So uh, just like last slide here, it's really about like, you know, what is the output for a security operation center is about like, basically it's the output about open CPI, but also like about threat intelligence, uh, obviously like reduce uh, the time to qualifications, reduce the time to detection, uh, reduce time to response, and also like reduce like the alert static in general. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, you can go like to the next one. Thank you. So good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Vasilis Mavridis. I'm a professor at the University of Oslo. Uh, I'm also currently the uh, co-chair of uh, the Kapao Technical Committee. And, uh, I'll talk to you briefly about uh, this effort. So uh, what is uh, Kakao? First of all, it stands for Collaborative, right? Automated Course of Action Operations. Uh, and this is a, a common schema for security playbooks. And, uh, um, it is uh, machine readable, so I, I like always saying that uh, you know uh, Kakao will provide you with uh, a path to automation, right? But uh, you, know, uh, you can have commands uh, executed uh, manually, uh, automatically. It includes uh, logic, and uh, later today we're going also to have a, a demo that uh, you know you don't really have to go into the details of the specification, but you have a software to uh, basically hide uh, all this complexity and uh, you can generate playbooks. Design, etc. Having said uh, that, to bring this into perspective, we're not going into many details, right? Um, you know, I, I think we need to think of cacao like as a counterpart of uh, SIS. So why did we create uh, SIS at the end of the day, right? We wanted uh, a way to represent cyber intelligence, right? A common way and uh, exchange. So uh, similarly, right, we designed uh, cacao to be able to uh, represent defensive data, and there are multiple use cases, but uh, you know, defensive data, of course, in the mind when we start uh, designing uh, cacao, uh, and, uh, you know, exchange it. So, as I said earlier, right, uh, cacao allows for the interplay of uh, people, technology, and processes, right? You can execute the commands automatically, uh, manually, you can involve basically, you know, uh, the human uh, on the loop. Uh, and then the data allows you to encode the cybersecurity processes, right? Uh, this can be for detection purposes, um, investigation, remediation, uh, mitigation, uh, prevention. Uh, you can go even uh, further on that, right? We're using cacao playbooks for uh, business continuity and compliance um, and resilience, actually. Um, yeah, that goes back to uh, what I said. Um, basically, to bring this to perspective, uh, you know, uh, six is great on what it's doing, right? Uh, it allows you to uh, represent cyber threat intelligence. Uh, but at some point, we realized that, uh, you know, uh, we have detection engineering, right? We create all these things. Uh, but then it was all about, yeah, okay, we have this, uh, we have enough context, so now what? How are we going to respond, uh, basically? Uh, um, yeah, so uh, we create cacao labels. Uh, you'll see uh, later that there uh, are a lot of uh, similarities. Uh, we see so it's quite uh, seamless uh, in quotes uh, currently to um, integrate uh, into a six graph. So basically, you can go from a detection to response, and then based on your uh, maturity and the capacity, uh, you can actually start uh, automating uh, stuff and exchanging uh, also, you know, playing with templates uh, with the processes that uh, you normally execute. Uh, and this is the high level architecture of Kakao. I won't go into uh, details, uh, but we uh, you know, designed it using a modular approach. Uh, you know, it incorporates a lot of metadata for knowledge management, but also uh, you know, this metadata uh, support basically uh, orchestrators to implement things, let's say, uh, faster, right? uh, more efficiently. Uh, we have the workflow sets, right? different uh, workflow sets, basically different types. Um, you can actually branch uh, playbooks uh, with playbooks, right? So you can have a modular approach uh, while you're designing uh, your playbooks. Uh, you know, uh, it incorporates multiple command languages. Uh, uh, and uh, we have agents and targets, and basically uh, agents execute commands against targets. Uh, yeah, authentication information, uh, pretty straightforward. Data markings uh, like uh, sticks, you can define, for example, uh, PLP levels. Also, calling those digits, so maybe I can take it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and uh, also Kakao uh, allows for uh, extensions. Uh, basically, you know, if uh, you realize that the schema is uh, inadequate, 
for you that or you would like to have like a, you know, some, some kind of extra things incorporated, you know, you can do that by using the extension uh, definition mechanism that is uh, um, also used by the 600. Yeah, and you can also do the same thing. Right, and I'm not going to take uh, time for that, uh, but uh, basically, you know, we have worked on the house since uh, 2019 as a technical uh, committee. Uh, we have a couple of uh, versions uh, released, and uh, the latest one, uh, version 2.0, was released in October 2023, and uh, we consider a quite robust uh, version currently. Yeah. Oh, in April 2024, uh, I'm not sure if we have uh, made the announcement, but uh, we approved the commit specification, the cacao layout extension. You will see it also later in the demo uh, implemented, that basically allows to, uh, you know, um, add, uh, incorporate uh, coordinates uh, into your playbooks, so you can have a consistent uh, visualization of the approach, uh, and that's uh, quite useful when you exchange the playbooks, right, to support the uh, readability and the understandability. So, uh, next presentation for Kakao Roster. So, uh, I mean, creating uh, Kakao playbooks is not something uh, easy to do, right? Uh, so uh, basically, uh, Kakao is encoded in a JSON serialization format, right? So uh, if you want to start designing Kakao playbooks, you know, it's not as simple as uh, right? You have to write uh, JSON. Uh, for that reason, we need uh, software to uh, support, you know, um, your efforts in designing a Kakao playbooks, right? This is the Kakao roster. And uh, what is it? It's an uh, open source web application, right? We allow you to create playbooks, but it has also multiple features. You are going to see them. Uh, uh, later today. So, and uh, basically, this is how uh, it looks like. We released we release the product in, uh, on uh, January uh, 2024. And, uh, you know, I think it looks uh, quite fancy. Uh, it has a multiple batch. So, uh, when you start uh, experimenting with the uh, <laughs> roster, you know, just, uh, you know, uh, go on GitHub and, uh, you know, submit your issues. Uh, the bullet points, uh, you know, I, I want to make a uh, something evident, right? So, uh, because people utilize the, this application, uh, you know, it, it's quite seamless to basically uh, install it and start using it. But uh, we designed it using, again, a modular approach, right? So, uh, Kakao actually hides, uh, the Kakao roster actually hides a few things that maybe we have not documented very well uh, on GitHub, right? And, and why I have these things there, right? I mean, uh, the whole point is that the, the ones that are, uh, you know, uh, bolded, you can actually, uh, take them and you use them in other software, right? So uh, if you create like a, a Kakao-based software, right? The second bullet point uh, talks about the Kakao version 2 library. So this is the library that allows you basically to call it and create uh, Kakao objects, right? So you don't have to recreate that. And this is actually half of the software, right? The, the UI to create is it's not challenging, but creating uh, the objects themselves, you know, yeah, it, it's more difficult. And uh, similarly, you know, we, uh, we have also published uh, JSON validation schemas uh, for Kakao. I've incorporated the layout extension and uh, something new. This is a new feature, and you're going to see it for the first time uh, today. You know, uh, Kakao, uh, until a few hours ago, you know, used to be just a, you know, a web application that allowed you to generate labels, right? Multiple features, but, you know, it had nothing to do with execution. So, I mean, uh, since uh, yesterday night, I can execute labels. Okay, so uh, we integrated uh, uh, the Kakao roster with another, with another open source uh, project that was released. Uh, Couple of weeks ago, if I'm not mistaken, uh, it's uh, from a TNO research institute in the Netherlands. They have also a presentation uh, later today. So, uh, Kakao now communicates, uh, the Kakao roster communicates natively with uh, Soraka, so you can execute the uh, playbooks. Of course, there are some issues there, but you know, we'll have a demo later, you'll see everything. So, we have this uh, new integrations option, and uh, we're going also to uh, add uh, uh, more SOAR solutions uh, on Kakao roster. So. Just an example playbook, right? Uh, and, and actually, this is a, I call it a real playbook because we have executed in a pilot use case in the EU. Uh, you know, it, it is funded basically by the European Union in the context of European project. Uh, so uh, this is a playbook that has been executed um, in a company. Uh, yeah, in the energy sector, that, that's uh, all I can say, right? And uh, basically, uh, it uh, mitigates a specific uh, type of attack, in particular, you know, uh, false data uh, injection. 
And uh, you know, uh, basically it makes uh, certain that uh, the threat is uh, mitigated and uh, while also allowing for business continuity. So it starts bringing uh, hosts and uh, you know, the advanced metering infrastructure uh, basically from uh, standby uh, you know, to operation. And then uh, we're going to make this playbook available later. Uh, I think uh, I have also my colleague Mateo here that he's going to design this playbook uh, with you and explain details and execute also playbooks. Yeah, so this concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next presentation will be remote on the very topic that was just discussed. Uh, yeah, yeah. I will put the slides for you. Yeah, uh, can you hear me well? We can, thank you. Yes, uh, good day, everyone. Uh, indeed, uh, I will present now briefly of this tool. Uh, Sorca, uh, I'm Luca Morgese Zangrandi, working in the Dutch Institute uh, of uh, Research in uh, Cybersecurity Research and Development. So SORCA uh, stands for Security Orchestrator for Advanced Cyber Response, Advanced Response to Cyber Attacks, uh, besides the acronym that, that makes for a nice logo, wh where it does actually, it's an execution engine natively for uh, Kakao v2, uh, V2 playbooks. So uh, next slide, please. Yeah, uh, so uh, we were very well, we have a beautiful standard Kakao that we can start working with. It does super cool things. But how do we get directly to the infrastructure? How do we execute Kakao Playbook? So that's like the, the reason to be of Sorka. And that's the next slides. That's maybe you would have guessed uh, the, the Pokemon there. But um, that's kind of the, the, the core of what Sorka was designed for. And we can go to the next slide. Uh, and it was designed uh, and developed uh, in the context of uh, our research uh, organization, TNO. Uh, what we wanted to do is to have a, a, this workflow orchestrator that could uh, uh, execute like issue actions to uh, uh, an IT infrastructure uh, using open source standards because we had many issues with, of course, vendors and, uh, and uh, closed source technologies and alike. So what we developed the tool with the, the, objects, the objectives we had are support research and innovation in security automation, and also allow the community to experiment with these kind of tools uh, and try all these cool things that we could do with Kakao. Uh, next slide. So what does uh, Sorka do? Uh, this is a, a, a snapshot of the, of the underlying architecture. Uh, next slide, uh, thank you. Uh, well, of course it uh, executes playbooks. Uh, at the moment, we have developed uh, uh, three core uh, actions that are the SSH action, uh, the HTTP action, and OpenC2 actions. Uh, as we speak, we are developing more actions, among which the manual action uh, execution. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and we also have integrated this extensibility by design on what you can do. So we have a protocol that is going to be released also very soon uh, that allows you to plug your own capabilities to Sorka so that you can execute actions that you can custom define uh, through these extensions we call FIN, very nice name. Um, yeah, next slide, please. So we have integrated, of course, uh, a flexible, nice logging framework so that you can keep track of all the actions that are happening and all what's going on in the execution of a playbook. Uh, next slide. Uh, we have uh, integrated in the release a database where you can store the playbooks and the components of the playbooks. Um, next slide, uh, thank you. And uh, as we speak also, we are uh, developing uh, push, pull and connection based uh, integrations to Sorka uh, and that are, can be third party integrations and connections. Uh, uh, Vasile, Jose, and Mateus will give a, a bit of a, a demo of this later. Uh, but we are really designing it to be extensible and easily pluggable also in uh, operative contexts uh, and with known, uh, with known uh, tools uh, that are being used. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, uh, this is all, uh, all in plan. So we already have released, uh, as uh, Vasile was saying a couple of weeks ago, a stable version one, uh, but there are many things we are working on and we have the official releases uh, on GitHub. That's the link. Uh, you can uh, go there and see what's going on. Uh, but as uh, uh, John Ken once said, yes, next slide, uh, please. Uh, so uh, ask not only what Sorka can do for you, but uh, ask what you can do for Sorka. So next slide. 
thank you. Uh, what we STNO as research organization plan to do is definitely continue, continue developing SORCA uh, with the projects we are part of, with all the, all the initiatives we are part of. Um, we can also have contract research to, to work uh, into that. And we can support support the community uh, interacting with Sorka on GitHub, but uh, we also have uh, we also release it open source to have this community interaction. So uh, we are already receiving some requests and collaborations. It's really nice, uh, and we encourage everyone to uh, to take part to that because uh, yeah, that's what would make this kind of interoperability great, no good for everyone. So you have the uh, well, the GitHub link is down there. Just like uh, you can uh, find uh, through GitHub anyway, or the email. Uh, and that was uh, it for me. Next slide is just a thank you, thank you slide. Thank, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Mike, you're up. Thank you, sir. What do I do? The three slides. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Rosa from the NSA. I am uh, going to be presenting on OpenC2 for us. Uh, I co chair OpenC2 with my colleague there, Nancy Sparrow, who always keeps me busy. So, I am um, going to talk a little bit about how we got started here. So, Open Command and Control, uh, standardized language for the command and control of cybersecurity solutions are supporting them, right? Um, we actually started what, back about 2015, 2016. Um, and it was actually an NSA forum that started this work and then slowly transitioned into an Oasis TC in 2016, where then we were chartered to actually start um, standardizing some of these languages. So we wanted to find language that was abstract, that was lightweight, flexible, um, and most importantly was, of course, gender agnostic. We wanted to focus on the action portion of the OODA loop. So if you guys know the OODA loop, um, and this, uh, we, we changed a bit to look at the remediation cycle and sense, analyze, decide, and act. So where you have playbooks that are looking more at um, the flow of how the certain actions you might want to take, this is the actual action command. We're sending singular uh, word verbs uh, that would actually allow you to then um, basically say what action we want to take. Um, so we have been looking at uh, new ways to create uh, profiles. This is a very modular approach to this, right? So we have a language, um, we have an architecture, we have uh, specifications for how you would want to do uh, the transfer of OPC to the language. So you'll see on the right all the way, uh, we have actually um, multiple specifications out. When we first came to the uh, OASIS uh, technical committee side, we started with three, the language spec, uh, stateless packet filter profile, and of course, uh, a transfer spec is an HTTPS. We expanded it. Now we have an um, MQTT. So instead of just only having standardized point to point, we also do pub sub. Uh, we also have looked at um, expanding into other profiles, some of which are still in currently in development, which I'll get to in a second. Um, we've also done some CNs, which has looked at um, how to actually profile development and how to look at information model. Because the last one that I haven't talked about yet on there. Um, uh, refers to JSON, JSON abstract data notation. But basically, what we look at with that is how we can do um, the information modeling of uh, open C2 commands and then create serialized data in multiple formats like XML or JSON C4. We actually started this as a way to help us with doing the abstract vendor agnostic definition of profiles, and we slowly realized we were turning into an information modeling language, an information modeling standard. So we ended up working to standardize what we now call JS, uh, the, the JSON version 1.0, and we created a uh, committee note that actually discusses how to do information modeling, how it compares to ASML 1, um, and how it's uh, uh, friendly to being uh, coordinated and serializing across XML, uh, JSON and C4. We've also looked at uh, potential ways of developing tooling that can kind of support some of that. So, as I mentioned, we've been continuing to work on standardization of all of this in OpenC2 and working with our partners across the Oasis TC and also working in uh, open source community for awareness and adoption as well. So, right now, there's multiple profiles being in development where we have endpoint detection response, uh, working with the software of Build Materials community like SPDX, Cyclone DX, and uh, getting involved in other communities to see how we can also um, connect OpenC2 and S1 together for sharing of threat information. 
Uh, of course, we also have been working with the threat team, which you'll see that later from the technical team and uh, some of the colleagues from my team uh, focus on how do you do threat hunting and use open systems along that process. Then, of course, as information modeling goes, we continue to add to the uh, change investigation how to explain it and update it. So, where we actually already have serialization rules within the JSON spec. Um, but we already have uh, the uh, serialization rules for JDA to uh, verbose JSON, concise JSON, and even Seaboard. Um, we've actually been working on tooling for the uh, XML part of this so that we can also add to do an update to the uh, JDA spec to also include the serialization rules for that. Um, so, of course, you see on the right there uh, some of the other uh, specific, uh, some of the other groups that we've worked with, of course, uh, some of them are familiar to all of you in this room. So, since I'm down for a minute, I'll just say that I just noticed I did not actually have the updated version of this picture. This is going to be more anticipation than SCAP V2. Um, but basically, this was discussing our interoperability uh, demonstration, um, and hopefully, the threat hunting will get much more updated uh, uh, interoperability demonstration later this afternoon. So obviously looking at how we work with the orchestration and uh, doing posture assessment and sending commands um, to obtain that spot and then uh, vice versa continue down for a playbook. So I'll stop there because I'm pretty sure coming out the way. Thank you, Mike. And the uh, next speaker is remote also. So uh, I'll be the slide clicker and David Rowe. Hello, everybody. Uh, can you hear me well? Yeah? We can, can yes. yes. Okay, great. Uh, so I'm David Bizol. I'm a co-founder at, uh, at Sequoia, and I'm the chair of uh, OXA. So OXA, OXA, uh, has been designed as an open architecture to, uh, to allow extended detection uh, and extended response. Basically, uh, that means that you can interact with many kinds of data sources for ingest ingestion capabilities and also interact with them, let's say, to automate response and doing that, doing, doing that agnostically. Uh, next slide, please, Duncan. So the motivation to launch OXA was really to give sense uh, to this, this XDR uh, keyword. We really believed uh, that XDR is about extended detection and extended response, and also extended dissemination of threat intel. And these were, let's say, the foundations of this OXA project. Um, you, you can see this, this project as a kind of a glue layer uh, with other, other projects or other standards to, to leverage them into a specific use case, which is better detection and better re reaction. Um, the point is that this project can can really provide um, provide benefits, let's say, for for, for different populations. Um, from what we have observed, let's say, users can uh, would get the possibility to organize their system with a vendor agnosticity approach. Um, for cybersecurity vendors, they can optimize the time of their integration teams, which is today something on which everyone can spend a lot of time and money. Um, and for cybersecurity products, which is the third one, you can uh, um, you can empower, let's say, your products with CTI uh, coming from the backend side of the XDR. Uh, from the XDR. So next slide, please, Duncan. So what are the main challenges, uh, let's say, we have to face? Well, let's say as a glue project, this is all about let's say standard selection and standard adoption. So I'm talking about standard selection. Uh, we have one challenge uh, when we have different standards competing, let's say, in some way. Uh, and this is true uh, when it's about, let's say, the ingestion of aspect of logs or events. We have different standards uh, that covers the same scope, and we have maybe to select one of them. And talking about standard adoption, uh, we all know that it can require a lot of time, let's say, for the industry uh, to accept to use a standard and, and to tune uh, the roadmap, let's say, to replace uh, an existing stack. Um, but our goal, uh, let's say, will be let's say to have people using uh, using part of it progressively uh, to collect the feedback uh, and to continue improving the way, uh, or let's say, the, the way to use this glue uh, um, in an, in an easy way. And the final slide, please, Duncan. So, if we have a look on the project timeline, uh, it started roughly one, one year ago. 
Um, it has been approved as an OCA project, and the first commit, uh, first GitHub pro, pro, first GitHub commits uh, were made at this moment. <laughs> and then the problem started. Uh, let's say I believe that we could propose, let's say, a rich GitHub repository with everything inside, uh, but this was not possible. Time has time has, time has passed. Uh, I spent a lot of time, let's say, for company stuff uh, without progressing on OXA repository. So as Claudia suggested me several times, uh, I think it's really time today, let's say we launch the mailing list and organize, let's say the first meeting on this uh, on this project and have everyone working together, let's say for the, the ideas. Uh, tomorrow, I will give a presentation on how we have implemented some parts of OXA in our solution to illustrate how it can be used, let's say to create um, a HexDR backend and promote inter interoperability and vendor agnosticity. So that's up for me. Thank you, Duncan. Thank you. With that, I will uh, stop that timer, restart it, and Duncan, the timekeeper, will yell at Duncan the speaker to stay in time on the next one. Uh, so next topic is the software build materials, which I will be talking on. Uh, hopefully, many of you are already aware of it, but if you aren't, I highly suggest you go to the website ntia.gov slash sbomb and or um, the website sysa.gov slash spot work has been doing a lot of work in this area. But again, software build materials, the analogy used all modeling, you know, we talked a lot about modeling earlier. All models are wrong, some are useful. Uh, the uh, model is usually used for the analogy, it's usually used for software uh, build materials. It's in ingredients. So we don't actually know what's in our software. We did not know as much as we now know once we start uh, using S bombs and um, we go into it. Tail. Um, sure, everyone's seen this XKCD. Um, uh, it's actually fairly old now um, about how the internet is supported. Um, you know, by all send on a lot of volunteers, um, and there's a lot under the hood that people don't realize. Most people operate up in those very little tiny boxes up at the top, not realize how much software is underneath it. Hackers do realize that. Um, one of the famous exploits of recent was Log4j, which uh, it just found a bug that was already there um, and took advantage of it. It happened to be a very widespread one. Another very famous hack, um, they not only took advantage of, of um, a bug, they took advantage of an entire system. They actually took over a build chain so that they could then use their, um, they could get their malware to more people. Now, again, it was in a particular uh, distribution model, so it didn't affect the whole internet, only affected a part of it. But for those of you who've been following the news, you know about the XZ hack, which occurred a weekend or so ago, well, it actually occurred back in 2021. Some people are actually saying 2019, um, where threat actors basically built up trust in the open, open um, software community um, and basically took over for that guy in Nebraska and uh, took over the system that it was very widespread throughout the system. Um, and I think this one will have more repercussions in the long run because although it got caught early, it uncovered attack methodology that all said none, there's probably a lot more of those going out there that we don't know about. Um, so all said none, you should understand what all these blocks you have that are, which is why we have this quiz called Dropbox Quiz, how you back the blocks. <laughs> um, so again, who cares? All right, show me the money. Why, why is why is all that matter? Um, this particular chart was developed in a CISO working group with industry um, on how to get industry, general industry, not some security industries. Uh, attention on uh, hey, you should be paying more attention to software supply chain. So, why is bombs and why now is a document being prepared to be given to boards, either to be given sort of to boards from an outside source to say to the board, hey, why, why, what are you doing in this area? Or for boards to give to basically the management team to basically do the oversight of, hey, what are we doing in this area? So, why do we care now? It's because, you know, we're in a worse place than we were. People are taking advantage of basically all those software quality issues. Um, there are new SEC rules for publicly traded companies. Um, there are new government regulations, for example, in the FDA on medical devices. Um, there's increasing for particularly publicly traded companies, but for basically all companies, there's increased uh, awareness of the problem. And for example, investors now care whether you're caring about this stuff. For everybody involved in the federal business space, or anywhere in the supply chain of the federal um, uh, 
U.S. government. Um, Executive Order 14028 came out in May over a year ago. Um, it basically is telling the federal government, hey, we need to get our act together in this area. Um, I, the executive branch, can only tell the government what to do. But what I can tell the government what to do is don't buy stuff that doesn't have stuff in it. So the federal acquisition requisitions are now being changed. And what's interesting about it is normally that only affects federal business. But since this is a supply chain issue, it affects not only the people who sell to the government, but the people who sell to the people who sell to the government, the people who sell to the people, the people. So even if you're one of those you know, very little blocks up at the, uh, down at the bottom, you're still eventually going to hit the government at some point. So it's probably everyone. Um, there's increased risk to the board of directors on the board of directors. They're now being held more accountable. People have went to jail over it. There's been losses, okay? And then sort of the, I would call the real driver for all this is, when I started this business, you hacked my, you know, we played around, we hacked each other's computers. What's the big deal? Somebody hacks my computer right now, they put some, you know, slash screen up or which makes it look stupid, who cares? Sort of evolved into, all right, now there's financial risk. There's actually big money involved. People are, are stealing a lot of money. Again, there's metrics that it's sort of just, well, all right, you spend as much as we so we'll try and cover it. The bank's been, been doing this very well for a while. Um, where the issue really is now is everything's becoming software and internet based. Everything's becoming software based, everything's connecting the internet, which means there's a lot of cyber physical risk. Um, I know how to hack Facebook. I thought how to do that years ago. Um, they can kill people. Um, I happen to sleep on a VPOM machine that means somebody can hack it in and stop it reading. Okay, unfortunately, that's happening more and more. And so, sort of, everybody has to worry about this. And there's never enough time for all these things. So, thank you for yours. And I will move on. Go a little over. I didn't kill myself at the right time. <laughs> so, I'm still in time. So, and with that, we will head it, hand it off to Omar and Justin. So my name is Omar Santos, I'm the chair of CISA. With me, I have Justin Murphy. Uh, he's actually going to go over CISA, but we're going to be back with another effort called Open EOX. So let's get started. Thanks, Thanks Omar. Omar. Yeah, yeah just, just for continuity purposes, I'm actually going to be doing a demo on CISA FX tomorrow. So uh, even though we're co-chairs for Open EOX together, Omar is the, the standalone chair for CISA. Made sense for me to do this. Uh, as a Murphy and a federal employee, I took offense to Duncan's <laughs> use cases earlier. But. Uh, so CSAP, uh, Common Security Advisory Framework, uh, really it was built the notion that we should have a standardized machine readable way of uh, communicating security advisories, vulnerability information. Uh, it's built with automation in mind. Uh, the standard uh, not only specifies how to create CSAP documents, but also it uh, uh, gives information on how to discover those documents and distribute those documents. Uh, there's a standardized tool set that helps you do those things. And all, if not most, uh, definitely most are, are available, and you're going to see one of those tomorrow during the demo. Uh, if you're familiar with CDRF, uh, CSAP is the successor. Um, it allows for, you just heard Duncan talk about SBOM. It, it allows for linking to SBOM data and supports both of the two most popular uh, SBOM formats, SPX and CycloneDX. And there's also one of the implementations of VEX, uh, which that will be what the demo is for, what I'm here to talk about as well today. Uh, it, there are four implementations of VEX, CSAP, OpenVEX, CycloneDX, SPX, but we're here to talk about CSAP. Uh, CISA, we care about both CSAP and, and VEX. Uh, if you miss it, in the fall of 2022, our executive assistant director of cybersecurity, Eric Goldstein, published a blog post highlighting that we believe adoption of both VEX and CSAP is going to help uh, evolve the vulnerability management landscape, uh, especially from the standpoint of understanding your organization's risk with adoption of VEX and then introducing greater automation into the uh, ecosystem with the adoption of CSAP uh, for producing machine readable security advisories and VEX documents. You've heard me mention VEX several times. If you're unfamiliar, 
the vulnerability exploitability exchange, came out of the ASPOM work that started in NKA has now moved over to CISA. Uh, if you're unfamiliar, uh, basically it's the notion that for lack of a better way of putting it, SBOM has a limitation in the sense that it's going to tell you where you're potentially vulnerable. You need a list of software, the ingredients list. Uh, if those components are vulnerable, really valuable information. But when it comes to security teams, what they really want to know is do I have to do something about it? So VEX lets you know if you are affected by a vulnerability. Uh, maybe just as importantly, if not more importantly, am I not affected by a vulnerability? Uh, like I said, it comes out of SBOM work. Uh, it works with SBOM uh, in a complementary way, but it also can stand alone independently. Uh, it was defined with the notion of one vulnerability, one status, or one more components. Uh, and it is machine readable. Um, one thing about VEX, you know, that's why there's a lot of use cases. VEX really speaks to vulnerability management use cases in that community. And that's why it ties into CSAP, actually. Current state of CSAP, uh, a lot of work adoption is, is going well. A lot of organizations we're seeing uh, and government agencies are adopting CSAP. So this became a CSAP trusted provider in September uh, last year. Uh, we have other vendors like Cisco, uh, where Omo works, and, and Oracle, and Siemens, and China Electric. Uh, we have other government agencies, BSI, uh, National Cybersecurity, and the Netherlands announced they're publishing CSAP. We saw at BolonCon a couple weeks ago that NISA is going to be supporting CSAP. Uh, we are working on enhancements. The TC is currently uh, discussing and voting on enhancements for the next version, version 2.1. Yep. That's perfect, because uh, that's some of the things that are coming. Uh, for version 2.1, uh, support for other standards like CBSS version 4, TLP version 2, which I think was released like a month after it released version 2. So I'll see that. Uh, and you can see all the work items that we're discussing. You can contribute that to that discussion on the GitHub repository. Uh, and that's my time. I'm going to hand it over to Omar to discuss EOS. Awesome. I'm going to try to actually move away from any speaker. There were some audio issues and I saw popping up in the, in the Zoom. So really, really quick, we're in the age of AI and you know, all this movement of advanced technologies and emerging technologies actually moving so fast, but yet we don't have a standard way of knowing whether something is not supported or not like, especially open source, especially AI models that we're actually using. So if you go back in time a year ago, uh, we were discussing among actually it was in the third meeting at RSA exactly a year ago. We were discussing we have S bombs, we have VEX, we have you know, many different efforts actually fueling you know our cybersecurity ecosystem. But one of the major things that we don't have is that ability programmatically to actually determine that and specifically the taxonomy across vendors, ecosystems, and everything, right? So um, that's where OpenUX, the conversation actually started. Um, then we very, very quickly assemble a few uh, companies and uh, organizations like CISA, BSI, and so on. And we launched OpenUX in Oasis back in November. So fast forward a couple of more months, you know, the idea here is actually for you to be able to have a few things, a lightweight schema. Not reinventing the wheel, but just having a lightweight schema that then be used, whether it's an S bomb, in a VEX document, or standalone. Right? So, so if you have an S bomb, of course, you want at least the very minimum information of is this thing supported? If I have a VEX uh, document or a security advisory and I'm publishing vulnerability information, is this product? Still supported, even though it's more than one or not, and of course, you know, remediation is actually taking care of the system. Or stand alone, you know, if you have an ecosystem that you want to actually bring some um, uh, tools through APIs to actually obtain this information, of course, is in there. So I do have a call to action. Of course, we just launched uh, this. Please get engaged. There's a lot of conversation right now, especially. A lot of work in the taxonomy, the schemas, it's already proposed schemas for the use, and uh, we definitely need your participation. So, with that, I'll pass it to, to Duncan. Yeah, yeah just, just want to also add, like, my, my colleague, uh, Dr. Alan Friedman, will be at Open Source Summit North America next week talking about his life and support, and Sosa's work on that, where he's going to highlight some of the open AI work as well. So, if you're going to be out in Seattle next week, check that out.
Thank you. Next so up is me again. As you can tell, I'm sort of the default. Like there's no one else to talk on topic. I get to be one speaking on it. Um, but I am actually very involved in PACE. Let me start my timer on myself so we know myself again. Um, so PACE, posture, attribute, collection, and evaluation. Um, so we've talked a lot about making use of the security data. Well, what what are the, what is this data? This data is security attributes, and PACE is a way to exchange information about the, uh, the attributes and what you've concluded from them, what to do about it. So we talked about, and we just recently talked about end of life um, as a parameter. Uh, before that, we talked about SBOM. We talked about BEXs, which tell you about your, vulnerability, your ex the exploitability of the vulnerability. So if you combine the SBOM with the BEX data, you get a more enriched data set than, um, than without it. Um, and so you know, combine it with an actual vulnerability database, you know, with the SBOM and say, hey, I know I have this particular bug, and you combine it with the BEX and say, yeah, but they've taken care of it already. That sort of information uh, all goes into your security posture. And PACE is a way to share information about that security posture. <laughs> so there's the three components. You have to get the attributes. You have to store the attributes. And you have to analyze the attributes. So these three can operate independently uh, or can all be part of the system. <clears throat> One of the sessions tomorrow will actually look at from an SBOM and BEX and evaluation of your software supply chain, PACE systems that do that, several commercial vendors that are in this space. Uh, I'm just going to be real quick on this one to get to us pretty much back on track. With that, next up is going to be a virtual session. So, Ian, over to you. Hi, can you hear me? We, we can, can, thank you. Great. Uh, I'm Ian Craggs. I'm the co chair of uh, subcommittee of the MQTD TC, working on MQTD SN, which we'll discuss a bit later. MQTT is a protocol which aims to make it easy to, co to connect industrial devices and others to the central IT systems. So it was working in the realms of IoT before it was called IoT. It's uh, intended to be easy to implement and use a very small bandwidth uh, and uh, low code overhead. So um, it's uh, intended to be very efficient. Next slide, please. It, around the time it was invented, it used to be that industrial devices all spoke their own particular or separate language and protocol. So it was difficult to integrate all of these different devices. MQTD was intended to solve this problem. Uh, in addition, most of the protocols involved polling from the central servers to the each of those devices. This meant that the central server had to uh, query those devices on a regular basis to see whether the data had changed. And this led to uh, very quickly to overloading of the central servers. Uh, MQTT enabled the devices to send the data only when it's changed. So this means that the solutions are a lot more efficient than they were when the, the polling implementations were prevalent. It uses TCP IP underneath for reliability. So when the inventors of the protocol were discussing how to achieve the goals of reliability and error correction and the like, that they realized that TCP IP did all of this for them. And so they use TCP underlying it. It's intended to be easy to implement by any device vendor. And the original goal was that device vendors would incorporate MQTT in their devices so there would be native support. That's been uh, slow to get off the ground, I think it's fair to say, but it's something that we're seeing increasing adoption of. Uh, we do have occasional requests for or inquiries about updates to MQTT, but because industrial devices uh, are intended to be a, around for a long time or might be installed in inaccessible places, then the stability of the standard is a, is a key aspect. So I think the, the majority of the community value stability over lots of changes. Uh, 
Uh, next slide, please. But one of the things that we are working on is to expand the reach of MQTC beyond TCP IP. So the two standards we've got at the moment that are published previously, 3.1.1 and 5.0, both use TCP IP. Uh, we're working on a new standard called MQTTSN, which is to uh, uh, the aim of which is to allow MQTT style solutions to uh, reach out to non TCP networks like UDP, mesh networks, those sorts of things. That brings us interesting security uh, problems because MQTT relies on the TLS implementations over TCP IP. DTLS is its equivalent for UDP, but apart from being difficult to implement, it's often turned out to be too heavyweight for the solutions that uh, people want to use. So we are proposing a per packet lightweight encryption and authentication mechanism in MQTT SN. Uh, and we're very interested once we get to a public review draft for a wider uh, look and review of that proposal to see whether it's going okay. to be really useful to people. So MQTT SN is a bit of a departure from previous MQTT versions, but there's uh, definitely a family outlook because one of the goals of MQTT SN is to make it easy to interoperate with MQTT uh, through gateways to translate from the UDP world to the TCP IP, TCP IP world, for, for instance. And we also, there are some other MQTT based standards that we're keen to sort of uh, work with and enhance the fam family view of. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is just a summary of the timeline that we've got, or we've had MQTT 3.1.1 was published in 2014, MQTT 5 in 2019, and we're hoping that soon, uh, later this year, we'll have our first public review draft of MQTT SN. So we'll hope we'll get as many eyes on that as we can. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Up. And the last talk in the sprint uh, before lunchtime um, is uh, a very new effort, um, so new that nobody knows about it. In fact, we can't even agree on the name of it yet. Um, it's a new TC in the process of being formed that at least one proposed name is supply chain information modeling. Uh, and another proposed name is the open supply chain information model. Uh, but again, we're, the attempt here is to standardize um, and the information model of supply chains, particularly with a focus on software supply chains with SBOM, VEXs, and the various other things we've been talking, talking about today. Um, why supply chains? Well, the hacks that we were talking about earlier, those were all supply chain hacks. Um, they, they need more work. And, and everyone says, but wait, we've already given you an alphabet soup of, of standards that we're doing already today. So is this a case of yet another XKCE cartoon of, hey, don't we already have 14 standards and a bunch of conflicting in this area? And the answer is actually no. There are no information model standards in this area. There are lots of data model standards. So sort of a key aspect of is, is we're, we're not, when we say you have an SBOM, many people will say, well, is it in, you know, SBDX or is it in Cyclone DX or do you have it in an Excel spreadsheet or do you have it with SWIT tags? Um, all of which are valid answers. And yet I can still say, yeah, but they're all SBOMs. Well, well, how do I know they're all SBOMs? And that's because I'm thinking at the information layer, not at the data layer. The data layer is the details of how to implement it. We want to get at the sort of the core of it, the root information. And to our knowledge, there are no information models in that area. And so that's why we're focusing there. <laughs> so got a bunch of inter very interested parties in doing it. We're in the process of forming this as a new OASIS technical committee. Uh, once we agree on the name, the charter is mostly agreed to from the words of the charter. We still got a couple minutes to work out, but once we get the name out, probably it's actually out for comment now. Uh, it'll probably be forming in the very near future. With that, we will turn it over to, um, so the next on the agenda is lunch. For the people on the uh, call, uh, we will be going to lunch and reconvening at 1.30. But before we go to lunch, uh, we want to hear a few words from our lunch sponsor, uh, and then we'll go. So Jason, you're up. Did you know you're up? <laughs> <laughs> we, of course, want to say thank you to Cyware for sponsoring lunch, but give them a chance to speak for themselves. <laughs> Sure. Uh, thanks, Duncan. I, I, uh, 
wasn't planning on taking any time for lunch. Uh, we have some time uh, to demonstrate things on Friday, and that's when we'll be taking most of our time. But thank you all for being here. Uh, we're very pleased to support this event and uh, provide lunch the next few days. Um, you know, with my my take my cyber hat, my OCA hat on, um, I'm super excited to be at this event. Meet a lot of people face to face in person. A lot of great presentations this morning. I'm learning some things myself, which is fantastic. Um, and you know, I I'm super passionate about this. You know, everything that was discussed this morning about sharing open information with standards. Um, the talk, the talk about AI and machine learning on top of data resonated with me a lot because I've been saying for a long time that if you want to build AI and you want to build models, you have to model your data consistently in the same way. If you're going to go and actually do that, anybody who's actually tried to do machine learning knows that the, the biggest challenge is dealing with the dirty data. Yeah. So if we can actually get everyone speaking the same language with the same vocabulary, that dirty data problem starts to go away. And, every, and then we can finally start to realize the promise of all this theoretical generative AI, right? But until we're all speaking the same language, generative AI actually has a really hard time dealing with cybersecurity. So um, I won't hold you up anymore um, and uh, have fun. Thank you. Oh, Thank I you forgot so. to mention there's like, uh, yeah, we've got some tchotchkes there and stuff. If uh, you have any like uh, young children or granddaughters, it's a pretty cool little uh, squishy ball there you can bring over. Uh, so thank you to Cyware. Uh, for those on the call, again, we'll be shutting off the recording now, but leaving the Zoom open. Uh, and an expert in So that I'll, I'll continue the introduction. And then two years ago, uh, Present to us today. We still have it. Still have it. Yeah. All right, can you give it a shot now? We're hearing it. But it's coming from this machine. So you guys shut the speaker off as well as this. Um, just turn the volume down on the speaker. Yeah, it's it is. Change, 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 change. Yeah, and then the same. All right, hello. Hello. 
Close an off option there up above. Same as exposed. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, 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 hello. That seems so bad. What did you do? You did your speakers. <laughs> Can you speak again? Hello, hello, hello. With, with that <laughs> extended <laughs> introduction, Jans Osman from Franz Inc., an expert in graph technologies. Love to hear more about what you get to present to us. Uh, Matt, can you help again? Just to kind of swap this to displays. Yeah. No, no, this is yeah. The small screen. The tap the buttons are up here. Oh, okay. okay. And then display settings. And then. Duplicate size for Okay. All right, so this is an uh, rocky start. Um, so, as you clearly can see, I'm a psychologist, not a technologist, right? Um, but I've been working with, uh, with graphs for the last 35 years. I did my PhD in modeling car driver behavior, where I modeled a car driver driving in a simulated world and had assisted with about 2,000 rules right, to control all the psychological mechanisms to, to, to drive a car realistically and we verified that real human drivers. Um, and anyway, so I've always been in this field of, of, of AI. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so 20 years ago, I came to the US and I um, started working with a company called France Inc. I was doing a uh, common Lisp. Does anyone here still has done Lisp? Oh, amazing. Yeah, I knew it would be completely. <laughs> but uh, there's no business for Lisp compilers, right? So we needed to do something else. So we got into the business of a semantic a graph database. Um, and we've been doing that probably now for about 15 years. Um, <clears throat> and we have now a typical graph database company that also calls itself the knowledge graph company, basically meaning we help companies build applications on top of their uh, graph databases. And all graph database companies are knowledge graph companies um, help their customers integrate data, right? Every enterprise has literally thousands of silos, and it's also literally impossible to do analytics on top of that, so you want to integrate. At some point, you... Um, try master data management and everything else under the sun. And at some point, someone over 35 has seen every failure of big silos and say, you know what? Let's try the knowledge graph approach, right? And the core issue of making a knowledge graph is literally make it 10 to 100, sometimes a thousand times easier to deal with the combination of all data, right? And well, then you try the knowledge graph. And basically what we do is we, uh, we help companies build an ontology of all the important concepts in their domain. Or usually when we get there, now in the beginning, we had to help build people ontologies. Um, but now we've got to the point that when we get somewhere, there's usually already a group building an ontology, right? So then we help with building the mappings between input systems and target ontologies to get a knowledge graph. And so then at some point you have the knowledge graph, but it's just see that it's a static thing and you can do amazing queries with it. But I call it a little bit boring. It gets exciting if you start adding uh, an artificial intelligence to mix, right? So um, <clears throat> from the beginning, we had logic, like prolog, description logics, ontologies. Um, and then at some point, I'm going to talk about this about machine learning to do event prediction classification. And for the last two years, <clears throat> our world exploded because we got generative AI, right? And now every project we do has generative AI. And I'm going to talk mostly about that today, but 
a little bit about how we now talk about our systems. We now get into what we call neurosymbolic AI, or some people call it composite AI. And it's real, as Gardner talks about it, right? <laughs> so it's on the rise. <clears throat> Keep the mic closer here. Okay. okay. We'll do that. And the reason why people do it, and you guys talked about it today already, is you want to trust your data better, right? If you just have your data and AI, then each of the AIs that you can use, whether it's machine learning or LLM or logic, has flaws, right? And what you can do is use the strength of one AI to remedy the weaknesses of the other AI. So, and no one has solved it to do it completely automatic, but this is the game we're all playing now. How to make one AI make the other AI better. So this is one picture that I've just talked about already. Yeah, we started with ontologies, taxonomy, description logics, <clears throat> but description logics are horribly bad at dealing with time and, and space, temporal, temporality and steps, right? So we have a full product compiler for that. And then about 10 years ago, um, we got into the world of, of healthcare primarily first, later uh, aircraft maintenance. And we learned how to represent patients and aircraft and customers as a series of events. So everything I do in my work is about temporality kind of. Right? And so we started using recurrent neural networks to do event prediction and graph neural networks to do classification. And also cool stuff, stuff, but not as cool as uh, when we started using generative AI, right? So now we have all of this. <clears throat> and I give talks about the strengths and weaknesses of each of these systems. But let's not do it today. You guys all have kind of an idea, right? What is strong in these systems, what is weak in these systems? So let's keep it here. I'm not going to talk about it today. So now I'm here with my talk. And I'll talk a little bit about the uh, graphs and graph visualization. Uh, I show some examples of how to use an LLM with knowledge graphs. And then I, I did my discussion about neural small AI. And then if I have time, then I'll also talk about two examples where we use the mix of knowledge graph in the middle and then the other AIs around to do it in stuff. So, <clears throat> and I need an example. And so I'll give you a few of a small example of the knowledge graph we built for a group in uh, uh, San Francisco called the Noam Chomsky Project. Noam Chomsky, does everyone know Noam Chomsky? Right? Yeah. Hate by everyone on the left and the right. <laughs> <laughs> An incredibly interesting person. And he's deep in his 90s and they want to preserve all his work. Right? So we work with a group of volunteers. It's great and extensive taxonomy. Terms you explain Chomsky, and then they helped us get all the books and spread the books where some of them are still in paper form, right? And OCR and mark them up where the paragraph boundaries were and the titles. And we put this into um, a Lego graph, and then we worked with a company called Pool Party, as some of you might know, right? And we extracted all the important terms out of the books, and then we do semantic search. So let me show you that. So here's a tool called Graph. Um, it's a tool to, well, I'll, see, I'll show you what the tool does. It's a free tool if you want to play with it. And uh, it, it also actually works with micro to the startup, the Neptune, and also text. If you want to find out the space on the sparkle in advance. Let's open the database. Chomsky. Okay. Um, Usually, I have something to shift on. I'm wondering Okay. 
So we have all these books in there, like you know, for example, um, ask for all the types of objects in the in the in the, in the knowledge graph. So there will be there's interviews, books, and papers, right? So there's books here, there's interviews, where's the journalists, there's locations, questions, and all of that stuff. Let's say book. And I could take good media control and I can double click it. Let's see the content. By the way, it's RDF. So if I hit this button, you see the, all the underlying uh, RDF. But normally we show things by their label. But a better way to look at it is to just right click at the top and see that, for example, the book has a bunch of chapters. Right? And I I don't have much time. Let me do a pre built one. So, basic setup for media control of Nelson Mandela. So, here's a, here's a graph where we have a book. Book has a bunch of chapters. Chapters have paragraphs. Paragraphs then have a lot of properties, like they come from a book, from a chapter. They we have several kinds of summaries. This is pre LLM. We use Gensim and Spacey for that. Um, and then it has See sentiment score by the way, you know, some of these negative about almost anything, right? So we have an adjusted sentiment, sentiment score, just to know something. <laughs> and, then, and then we had the concepts that we extracted using tools like Pool Party, right? Anyway, and then for every word, we had um, correlations with other terms. So we now know that if, if Noam Chomsky talks about South Africa in this case, very likely we'll also talk about Nelson Mandela. That makes sense, right? So, and we can do interesting queries. So, uh, let me show you how we just can build queries. All right, so I select the part of the graph that interests me, and I put it into the graphical query screen, and say, I'll So here you see, I basically selected part of the graph. And now I can say, okay, from the media control, find all the related people and how I get to that particular related person, right? So, so I have all these intermediate nodes and I can say, convert the highlights to variable nodes. Now you won't believe it, but now I have a Sparkle query, right? So I can do this and say, I want to show you only 10 results. I run the query. It automatically writes a Sparkle for you, you get the results. And that's a beautiful graph, as long as you have a button to actually do the work for you. <laughs> and now you have uh, the whole media control and the shortest path to this particular person, right? Now, how did I? No, that's not going to be. But any questions about this? This part? And again, it's very easy in a knowledge graph to then find anything. You just Look for, say, media control. Okay, all the objects, there's something with media control in it. So I want the book, so I click here. That's what I'm probably then. There's a book here. And I could do, um, let's say, Nelson Mandela. Oh. Yeah. Use uh, expressions I can do that too. Anyway, you get my point, right? So it's very easy also to get kind of the starting point in there and then get going. And then again, just like I just before, see, okay, oh. okay, let's stop doing anything here. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna stop. Anyway, any questions about this so far? Yeah. If you ever applied this, it seems like it would be a good application for policy. So, uh, walking through policy and how it was derived across. Yeah, I have repeat a, the question because no one will. Oh, but the question is could you do this in policy? Yeah, actually, I have a demo. I, I, I don't want to go over demo, but I have one for FAA orders, right? So, FAA has this ICE, ICAJ, like international orders, and then our FAA turns it into. Policies and we took those policies and put them in the same structure, right? And then we just use the same technique. We've done it for legal documents and now doing it for depositions, right? Many, many different ways. But, uh, and almost everyone I talk now 
wants to use this approach, especially because I can now also talk to it. I can talk to this particular this knowledge graph. Let's see if I my system is still up and running. In case you want to see this right here, uh, let's see if it's still up and running. All right, my flow of meeting controls. Okay, I'll, I'll give it one try. <laughs> well, you're trying to go out on a port, you're, you're probably not allowed on this port. No, I, I'm using, should be The problem is on the network that I feed me and I don't do an SSH. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's all those security people we know. I, I hate them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's, that's, I'll, I'll, do it, I'll do it later with the uh, pictures on the screen, right? We're going to leave over here. Anyway, for my presentation, I left, I'm going to give you this presentation later, right? So, what I did is I, I left the progression of slides that. I left all the slides that I just showed you in here, so you can just uh, look at it in that way. So I'm just skipping. I showed you all of this, right? I do this. So now, how can, how can an LLM use a null? Uh, uh, sorry, how can a null graph use an LLM? Right? There's actually many ways you can do it. The first thing is, a knowledge graph can. Uh, sorry, a, a graph database can talk directly to an LLM. We embed a bunch of primitives into our Sparkle to talk to an LLM and get the cells back. Now, when you try to do this, um, you can't control exactly, well, does anyone know what function calling is? Right? So this open AI is this, this wonderful thing where you can force an LLM to come back with precisely size JSON according to a particular schema, so that is amazing. And certainly, all the open source and competitors are seeing that actually the, one of the most important things around LLM is that you can control the return objects, right? So, it's getting Mistral has it now, and uh, Gen, uh, Gemini is going to have it, right? So, anyway, the point is behind the, well, behind the scenes, when we from our Sparkle talk to an LLM, uh, we make sure we get structured responses that so then we fold it straight into the knowledge graph. And I'm going to show you this in a second. Um, but we can also uh, use an LLM and effect to start querying your own private document, right? So we incorporate an effect to store into our database. Everyone is working now with an effect to store here by now, right? But at least you know what about it. Okay, cool. All right. And so we can ask questions of our own documents. And uh, but we also now an LLM, a knowledge graph, an LLM driven chatbot stateful, right? So you can actually have a whole conversation with your own private documents. And finally, I'm not going to show too much, actually nothing about it, but our fields, so all the, well, both the relations there with people, but also the graph there with people are getting closer and closer to actually automatically generating queries, right? I mean, that's the holy grail. Within two or three years, we'll be totally there. Anyway, so let me give some examples. So, one primitive is we call LLM response, right? Uh, that the answer is hidden. It'll go in a second. And all of this, as you can say, uh, binds hello GPT as a response, right? You click on execute and it says, hello, how can I assist you today? Well, that looks pretty boring, right? You can do that everywhere. It's, but it's actually very powerful uh, because it can return lists. So I, I do this for this this morning. This is the most important types of threat actors in cybersecurity, right? I click execute and I get a list back, right? That I've seen in several slides since I met Ryan. I've been going a little bit deeper into this literature. And I'm guessing that it, it didn't leave out much here. Um, or 
what are the top 10 most frequent attacks by threat actors for a cybersecurity perspective? But it gives you all the, all the answers here. But again, still very simple, but you want to turn this into a graph, right? Well, let's go to the uh, list of US states, right? Look at this. Answers here. Um, but you can use response like you do in programming. You almost can put it back in the loop. So you can say, well, uh, list the US states, say, rather than tell them, right? And then name the capital of the state and return the city name only of the state, the population of the state, the square mile area, and what year was it made into union, the government, what is the most famous celebrity of the state. Right, and so now you have a program in the query language, right? And boom, you get the whole table back, right? And then if you want to, you make a state the core node, and the rest would be the properties of this. But this is a lot of work. After we did this, we realized that an LLM can also do this. You can just say, ask for table, right? And on the left hand side, you do the table headings, state, capital, population, area, based government, celebrity. And then you have make a table of US states as capitals, population, area, you admitted, current government, the most famous celebrity, and boom, you want to call, you get this table again. Um, but one of the things that after a while you start to realize is that an LLM is in itself a knowledge graph, right? So you can get graphs out of the LLM very easily. So here we said, list the US states, and then write the states that border this state as a border. And what this will do is it will give you all the states and the borders between the states, so how one state connects to the other. And then you can say, okay, give me all the borders that, and all the borders between an S and an O. I can get this. And if I turn the create visual query, then because of the spring layout in, that we use for our graphs, you literally get the shape of the United States <laughs> in the picture, just because of this, right? Well, sometimes it flips it around right or upside down right. <laughs> for, for, for better presentation effect. I, I showed this one, but it's always the shape, right? So if I kind of zoom in, I get this state, the United States, with the shape, right? And if I use my tree rendering, I get the even better. Now, if I ask, now, now I can ask the question, well, how many steps do I get from Maine to California, right? So you have to go through 11 states. If I ask an LLM, how many steps is it from uh, Maine to California? It says 14, right? So LLM is not entirely grafted in this yet. Probably we'll get there at some point, but not yet. Right? So, um, <clears throat> so now about RAG. So, uh, so everyone in this room knows about how a RAG works, right? Uh, we have one embedded in our knowledge graph, so I'm not going to explain how it works. But say, for Chomsky, right? So we, we, we could do amazing things with our Chomsky knowledge graph, but we couldn't talk to it, right? But now we can ask questions. So we can say, briefly explain what you mean by universal grammar, right? And it will give you the response. This universal grammar refers to the inherent ability of every human brain to learn language, blah, 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 blah. Um, and, but the cool thing is what it then will do, it will also give you the references back to the knowledge graph where the answer came from. Right? So basically, it says, well, I used this. So you know what happens, right? You ask the question, the question goes to OpenAI or another model, you can embed it the question, then you do a nearest neighbor, right, in your, in your own vector store. After some pre filtering, then you keep the top 10 answers. Oh, sorry, I have not explained this. So it says, ask my document, that is the primitive. Where the query was this here. The vector store we're using is this, so you can have in the same store multiple vector stores if you want to do this, right? And use the top 10 answers that you get and take any answer to that. This, this is a mistake when I made a copy because usually it's set to 4.75. Anyway, and then here you get a part of the answer that we found in this particular citation. But this is, you asked a question about policies, right? If you, so if you work with the Database, you have two strategies, or you turn your documents into a graph tree, right? Or you just do um, syntactic splitting, right? I, I, I used to say dumb splitting, but I now call it syntactic splitting. 
sounds better, right? Here we go on two hundred lines, you know, on a twenty percent overlap, and right. But um, uh, anyway, so but if you do the intelligence splitting, then you can point back exactly to the policy paragraphs where you found events. That's a very important thing here. The other reason why effective store works so well, or why effective store and knowledge graph have to work together, right? Because there's so much pre-filtering you sometimes want to do. Say you have a thousand policies now, right? You ask a question, that question will vibrate with too many other documents that are not pertaining to what you have, right? So again, everyone nowadays is about red chunking strategies, right? I mean, you might take the paragraphs, but then in the fact the story, also take the whole chapter around, sometimes even the whole document. <coughs> because otherwise you, but you just get answers that don't pertain to the particular policy that you were asking for. Does that make sense what I'm saying here? Yeah. All right. Anyway, so with the knowledge graph, you, you have, you don't have to, so if you say you chroma DB, right? Great, great effective store. Okay. Once you set your filters, you have to change the filters again. You have to rebuild chroma without the filters, right? But if you put it in a knowledge graph, you have the entire wealth of the graph at your disposal to first do pre filtering. And then maybe you do some after filtering or more stuff which answers this sort of citation where the answers came from. Anyway, so this is asked by documents. And then the other thing is we also have this chatbot now in there. Really, really sad that I can't do a live demo. It's really fun in the audience to ask people questions from the chat, right? The answers back is the oh and, and then so what did I ask? I asked something. Oh, okay. I asked here, what are the main causes of poverty, right? And I got this answer back. And I'm in German, I said, Flowers. I don't believe that, right? And that's the other cool thing, right? You can ask in any language that you're capable of, and it will actually still give the answer. Sometimes in the language, then. But, um, and then in Dutch, the, the next question, like, I didn't believe he tries to explain why it's the case. Said, okay, you're, you're right in Dutch. Thank you. Anyway, and then you say, and what did we recently talk about in this interaction? And he said, we recently discussed the main cause of poverty, poverty, and I also noted probably both the cause and effect effects. Anyway, it will remember the whole thread. So basically, this is the model that we have for the knowledge graph to store the LLM based chatbot that we have an expertise vector store. So we're doing this now for clinical trials. Right? What could be? We're working with a psychiatrist with 30 years of experience, who's a prolific writer. He wrote hundreds and hundreds of interaction, made up interaction between him and his clients in the style that he thinks is the best in the world, obviously. Right? And he wanted to build a chatbot, but based on his style of expertise. Right? So that's another way. We do this, um, but in this case, it was Chomsky with all his knowledge, right? So that's the expertise that you need for the prompt. But we then also have a long term memory. Psychiatrists, we have every session that you had over time, right? or a very long conversation, and the long conversation also goes into the vector store, right? And then, of course, you have the current feed, and all these three sources go into the prompt, and then you get your answer back, and then every prompt and answer goes also back to the vector store. So you get a, a real, now, actually, this is exactly what, say, ChatGPT already does, right? It keeps a track of the session. But unfortunately, you can't do it on, if you have a thousand documents of your own, right? Unless you trained the whole uh, system on your documents. Does it make sense what I'm showing you here? And of course, everything is in the knowledge graph, right? Um, okay, so now what, how much more time do I have? You have uh, 12 minutes. Oh, easy. But, including questions if you want questions. But the next speaker is in 12 minutes. Okay. Um, so, two examples where we use this neuro symbolic approach where we do this mix, right, of machine learning, elements, and logic, right, all around the world. So, one of them um, is we worked. The big call center in Atlanta, 1500, what they call BDRs, salespeople that have a college degree, right? Not the script people. 
Um, and they were basically selling products for the big logos that you see here. So pre-LLM, we would build in three days time taxonomies for each of these companies. And this is a campaign of say six weeks, right? And we would analyze every phone conversation between the agent and the customer, and we would extract about 20 insights out of these conversations, like did the agent or the customer talk about budget, or about authority to make a decision, or a timeline, or a need, and things important to salespeople, right? And But also what products were mentioned, competitive products were mentioned, um, and where there are objections. But it was kind of pre and a little bit primitive. But still, Accenture bought this company, um, partly because the, 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 the advanced stuff they did with conversations. And I gave a talk with the, my, my clients at the, this conference, the Knowledge Graph Conference in, in uh, New York. And then Accenture um, took the whole project over to build their own version. And so we said, okay, you know what? Then we're going to make a 100% LLM version of this. So what we now do is we have. <laughs> We have conversations between agents and customers, right? They go into a, a database of call recordings, and then we have speech to text conversion from first 14 languages. We still use taxonomies, even in the day of LLM, because I have been working with speech technology for 30 years, and I can't believe how good it's gotten, and I never write a text. I always talk to my text, but names of people, names of products, names of companies still sucks. It's horrible, right? So you need to train speech recognizers. So we've done this for various speech systems. And then the big fun starts. We, uh, we start asking 50 questions of any conversation. Like, uh, did this agent show that he knew the, 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 the industry, right? Uh, did the agent build up an emotional connection with the customer? Now, it's one of the most important things to build up an emotional connection with your customers. But how do you put this in the taxonomy? You have to write, God knows how many rules, right? To kind of use old fashioned NLP to extract it. But in an LLM, you just give some examples of what it means to have an emotional connection, and they will figure it out. It will get way better. And by the way, if it gets it wrong, who cares, right? Because this is big numbers. And if you do LLM stuff, anyway, that's that's great about this. Anyway, so we get all, we get all this these insights out of the conversations. And then um, we work with Salesforce and others with Salesforce. Salesforce has this thing of sales cycle. Right? You start with finding a prospect, and then you try to find a project together, then you negotiate, and then finally you win or you lose the contract, right? And we take the input, the output of, of the LLM, some of the data, and have a machine learning model trained it on, okay, so what combination of insights in what part of the sales cycle will push the sales cycle forward, right? So basically now we know what works and what doesn't work in certain parts of the sales cycle. So basically what we then do is have the LLM write a recommendation for the agent about what to do better. And initially we thought that this was only for the sales managers to write letters to the, to, to the agent. But actually, the agents like it even better because all agents want, want to make more money, right? But by making more sales, they're completely commission based. So they want to know okay, what did they do well? What did they do bad? And we also give them the opportunity to tell whether they agree with it or not. And anyway, and then all of this is in the knowledge graph, obviously, right? How much more minutes do I have? Uh, eight. Oh, okay. So everything here is in this knowledge graph. We know literally everything about every sales agent, what they're good at, what they're not good at. As you can imagine, it's all in there. Right? And because we have it all in there, you can do advanced analytics again on the behavior in general. So this is something, this is a dashboard that you can give to the client that you're working for, right? Now they get a better idea. So for example, okay, I'm not going to do this, but this is about, okay, what kind of objections do people make when they talk about your product or the product of the competitor? Really hard to do with the LLM very simple. Um, and so this is all fits together. And then finally, another example. Um, so we've been working in healthcare for many years. We have a, a temporary uh, an entity event model for patients, where we look at patients both as a series of events or as a holistic graph. Um, we created a version that we 
can give to other hospitals now by taking out. So we did this with a big hospital in New York. We couldn't show to any other customer, so we took all the real data out of the knowledge graph and um, put in simulated data from my term, it's called Cynthia, or we used uh, Mimic, which is uh, 400,000 people that are willing to share all the hospital records that they had. Right? And we give it to hospitals, and this is the knowledge graph model where we have medical records that are harmonized with the biggest taxonomy on the planet called UMLS, right? Also linked up with uh, almost 500,000 clinical trials, right? Um, which you see here, this patient has acute pharyngitis, which is linked to SNOMED ontology in healthcare. And then clinical trials talk about that and um, literature, just these are literature things. This is adverse effects of uh, vaccinations, right? And they all link together to sore throats. But then we give my points and all this, all these different data sets link together in a knowledge graph. And then what we do is we can take the real data, so called the symbolic data, which comes from databases, right? And we can ask an algorithm to say we, we trained uh, a recurrent neural network uh, on, on event streams. And so now the, if I give a series of events to an RN, I can say, what is the chance that this person is going to have GERD, stomach disease, right? And I'll give an answer. But I can also give the same events to an LLM and ask, what is your, uh, what do you think is going to happen to this person, right? And I can even do it with logic. But for now, does it make sense, right? So I can have different AIs that are asking me, what's going to happen to this person? And the reason why an LLM is interesting is because it read, about 100 million articles in healthcare, right? No human being did that, as far as I know, right? But the LLM did it. And so, especially when it comes to rare diseases, LLM, and recurrent neural networks are not so good, LLMs are way better, right? But the traditional diseases, recurrent neural networks are better. But here's the point I wanted to make. So this is, I think this is a knowledge lab where you send events to a recurrent network and you get an inference back to, to an LLM, to logic, even to experiments with the doctor, right? And so now we get four different predictions. The question is who's right, right? So we need a meta agent. And again, I talked at the beginning about the game we're playing, right? How do you, how do you determine which one is better? Um, and so we came up with, for rare diseases, the RNN is better. For, for rare diseases, sorry, the LLM is better. For Regular diseases and RNN is better, but then doctors are pretty good too. Anyway, that, this is an entirely different. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, any questions? Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. My name is David Arndt. Technical advisor for the NIA, uh, contracted with WWC Global. On your Salesforce example, um, where you were generating feedback for salespeople, uh, do you have to have access to the information that the company may have used to verify whether or not their agents improved as a consequence of that input and to what extent did they? No, that's, that's what we need, but we're just doing because. We found out that so the tool was meant to be used by sales managers to give advice to their people, but agents like even better. <laughs> They're only driven by money. I mean, uh, there's the sales, if you know salespeople, I mean, it's about commission and it's a game almost. And any help you can get. So we, we only have anecdotal evidence that they, that they like it. All right, thank you, sir. Thank you. Questions around? No, not on computer. I can't tell if there's any on that. Well, so, not. All right. Well, thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> Thank you.
Okay, first I want to do a quick test uh, out there on the internet that people can hear me okay. Uh, there's some audio challenges. Is that microphone still on over there? The one on the back? We'll find out. It is off. All right, now I've got confirmation that folks can hear me. So, hello again. I know you guys might be getting tired of hearing me. I also noticed that I consistently am the speaker that keeps you from the bathroom. <laughs> so, over the next 40 minutes, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about our indicator of behavior project. But now I know myself, I know I kind of have a little bit of a, I have two modes of giving public speech, sleep inducing and preaching. I'm going to try to <laughs> find a happy medium between the two. That said, I do want to tell you guys that I'm going to give you an overview of the Indicator of Behavior Project. But really what I'm here to talk about today, I thought more in the spirit of this event, it's more about community and collaboration. So I said kind of earlier today, I really see the automation village from the CAS sub-project as a key way to show the value of having open standards and how we combine our multiple efforts. So my demonstrations today, today are going to be more focused on how I'm able to interact with all these amazing projects, even though I am not an expert in any of them. And I hope that that will help, you know, illustrate that how achievable this is. And another thing I've told people, I'm a cybersecurity researcher at Johns Hopkins Applied Business Lab. What you should take from that are a couple things. Hello. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yeah. Hi. Actually, uh, uh, actually, want to inquire regarding W two form. Uh, I have been graduated. In this channel, what do you want to know? Three. What? Say again. I'm not sure I understand the question. Or perhaps it wasn't intended. That might not have been intended for me. Okay. So anyhow, I was going to say a couple takeaways. One, I do not work at a hospital. I work at an uh, R&D lab in between DC and Baltimore. And I want to focus that I work in research and development. That means a big success for me is for all of you to look at the prototypes I'm going to show today and think, I can do that better than this again. And please do better than this again. I'm trying to show some reference implementations that help illustrate the ways that the ways that we are finding value in processing cyber threat intelligence in the hopes that our open source and industry uh, compatriots out there can incorporate these features and make something better for our overall community. That said, now we'll see if I can. I'm going to get a quick overview on the IOB project. There is much more on the IOB website and GitHub. And I'll have some links towards the end of this presentation where you can see a nice uh, YouTube demo of us putting the IOB in action. But I'm gonna also take us through the process of building an IOB around that Olympic destroyer scenario that we talked about earlier. And talk about how we share IOBs through six and taxi. And analyze it. Uh, we are using uh, Neo4j in this example. There are many good graphs. This happens to be the graph representation of this demo. And how we use that to extract things like Kestrel and stick shift or hunt elements and playbooks in the cal format. And then finally show how we're able to edit our IOBs using some of the other tools uh, today. First though, let me just explain again what the heck is an indicator of behavior? So y'all, I, I gave you my sermon earlier today about why we need something more 
usable in an indicator of compromise. Not saying these IOCs are not valuable, but they have a limit. And so we were looking at how to take the stick standard and create bundles of shareable knowledge. Because really, I think we've seen a lot today already on the value of representing our knowledge in graphs. And because for those that aren't really mathy people or don't think in graphs, what I'm getting towards is us humans, we don't just hold a bucket of individual pieces of knowledge in our race. We hold context and relationship between pieces of information. And computers need to be told that context. And graphs and machine readable graphs are a very effective way of doing that. But we need to give that to the machine in a standardized way. But we need to do more than just provide the data. As I was trying to say earlier today, we have hardworking operators everywhere. But too often we leave a lot of, we assume something that's easy for us, is easy for everyone. Let's kind of remove some of that mysticism and the type of data we share. Because I'm sure most of you in this audience today and out on the internet, plenty of, there are plenty of people out here who can read a 55 page detailed cyber threat intelligence report that references registry keys, references all these different minor attack elements goes into gives you new taxes, gives you a background on the versioning of the malware, and you can understand it all. And you walk and you start writing ways to detect things. There's a lot more people, myself included, that stink at it. I've got I've got super genius researchers who don't understand what a seam is, let alone how to write a seam query. I've got some of the greatest threat incident response people I've seen in my life who cannot write one line of Python, cannot write one line of C. And they're not in theory, no matter how much our own personal academic biases make us feel that way, when we might unconsciously, not I said I wouldn't preach, I'm sorry, unconsciously, <laughs> we convey that bias out to our communities. Or we assume so in the report, you should figure it out, not your student. I don't care if you think I'm stupid. I care that as a global society, we are held at risk by advanced cyber threat actors who are collaborating a heck of a lot better than we are. And we need to change that. I have one approach to help with it. And so not only do I want to share the observable behavior, and what do I mean by behavior? Because I hate to get this all the time. That's just a, you're just rephrasing attack patterns. Attack patterns are tactics and techniques. Attackers use procedures. We just too often like the TTPs is a long acronym and we just say, it's all TTPs. For any tactic and technique, I got dozens if not hundreds of ways to implement it. And we have super genius detention engineers writing these great individual queries for every single one, and we will never cover that space. So instead, let's try and let humans do what humans are good at and computers do what computers are good at. So instead, I want a series of repeatable observed behaviors that do not change from one campaign to the next, no matter how fancy of a hack some person invented. I'll put it really up. If you spear fish me, I will, I have sometimes have clicked on a link. I want to share a detection of every single time any computer clicks on a link. That is a stupid detection to put in front of a human being's eyes. 99.999% are going to be false positives and not something bad. I will not put that in front of a human's eyes. I want to share how to tell a computer to look for that, but not by itself. I'm going to share about five or six other things. And I want to share an automation workflow to correlate fields between those alerts. So like I said earlier, when the computer that has somebody click on a link 
have that link, download the macro, have that macro execute a, you know, a program. That program opened a command prompt. That command prompt edited the Windows registry for persistence. That machine that that happened on, at some, within some time frame after all of that occurring, began sending data to my domain controllers saying that it was now a domain controller when it is not, that then created a new account when that's not a place that accounts are supposed to be made from. And those new accounts began accessing logging into other computers. And those computers began transferring data across the network and maybe to a bunch of other places and possibly some machine was all the DNS 33,000 times in one day. I want a computer looking at all those individual things and constantly checking for correlations. And when it does see a low, medium, or high correlation of all that stuff, then wake up a human and say, hey, there's a pattern here. And I don't know what super thing, I don't care what registry you changed. I don't know what super exploit CVE got had, but I'm seeing this pattern. Like we look for symptoms. A trillion things give a person a fever. But we want it. Triage, and we have to triage at scale. Computers can do lots of things really fast, but no matter how cool it sounds, they're still stupid. And they'll continue to be stupid, but they're efficient and they're fast. And I want us to be able to share that type of data. The sermon's on. So, what does that really mean? So, we took this Olympic destroyer CTI over there. Again, thanks to everybody for me. First thing we did, we tracked those attack patterns. This is the subset. You'll guys will see the whole thing in just a moment. But we tracked those attack patterns out of the report. From there, we began identifying what are the repeatable behaviors that can be observed. From so, for example, a macro ran a command shell. The computer shut off its firewall. The computer was rebooted. Right. Well, that those can then be translated into detections, and we want detection objects that represent that, and a relationship that says this detects that behavior. For today's demo, we're using a uh, stick shifter, the IOB construct. We have a nice spec. We have a reference implementation with much more gory detail than we got time to get into today. But you can encode all sorts of detections. Stick shifter is very nice. Uh, because for those that might be familiar with them, or those who are familiar with other languages like Sigma, you can write a query once and translate it across multiple industry offerings. So the same rule can automatically be turned into a Splunk or an Elastic or a Q radar or a Sumo Logic or another scene. If I've left yours out of the list, it's not intentional, but you get the idea. And as I said, those detections have horrible false positive rates. I don't want a human looking at them. I want a computer to look at them and correlate data. So we have correlation workflows to share. Today's example, I'll show one with Hesher. You can do it in a lot of ways. But not just, but we also want to share not just that we found the problem. When I teach my students, one of the things I get across is intrusion detection systems are great. Burglar alarms are great, but they don't do anything about the attack. They tell you that it happened. So let's also share recommended courses of actions and let's take advantage of standards like Cacao and represent the playbook in a shareable format so people know what order of things to do. Because again, we're all super busy and sometimes the best practice, if it's not publicly known, isn't going to always be consistently executed. With all that said, combine that and utilize sticks because we have a nice standardized format here to package it all up and share that across our community. And with sticks, we can make sure that by adhering to the standard, we can start using the taxi uh, trusted automatic exchange of entity information or intelligence information uh, protocol. It's another standard for exchanging CTI. That opens up a large range of products to be able to read this data because I can't guarantee that everybody's going to have product XYZ. And it's the open standards. 
And from there, plug in some of the tools that I'll demonstrate in just a moment. One thing, uh, we do try to give back what we can. So my team at APL, as much as I love reading a 55,000 line JSON text file, as much as all of you, I know you love it. I intend to visualize stuff in graphs. We've used Neo4j in some of our prototypes. It's not meant as an endorsement of one graph platform over another, but because we were using that, we wrote a small little Python script that can convert any uh, 6, 2.1, or 2.0 bundle into that graph database. We make that available to the community for free through our account. And I'll be using that today in the demo. We also are working with some existing product projects on GitHub for some visual modelers. And I'll use that for a moment. Just, it's a nice graphical way to build some of these six bundles because often you either need to work your data case in a tip where you will be beholden to the data model inside of that tip. And this is not, not complaining about anybody's product. It's saying different products have ways they want to represent data, and they're not all 100% compliant with the six things. Not and it's a critique. People got businesses to run, and it's not any malicious contentious. That's the thing. I needed a way to edit the data that I knew it was always matching six, and I wanted a way to do it that didn't require programming. Because one of the biggest problems is we've thrown computer scientists at an analysis problem. And we, and I'm a mathematician, by the way, I'm not a math student. I had that one stupid math science class that math majors take. And so I'm really bad at programming. This is programming. Basically. I learned in C, but you know, they just stopped doing Pascal. <laughs> But my point being, you can't assume your analyst can code. And you can't assume your analyst is stupid because she or he can't code. Because I got no shortage of computer programmers that get really lousy analysis. So we wanted a graphical way to edit data. And I'm going to give you a quick little demo of that little thing. But as I mentioned to another person, I would love for those of you out there that build and our analyst tools to look at my little GUI here and say, Charlie, that thing stinks. I can do it 20 times better. Go do it better than me and get it out there to the community. If you host it on your own GitHub, I'll promote it. If you don't want to do that, sign the uh, contributor license agreement for OCA. You're, I'll accept your merge request on my repo and host it right there alongside everything else. Or just sell it, become super, super successful, and make me an obscure footnote in the apples of your All right. That said, let's actually do some demonstrations of playing with how this data gets passed around. If I will say that if you are interested in a demo strictly focused on how one builds an IOB, shares it, extracts those detections, loads it into a seam, and uses a SOAR platform, on the IOB project page for the Open Cybersecurity Alliance, I'll have the link at the end of this talk, I have a YouTube video showcasing that process. That was something that we went through uh, last year, at last year's automation village. But that's kind of the goal. We feed these things through and automation can pull these, and then we have more automation running those detections, and when they detect the threat, we're allowed to queue up automated response. Because I also, those of you that have worked with me in the past also know that security orchestration, automated defense is something I'm passionate about. I do think it's a key element of human machine teaming to be the speed and scale of cyber threat. But today, I'm going to demonstrate more about how embracing the open standards allows me to take advantage of all of your hard work and make myself look better. So, that said, first thing about sharing data is you have to be able to get it. You need the data. And IOB chose long ago to be focused heavily before there was an IOB, back when we were just experimenting with what would be some ways, other ways to represent this more generic kind of data. Ooh. <coughs> Testing? Okay. We knew that we wanted to comply with sticks. And in share sticks, taxi is a very useful thing. But 
if anybody out here uses a lot of different, you know, open tax clients, mileage has varied dramatically over the years. Again, I'm not going to I'm not going to name and shame any players, but I've had taxi servers that have edited my data midstream. I have. I'm not very happy with that. I've had taxi servers truncate my data all the time because I'm a big jerk that's extending sticks using the extensions. And you have to know that at a time or have a mechanism that can read that. I don't blame somebody, but it really stinks if I'm trying to share this with 10,000 people and 3,000 of them got what I sent and the rest just got like the meta, a couple chunks of metadata, they think I'm a moron. I might be a moron, but I'd like, I'd like to have them to have the proof. Well, again, our good friends here at Periton are hosting a taxi server. Again, not passing any like formal corporate endorsements here, but this is a tax server that's fairly compliant with the standard. It could read extensions and learn how to hold them. So just showing anybody that could log into has a client for this particular feed. It's not very, this part's not a very exciting part of the demo, but it's a very critical tool. The sharing infrastructure, I can run a query, and let's see if I can. All of a sudden, and I'll pull that up for a second because I just might not be able to see. But now these things start with an X, these objects whose identifiers begin with X, those are custom objects that we have made and shared the schema up in the taxi. And I'll show a little bit of what that looks like in a second. I know I've got 20 minutes, we're gonna get there. But just trying to get across the fact that there's a behavior object right there. But the behavior SD, six domain object or SDO by itself, not the most exciting thing on earth. It's again the relationships that it has to the detections and correlations. So here's one for secondary payload privilege escalation. Uh, behavior, a privilege escalation has occurred, which may indicate adversary activity. Think for this one, this was basically a process owned by a user created a process that was owned by the system. Which, spoiler alert, that's weird. Anyhow, by complying to six and having products that comply with taxi spec, I didn't know these guys at Paraton before a few days ago, but my data could not be shared out to them and anybody that connects into that product. I find that very powerful and very useful. Now, what am I going to do with it? So let's do a couple of things. First, I mentioned I like graphs, so I'm going to load that data into a graph. So hit the guy blue button with me, but this big ugly thing, this big ugly thing is that I would be six on And so I agree this could be a little bit better, but hey, it's our type. Give a name for it. I'm going to load it up locally. I'm taunting the demo gods by trying to authenticate. <laughs> and we're gonna see if we can make something happen. Oh! Like I said. Well. <laughs> Proves it's real. Exactly. We'll try one more time. My fat finger creds all day long. Yay! This part not super exciting, but it's reading through there and building out the graph. But rather than talk about that, let's show you the graph. So I'm just bringing up again. I like graphs. There are plenty of graph tools. This just happens to be the one I'm using today. We can. Take a lot of different ways with that. I just want to help demonstrate what we're seeing. So let me put this data on here. Start that. I'm going to do this for a cheap trick. Let's blow this out for a minute and show you the full model. And then we're going to make this picture make a little bit more sense. Okay. So at the moment, I got this big messy graph of stuff. 
blobs of data with different relationships. In the sake of time, I'm going to simplify what I'm showing. So one thing I share are those extension definitions, teaching other people what are my custom objects and what do they look like. For our discussion right now, let's find that. Also, I group data together. We don't need the grouping objects for this. I give attributions on things made by OCA. I also use the MITRE attack six uh, objects. So I like to cite that to MITRE since they need it. But I'm going to hide those identity objects. I'm going to hide a report. That should make things a little bit nicer. And I'll just change it to a higher layout. And now I've got a pretty nice pattern of data to look at. Where I can say, hey, I have a office macro executing commands that had a secondary payload, escalate privileges, that had passwords stolen with many cats. If you think back to that Olympic destroyer earlier this morning, this might sound a little familiar. I had data exfiltrated via a beacon, a Windows firewall disabled, logs deleted, and the system got rebooted. That's all this sequence of, of behavior. They tie to different MITRE attack elements, and each one also includes detections. And you're going to see a bunch of like gobbledygook here. That is a base 64 encoded detection rule. So this, I can make sure that formatting does things like tabs and spaces make, mean, mean something because we're crazy and we wrote YAML that way. But anyhow, we're going to show how we take advantage of that in just another second. But I have these detection rules. And I might want to correlate my alerts so I can embed playbooks. Here is where I embed a catch roll playbook, naturally. And I'll translate that in just a second so we can actually see the real thing. And once I've seen that, that could trigger a course of action to quarantine and remediate the affected systems. And here I've embedded a cacao playbook. So rather than just having the I leave button, Let's actually pull them out. So this is going to be the nerdiest thing I got today. But copy and paste. Quick, stupid magic trick. I don't have, I have two folders on my desktop. I'm going to run this command of basically querying the structure to find the things the playbook and decode the base 64. And I'm going to do something for the Cal playbook as well. Now I have two extra files on my desktop. Obviously, we want automation to do these steps. Now, this is the part where I can say, I, other people make me look cool. We're going to have some great demos of Kestrel and of Cal Roaster later. I'm just doing this to show you two things, well, three things. So first, let's load that catch roll book that just got shared. Upload it. And bam, Zhao Wei and his team came up with some really cool threat hunting procedures to search for all sorts of things tied to those behaviors I shared so that you could find the threat. I'm not going to go into deep detail because there's going to be a deep dive on that later in this but I didn't need to know Kestrel. I got that from Kestrel experts. And now I can share that with my community. And I can run these. Also, I wrote down the Cacao Roaster, great tool. Let's read the Cacao that I shared. This is where I really want to hit that power of community. So, okay. So I shared playbook of how to correlate data. And I shared this across the CAST community a little while ago. And the good people at Cal said, Charlie, it's a nice idea, but you did it wrong. This isn't the right way to, to write it. And they said, instead, do it this way. And said they showed me the proper way to do it. And now 
I, I can, can steal their homework if I can edit my model and just put this data back in there. That's where we kind of keep our little toy modeler problem. I'll import my, I import my model. Well, that's first thing sure. So I'm going to import my schemas. And if you'll bear with me, I'm just going to cheat for a moment and I'm going to give playbooks a icon so I can find them. And this normally would be a nice uh, graphical build your sticks object. Uh, to do a shameless plug, if you go on the OCA YouTube, I give a great demo of this capability in our previous indicator behavior uh, meeting. That's all important. But I do this so that now I can load up that shared bundle of data from this demo. And really, now yes, this should be laid out prettier, forgive me, but today I want to fix my quarantine and remediate playbook. So I'm just going here, I'll delete that. And I called it a cacao mod, but I got that great uh, updated cacao playbook from the cacao team. And so I'm just going to do a little <laughs> command line here. I want to encode it in base 64. And then I'm just going to send it to the uh, clipboard from my Mac. So that now I just go here, paste. That's done. And now I have a new JSON object that I could export this to a file. This is a new sticks bundle that's now been updated with community input. I did that in about 16 minutes from where we started. And I want to make sure I save us about you know, five to 10 minutes for Q&A. So this is how I took all of those things. I was able to quickly share data on a platform I had never used before, really I haven't used before yesterday afternoon. And then extract out a handbook that another team of geniuses made that now I can use, extract out a automated playbook, share it across the community, have experts improve it, and get it put back where I can now redistribute it across my community. And that's all due to the, these projects and teams embracing open interfaces, open standards, so that we can help each other rapidly. That is a demonstration. <laughs> For more information, again, so I have these links shared, the opensocialsecurityalliance.org slash IOB will give you a description of our project, help you find out how to join it. There is no cost for those that might not be familiar with the Open Cyber Security Alliance, Coalition of the Willing. Sign up, you can join our Slack channel, you can join our listserv, and you can tune into the uh, recurring meetings when we have them. Also, our GitHub page, I have multiple examples of indicators of behavior, very geeky technical documentation, some use cases that apply to NeoScript and all other uh, things for those that might be interested in taking advantage of what we're demonstrating. The one copy I'll give, the six modeler I just showed at the very end of my demo, that's a very nice project by a person by the name of Jason Menick. And as we're doing our release review, we will be sending it as a merge request to that project. I don't, I don't have full ownership of that one. But again, you have another tool you want to use for editing sticks, and that's great. Use it. I just, unfortunately, I need to pick one. So okay. that said, I thank you for your patience for tolerating me and my rants. I'm happy to answer any questions in the seven minutes we got. And then we can go to the bathroom. Mr. Kirsten. Thanks, Charlie. Um, just a question about IOB in general, perhaps. Um, just wondering, have, have you gotten any uh, feedback from like third party traction or like, okay, we're going to start producing these? And if 
if so or if not, like what do you think we need to do to try to encourage like the the, the folks that are producing it to help start leveraging this? I know it's maybe too early a question, but not to be not. It is not too early. I've been working on this for for many for several years now, and it's a very fair. One. The most common I get from third parties about creating it is so troubling. When is your team going to create the full taxonomy of all adversary behaviors for us to use? <laughs> I got five people, and the most the most heavily allocated one has a fifty percent work allocation on this research. So we won't be able to build the universe of all behaviors. We need participation. What I think will help the most. Uh, I'm not at liberty to go into great detail. But for some time, we've been working on getting several uh, operational pilots started. Uh, we, that's where we really saw back in the, those of you might know me from another project called IACD, those pilot piloting was how we really got a lot of adoption and advancement on a lot of the SOAR technology before SOAR was a thing. And that's what we're working to do here with these. We have a few partners across government and critical infrastructure that we're working with to do some of these where we publicly demonstrate, but I'm not allowed to really talk much on that. But if anybody else wants to pilot an indicator of behavior concept, it's free, and I'm always happy to talk and consult on it at no extra cost and let you guys uh, try it out if you want. But I think that we need to get people to do some of this in operations to show the value and the utility. But, but to be fair, fair one, one of the things going on is this conference is that's one, one of its intents to get this stuff out there for everybody. And we did move them all a little bit forward. And without this conference, we wouldn't have had the Olympic Charter data. So shipping away at it, crowdsourcing a little bit of time. Uh, and if we went to St. Patrick's uh, talk tomorrow, the hope is to try and get that more continuous. Uh, next question. So I was interested in the the behavior matching the computer rights. Right? Yes. And the, I mean, how the puzzles work, as you said before, you know, you get so many false positive signs, especially in the big enterprise. How, how do you keep it in balance? How do you keep the correlation of balance, or how do you keep the definition of behavior right? No, the, 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 the number of false positives. Oh, you don't. Oh, okay. The detection is always on a very high false positive. The correlation is where we apply the knowledge of threat activity to reduce the false positives to extremely low. So knowing what's going to be common between those behaviors or something that's bad, that's how we address false positives. The individual detections will always have large false positives. Combined ones don't have them. Yeah. And anyway, it's more just an algorithm, right? Can things be out of order or Yes, yes variables. it's not. It's not. Doesn't have to go in series. Okay. Um, it's a little, little in the weeds, messy. But basically, anytime any detection fires, any possible correlated detection is checked, and there are floating time windows for the different types of detections that are shared and defined in the correlation. Charlie, let me paraphrase this question and a question we just got on the web. Um, so. The thing that made the correlation, how, how did you decide what to correlate? I think was it the root of his question and the question I want to look That was actually humans, right? Yeah, that was humans. And that's what we're doing now is when we get to instead of very specific detections, we're looking at more generic behaviors. Now we're trying to take more of a kind of uh, medical triage approach on understanding what's the combination across those behaviors that's indicative of something bad. So humans, humans are still so useful. Sir Patrick. I'm already at and Hey, Charles. Hey, Thanks for all the work that your team has done at IACD and here. If you knew then what you know now, how would you maybe approach this, or what things would you like to come back and revisit? Well, there's a lot. So I'll try to... <laughs> Definitely... When we get plug out to like TACTC, I would have liked to have had a better ontology model to start with so that we could be more flexible and jump across more standards much more rapidly. Still an area of active research on our part. I also would love to have Crystal Ball to see the rise of generative AI's performance. 
because I do believe there's a, there is a role there on how to train them on those ontologies we were just hearing to help speed up the identification of the repeatable behaviors across massive data sets. And that's an area that I'm deeply interested in. And because I have a minute and you're all my hostage, another thing that I'm deeply interested in is an idea we've done called effects-based courses of action. Of learning how we teach AIs to understand the risk locally, not just a threat, but of our mitigations. Because when we deploy a mitigation, we have an impact on our own networks, our own mission, our own business rules. And there's never going to be a global set of those for every business because AT, what's going to break the bank for AT&T might do nothing to APL and vice versa. I'm just thinking on this path because that ran out of anybody else. <laughs> not that anything we did would impact anybody else. Exactly. I'm sure nothing would go wrong. <laughs> hey, this phone's not working. But uh, learning better incorporation of risk and using that to drive course of action selection at scale is an area that I'd love to see. Thank you all. I'm right at the moment. So thank you, Charlie. We'll be available. Um, you know, around if people have further questions, it is now time for a break. So people on the call uh, hang out for the next 10 minutes. We'll be back in 10 minutes. And for people in the room, if you do yes or you can correct yourself, we'll reconvene in 10 minutes. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for joining. Um, the second demo, demo in nothing. And uh, this demo is a collaboration between HI and IBM. And uh, um, we have two people from IBM here, and we have three people from HI remote. And all of us want to speak. And uh, um, before we start the session, this is a live demo we will do for Castro and OpenC2. I will give the special thank you to um, Mike and uh, Dave from Atlantic, who supports the uh, overseas to development and uh, uh, creation of our new uh, operator profile teams, which is a very great thing for the project to, for everyone here to see the demo today. So thank you, Mike and uh, Dave. And then uh, we will have just a, to, to get everyone aware, we will have a few slides, and uh, um, they from me time will talk a little bit high level on what we are doing. And then we will go into the demo. Uh, we're a few slides and go into the demo, and inside the demo, we will talk a little bit more. And after the demo, the demo may take 10 to 15 minutes. After the demo, we will spend more time explaining the details, what you see in the demo including the handbook, including the protocol playbook, and things and so on, and let you ask your questions, and we'll be more interactive at the time after the demo. Um, yeah, thanks. That's it. So, so, okay. I'm Dave Lemire from HII, and we wanted to give you an idea of the range of things that are addressed in this demonstration. So, um, you got introduced to Kestrel earlier during the standard sprint, and we're going to show off Kestrel hunting. And in this case, we're going to invoke Kestrel hunting using OpenC2. Um, one of the, the essence pieces of OpenC2 is the concept of actuator profiles that allow us to tailor the language to specific uses. So in this case, we have a threat hunting actuator profile. And we will be using commands that follow the rules of that profile in order to invoke Kestrel. We're going to take advantage of the Olympic Destroyer IOB data package that APL built together. Thanks, Charlie. So we will start off with hunting for behavior and then use that to uh, direct the, the process of the remaining hunting activities. Um, and then after the demo, we will show that we have a Overall process organization, which we captured in a cacao playbook, which was built using the cacao roaster. Um, under the hood, sticks and stick shifter are used here for data formats and transformation. And then, um, because we've got code running in multiple places, talking through a 
MQTT broker on the internet, all of this is cross geolocation as well as uh, cross organizational, as Chef Wei already mentioned. Um, there's a notional element that we will not actually be demonstrating, which is the what do you do once the hunt has given you a clear indication of what's going on, which is the idea then that OpenC2 and a different actuator profile for packet filtering could be used to block network traffic. Next slide. So this is our um, demonstration network topology. The upper half is real, the lower half is notional. Um, I'll start with the notional part because it's easy to work from there. So you would have organizational networks, they would have data monitoring tools on them that would generate data that would then be stored in um, uh, stores accessible to Kestrel. Um, in a real world scenario, of course, the data from each network would be different. In this demonstration scenario, we're using the IOB data because we want to make sure the demonstration finds something. Um, so in this case, the results will be the same from both of the two consumers that are running. So consumers here are in green. Uh, they are the things that receive OpenC2 commands and do something with them. Um, so we will be running a Kestrel, or excuse me, an OpenC2 consumer with the hunting actuator profile invoking Kestrel both on HII equipment and in the IBM cloud. Um, there's also an orchestrator that generates the OpenC2 commands that we will use to invoke hunting processes. Um, and that's also running at HII. And then we had envisioned when we structured this demo, uh, had it been available, we would have used Duncan's Twinkly Maha as a way of giving kind of a progress status indication. Um, so I guess that piece of it's notional as well. So what you'll see is the orchestrator sending commands to two separate consumers, each of which is talking to its own independent Kestrel instance, um, each of which is then looking at its own independent data store, but the data stores contain common data based on the IOB package. Um, next slide, please. And Michael will pick up here to give you kind of a discussion of the flow of this process as we as you'll see in the demo. Um, it looks at the um, focusing on the uh, the, uh, the, the sorry the, the TTP that's T one five one five six two. This is if you guys know the um, the taxonomy. This is on the impairing defenses at the end network. So in this case, is looking at blocking firewalls. Um, so we're searching for this indicator behavior, uh, and when we find it, we identify this is a suspicious process as well as the host machine that you know, is attributed to, and this information is returned to us. Um, this information is returned, and then from that information, we pass that on to a second playbook, which takes this information and, and tries to discover the ancestry of the process that uh, resulted in the denial of the um, sort of blocking that firewall. Um, so we look at the, the ancestry uh, for several levels, and we turn the set of processes back uh, to the, um, the command control, in this case, the orchestrator. And that information is then used to fed into the third uh, hunt book, which then discovers any siblings that are uh, associated with this uh, process to discover whether there's any other kind of threat, any other kind of manifestation of the infection. Um, and then returning that information as well back uh, to the And then the fourth hunt book, um, that information then passes the fourth hunt book. And this fourth hunt book is the last one. It's sort of interesting because it correlates multiple data sources. Um, it looks at the ER data to uncover, you know, what time frame network activity is happening, and then using that information to correlate with the actual netflow information that's collected at the firewall in the, the gateway, and using that information to then really figure out what the remote IP for the attacker really is. They, they're using, you know, they're, they're coming in from a gateway or coming from a, a proxy, and the only way to tell that is you have the first entrance into your network. So using this, this, you know, that's that's a way to highlight. The ability of using Kestrel to correlate different data sources in a one in a single one. 
Um, so chaining all these together, um, you see the demonstration, allows us to kind of uncover the, the target process as well as any siblings, any files of access, and we turn information back. Um, and right now, all these templates have been uh, implemented using a, temp a simple templating, so it's using Ninja. So it's a way to customize what information uh, is, is embedded into the hunts. Um, but we envision in the future maybe an demonstration. Um, the automation part of this can can use um, things like what's mentioned our um, AI to sort of help drive what is to be placed in these templates, so that you can customize the handbooks more effectively. But for this demonstration, it's just for you. Okay, so Matt is going to talk a little bit more in detail about the actual different steps that are going to happen when um, the hunts take place. Yes, good afternoon. So what is the, the general high-level process flow of OpenC2 invoking Kestrel? Um, what we have, we have four actors that are in play. Uh, we have an, orc an OpenC2 orchestrator, which is a producer, um, which could also be something like a Cacao playbook. But in our case for our demo, we're going to be using an orchestrator to be the producer. We're also using the MQTT broker version five, which is the messaging uh, fabric between the devices. And then we also have uh, two OpenC2 hunt consumers that take care of the uh, Kestrel interface. Um, one uh, consumer is located at the HII office. Uh, another one is inside the IBM cloud um, to kind of show the different geo locations um, where we can reach out. We also have um, data sources. We have elk stacks uh, that are loaded with the Olympic destroyer data and in the sticks format. Uh, that's the data that Kestrel will be um, querying against using stick shifter. So how does it kick off? Um, the, the general process is the producer and the consumer will subscribe to their respective topics. Um, once they're subscribed to their topics on the MQTT broker, now we're, we're ready to play. Um, from there, we can publish a threat hunting command using the orchestrator, which then is received by the consumers. Uh, they then uh, read the, the command, act on the, the threat hunt, uh, interact with Kestrel, which then uh, performs its query. Uh, which Michael was was describing it a bit, use uh, uses stick shifter to then uh, also query the elastic data, processes the data, and then drops it on a response topic, which the producer then consumes and displays on the screen. And basically, we're going to wash and repeat for each of the different hunts that we're going to show you today. Um, and this is kind of the, the, general, the general flow uh, that we would like to demonstrate. And that being said, I'll pass the baton over to Kevin and the team for the demonstration. Thank you very much, Matt. Here we have shown through Movie Magic a series of uh, demo pieces that we've alluded to, uh, both Dave and Zhao Kui. On the left, you have a reference implementation OpenC2 producer. Uh, this will orchestrate our commands. This is going to be where I'm going to be dropping in a series of OpenC2 commands in the Threat Hunting AP and sending them out into the wind over MQTT to the devices you see on the right there in various delightful terminal formats. Um, the, the dark mode, the light mode, the, the constant struggle. Um, uh, so once these commands are created, we're going to be uh, sending them off. You can watch as they get fired off on the left. You can watch as they get work done on the right. The, the tiny little text will scroll. It'll come back across. We'll see the messages show up. We can look at them, compare them if we want, see what output they get. And you can all watch, watch all that in real time as we discuss the pieces of that IOB-based hunt that we are, are going to be following through. So. Uh, as these commands are designed to trigger a Kessler hunt flow, and they are both associated with uh, hunts that were designed for outside orchestration, uh, we're not actually handing these 
tons of very specific pieces of data, we are handling them as if we were orchestrating them with cacao, with these ideas already in place, knowing what we're looking for, searching for specific pieces, specific IOBs, specific in, in those indicators for, in our case, something that is going to be disabling or modifying a system firewall. This first command you're going to see is going to be what gets everything started. This is not, in fact, a uh, Kestrel-based hunt, but an OpenC2 uh, introspection query, uh, using it, using this to get, cause the devices to look inside themselves for uh, interoperability information. Uh, this this is going to cause it to uh, return a list of hunt flow files that are stored in the various devices. So I'm going to hit this and send them out and see what we get back. Pretty quickly there, we've got our device here. Uh, it's going to pull up a, a response as well as the IBM Cloud one. If you look here, we've got an OPC2 format response, uh, SAS 200, a bunch of header information, uh, JSON, uh, and a number of different hunts. Uh, for no particular reason, absolutely none, I can't think of one at all, we're going to start with hunt one. <laughs> and from there, we're going to say, we've determined that the devices can perform the threat hunt we're looking for. In, in, in an actual scene, this could be something like Log4j, Solar Winds, named by TTP. Uh, semantics for exactly how that would be named would be a, a question for actual implementation. And we'd love there to be a vast library of these things that people argue about the nomenclature for. But for today, it's hunts one through four. Um, now, as Joe Quay spoke earlier, this is going to be for things that are modeling, firing, or disabling a firewall, returning a process that matches and hosts that they're acting on. So for that, we're going to come down to the, the, the next hunt. And we're going to use the investigate command defined in the threat hunting profile and fire off this hunt, with, which has IOB information baked into it by the Kestrel team, as uh, Char Charles Frick alluded to earlier. Uh, get this in the air, in the air, and we'll look for processes and net network traffic. Uh, now, in addition, once we once we get these back, and they'll they'll be coming in at different slightly different times, we're going to take a look and see what we've got in the ways of information about this threat. And we've got a SAS two hundred. Good to see. Good proper OpenC two formatting. This one's got a file name, and we've got this unique ID, a command line. This. This is a good sign. This is it's it's found something, and not only has it found something, it's found where it is. Great, great. We're not just looking around in the dark. Scroll back up, and well, it's not a demo if things don't take just a little bit longer to work on a an older laptop than they do for the IBM cloud. So um, while we're looking at this one, we can see this is six formatted. Um, the threat hunting AP has a conversion of sticks baked into its its Jaden that we can use for things like this when we're actually sending this out as commands and formatting response objects. We are looking forward to opportunities to have those who are people who are very familiar with this to take a look at it. And as Duncan says, it's uh, the, the best way to know that you're getting good work done is showing that it's in fact breaking. And. I've gotten word that there's a, there is there is in fact a response on the way from the additional device, um, but while we're looking at that, we can I I can have you stuck here longer to say that uh, for this instance uh, we've got Kevin, Kevin, can you hear me, yes Kevin? yes hey, while, while we wait can you narrow the screen on the left so we can see the, the people can see the things on the right that would be a fantastic idea. Yeah, this is just to, to show you the fact that there indeed are consumers running in the background uh, in different locations. And these are the, the consumer that are listening to the commands from orchestrator and uh, that's receiving uh, the commands live returning to you. 
Um, one of the machines, I guess, are running faster than the other one. That's why we have delay on the command coming back. But you know, in distributed systems, they can be funny sometimes. So. Okay. I'm pretty sure that we, with with the stuff, uh, at least with what Matt has going on, the the it is what I can see on here on both of these is that it's both correctly found that response and is sending them back. Correct, since that's got a that's got a big pile of sticks in there that it looks like you tried to send me. Is that correct, Matt? Yes, that is correct. Already, in which case I'm going to forge on ahead onto the addition, the next hunt. Uh, since this one is taking that information and since it's it's been created, it's been saved to the system. If this were, for example, with cacao, uh, we wouldn't be wanting to send back a, a all this this process information as the queue for what is next in cacao. Um, as we want to send it, we're very happy to see this result so that we can log that, so that our that the human in the loop, as we say, will be able to reference this. But in the instance that we wanted to have this all wrapped up with a bow beforehand, we we've we set it up such that it saves to a location and reads from that location. That way we can just run this seamlessly as a flow of playbooks. As such, as long as it's been created, which should be um, set, set up such that it can read that data, progress to the next step, and in the, our case, be looking for uh, ancestor processes of, of that hunt. Where, what, 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 is, what spawned this uh, when when at whoa net sh.exe kevin don't say the name of the thing otherwise they'll know that you've you've seen this before um but we're going to get that out here paste this into the bar this one's be taking those those locations where we have this saved off um this would probably depend on implementation but if we're saying this was a standardized thing is like hey save them here use these names create these files save your information to them. We get that out in the air. And then as we're going to uh, mention with this, well, we've got IBM Cloud back. Let's look at that one. Excellent. Our net sh has, uh, was created by a winword.exe, a very, uh, very, and not only WinWord EXE was affecting the IBM Cloud device uh, as we scroll past the wall of sticks. Very useful, very verbose. We're glad we've got all that information. And we can see that it's also affecting Matt's device. Oh no, darn, WinWord EXE has struck again. Um, we've got that same command line, uh, process ID, caught in 4K. Now on to what else would, could we want to know about this? Uh, let's say sibling processes. Is it trying to uh, start a multi-pronged attack? Is it trying to, in our case, uh, see what we can, what else we can glean from another hunt? This one using similarly to the the hunt, the third command, not the first two, contains hunt args. These ones are set up as strings for the purposes of easy use with something such as cacao. Uh, similarly, in a world where a different demo is being created, we would be happy to show off the the new sticks implementation, where we we slowly build out a sticks a sticks object. But uh, Duncan Duncan told us we couldn't have six hours uh, for Geneva Convention reasons. No one can let me talk for that long. And as we've let this take for just a little bit, we have a response from the IBM device. Two hundred. It's also got conhost.exe. Data. PowerShell is a binary. Conhost. PowerShell. Binary. And now all the way on to the last and in some cases, I think the most the most clear results hunt we've got here, uh, which really belies the fact that this is uh, one of the most complex ones that we've got going on. Uh, Zhao Kui made a Kestrel hunt that uh, checks multiple data sources. And I think he'll be very excited to tell you exactly why that is such a feat. But I, as, as it's been explained to me, I'm, I'm very excited to hear him say it again here. But this will check not only NetFlow data, but Sys data. And it will 
return us remote IP addresses and da 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 da. We got them. Properly formatted OpenC2 response, command and request ID. Uh, in our reference implementation, checkable by by color of the, the one is very fun as I can check the mats on this, this fun little maroon. Same value, same ID, same request ID, different, different created. And now this is not the finish line. We would need to stop this, but as Dave mentioned, uh, in dealing with things like this, it's well within the existing standardized OpenC2. The stateless packet filtering profile or other remediation and mitigation actions can be performed here. Today, we can kind of hand wave this saying we'll issue an uh, SLPF stateless packet filtering deny IP command, block this traffic, lock the affected systems down, and while the other actions are performed. Um, now, I, I'd like to hand this one back over to uh, Zhao Kui for a few more slides, explaining in depth these Kestrel hunts. Now that we've showed we can get them, what, what are we what are we doing to get this nicely formatted six data, and why are we doing it this way? For maybe a later discussion of the Cacao Playbook with Dave again. Thanks very much. Thank you, Kevin. That was great. Uh, just so to point out a few things, just to everyone, the audience hopefully is, is clear on is that this this really is a, a showing of a multi-organizational effort here. Um, so the, the, the white screen here is actually running at IBM Cloud. And we put it together on a single Google Meet um, you know, as a way to show everyone in a single screen. But we have to log in through Google Meet to show through Zoom so everyone can see a single, single thing class what's happening. But it's on three different servers. Like one is on IBM like, Cloud, one's on Mass Laptop, and orchestrated on an HI server somewhere, probably in a bare metal or a cloud. Um, okay, so now that we've uh, in the beginning, you know, hopefully um, telling you guys what we want to say and the demonstration is telling you what we want to say, now I'm here to remind you what we just said, right? So this, this whole thing started maybe a year and a half ago, at least there the, the, um, the effort to get the Castro AP going. It took a while. Um, we were able to come together and created that. Um, and then we took that AP and then um, through this uh, plug fest, we were able to come together and Using that AP to then create the Kestrel um, actuator for OC2, for OpenC2. Um, and the, the two teams were kind of independently able to use that standard to create our individual actuator. Um, but luckily, we didn't start from scratch. Um, the team created create this OIF framework, which we leveraged um, heavily. So if you're interested in creating an actuator or an orchestrator to kind of play with OpenC2 command to invoke Kestrel or other devices, Using the OIF framework will really accelerate the effort. So a lot of code base is already there. You don't have to go through a lot of the nuances of creating, you know, Python and all that stuff. It's all there. You create like, a little template to customize what exactly OpenC2 command to consume. Um, and it has the framework allows you to communicate through um, MQTT or SPS, whichever it is. And we use MQTT for the service, but those will just will use stuff. So those two AP framework come together allows us to kind of show off this demo. Um, and in the future, we're hoping to then um, utilize this sort of base point to then do something more sophisticated, like uh, do remediation uh, on top of that. So we should we show a different type of actuator. Content. Um, that summarizes, I think, uh, what we want to talk about today. I don't know, we have any a few minutes or are we still 15 minutes? Yeah. 15 minutes. Yeah, so we actually have more slides for you. We just want to make sure that you know things are flowing correctly. So I think um, the next one is going to be um, Shape will. Dive a little deeper for those who are interested in the, the how the hunt book operate themselves to see how we actually go through the hunt process and stuff. What data store are you using in the background? Uh, we use Blackhead like Search. Elasticsearch. So that's the one before the demo. Uh, we discussed with Charles, and uh, when he generates IoT data, where to store it. So that's a cross in time. We'll say we can use it for different demo purposes. And finally, we see this is the open source one and the popular open source one, purely. So let's do this one. So we can simply replicate it and in different places and do the demo. Um, 
As in earlier today, the Jupyter currently supports more than 30 different connectors to different data stores. So there are other things that you can leverage, such as Splunk, such as uh, Amazon Data Lake, and things like that. So in the next section, let's be more interactive. Please interrupt us anytime when you want to um, see something or you want if you have some questions. Basically, the, the next section will give you an idea about uh, what's a handbook look like. That is the first thing. We showed four handbooks that uh, executed or called by the OpenCG producer, and I will show you what the details they look like. And the second thing is, what does a cacao playbook look like on a higher level when, when the cacao playbook can kick off the open seat commands and kick off cash um, Those are the two most important things we're going to show next. And interrupt us anytime if you have any questions, and we can go into details. So for the handbook, um, I have a Jupyter version um, before I save it and give it to different open C2 consumers. So this is the handbook for the entire arm that break it up into four sections for, for different uh, purposes. For example, the first section is searching for an indicator of behavior. And this is the one that uh, uh, Charles showed earlier, that we are targeting T56.2 um, disabling firewall for both Windows and Linux. And since the data uh, Charles produced, they are monitoring the Windows system. So the Windows part of it works and it captures the IOB there. And uh, we, we can show what's the uh, host name, what's the process, which are the two pieces of uh, critical information to identify the process to take actions next. Um, usually in a production environment, you put Hundreds of thousand of data into one data lake index, like a like search um, index or maybe on some table and things like that. So you need the host information beside the process PID or UID to identify the process. And uh, okay. And the second handbook um, we filed is about to finding the ancestry tree to find what process create. So, okay, sorry, let, let me get it um, clear. The first one we find, this is the net message that disables the file, that matches the behavior we know. And the second handbook is actually just uh, five steps of hunt that are trying to find the ancestor five steps up to see who creates um, the, uh, who creates the net message is the same EIDXC. Who creates the same EIP? That's a bad idea. That's the one that Charles created for the, from methods for identifying, get it right. And uh, who created bad idea is a power share. And who created the power share is a reward. So you can easily see this and to echo one of the questions in the IOB session. How are we going to encourage and how are we going to reduce the false positives? When you only see a firewall disabled, it can be something denied. It can be a false positive. But when you see what's the ancestor of it, then you realize, oh, this looks like something malicious. Why most of the world gets into a power share and then create something and disable the firewall? Right. So when you, when you see all of these connected, then you see things Different. For example, another the third one we are doing is um, getting all the siblings about the uh, net message. So usually one uh, attacker is attacking the system. It does not only execute one malicious behavior. It will have multiple malicious behaviors that are sibling to each other. Um, so or some of them are maybe offspring of each other. So when we are discovering the sibling processes, all the IOB that we found, we may find more malicious activity to confirm this is really not a false positive. All this may be false positive. So here, when we find more activities of it, we see the shutdown, we see some of the uh, compost, usually the thing when you do uh, mini cast, you see this. So there are a lot of things that uh, 
we, we can, can find using other indicator of behavior match, or we can review when you are going around some of the, the indicators to get a context of it. This is getting a series. And the last count that we we executed through OpenC2 is a little bit special. We first get a network of traffic of all the processes um, that creates the from the access tree creates an NSH. We found some of the processes which could be command and control processes from a, a C2 server. To be sure, we correlate the view from the EDR system here to a network system. Um, I think Charles mentioned he monitored the network um, using some open source firewall, and so that that is some data he also has ingested into like the search that we correlate. Uh, an interesting demo we, we did before is sometimes when you have proxy traffic, from the EDR point of view, you do not see the real destination IP address. How do you see the real destination IP address, whether this is malicious or not? You can only correlate that or traffic for, uh, uh, and the, uh, the proxy one, so that now you know what's the alter path of the network traffic to find the real destination IP address. We just need the same thing. We use the source calls and the timestamp. Timestamp is automatically derived by Castro. So we use the source calls and timestamp to uniquely identify the network traffic from the EDR system, correlate that from the natural, and then show the real destination IDs um, from the, from the, the network flow traffic. Uh, yeah. So those are the uh, hunts that we executed um, through OpenC2. And I will pass it to Kevin to talk about the cacao playbooks. I think in this case, you're going to pass it to Dave rather than Kevin. <laughs> so we built a playbook that aligns with the demonstration. Um, you recall from the network diagram, we had the Quinkly Maha that we were going to use as an indicator. So each of the hunt flows that we invoked with an OpenC2 command were, were grouped into what we call stages in the playbook. The first step in each stage was to say, hey, we're going to do something. So turn the, the indicator yellow, then send the OpenC2 command following this list, which is what we just walked through. And then we wait for responses, which is a while statement in the playbook. Sorry, these first two are action, open C, action statements, both OpenC2 command type. Once we have responses, we assess them. And we're looking here now for that 200 status indicator where we can then display green or red, depending on the result. And so that's, that is the execution of one of the commands and the responses that Kevin illustrated, at which point we're now waiting for the human being to say, OK, we're ready to go on to the next stage in the demo. Next slide, please. You put that all together, and you get this playbook which each stage corresponds to one of those hunting actions. And had we had the ability to do the, um, the firewall activity, we could have added one additional stage at the end that did blocked traffic to the IP address that was found in the hunt. And with that, I will turn it back over. Actually, one more slide, please. Um, go ahead and roll forward. Um, this is a hunt book, or excuse me, a use case diagram we developed actually prior to last June's plug fest. And it's another illustration of how the techniques that we've demonstrated here could be integrated together. Kestrel, Cacao, OpenC2, and in this case, elements of a PACE system as well, um, and perhaps an EDR system. So uh, with that, I will turn it back over to the IBM guys to wrap up. Actually, I'll steal the mic for a second and say these lights were supposed to change color, but I was too busy herding cats on the rest of this uh, event, so I didn't finish my software. At previous events, he's actually changed color when he said some of the things he said. But uh, I did not update my software to the new versions, and it doesn't work. Sorry. 
Thank, Thank you, Dave. Dave. And uh, I, I think, think that's, that's all of us. And questions? You have a couple of minutes. Any questions in the room? Just a hundred. <laughs> <laughs> Can you talk more about the uh, Azure JSON Rise 10 first? Oh, 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 oh mine's super quick. quick. Um, this, this is this is crazy, fantastic. Just super quick question. I think you, you might have covered it, but I totally missed it. So when when Casserole was reaching out to the two completely disconnected environments in the cloud and talking to uh, EDR and SIM on one side and network on the other side, like what was it talking to? Were they were, the, were these things all different, or were some of these that I mentioned they were elastic? Were they both elastic, or were they all different things that was pulling together? I'm just curious. For the demo purpose, we have two elastic instances in the two environments to hold the data. But in the real world, they can be any data source that we talk to. For the demo purpose, because we need the uh, data source to contain the data actually has the attack. So <laughs> we see how that is. So, Load the data that charts generates. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Can you talk some more about the, how you do the correlation piece? I mean, are you using a sort of a traditional statistical, like multivariate correlation or password? How do you, and then can you, once you get those, those R values, whatever those coefficient values, are you able to set your thresholds as to whether they, they would appear as risks? Uh, good question. question. The question is, can we say more about how are we doing the correlation? And it is statistical correlation. The answer is, it's not a statistical correlation. It's a causality. So actually, we are working the problems graph of the entire. So when we get six blocks, when we get a large amount of six blocks, things will connect by themselves. So it's no longer individual line of loss. It's a gigantic graph. Think about one of me say that Microsoft Word spawns PowerShell. Another one of me say the PowerShell spawns bad idea by like SC. And another one of me say bad idea spawns CMD. So actually, if we get fine grant enough data from the, all the logs, most of the ER system actually are. We, we have a lot of things there. We can create a gigantic problem graph and work the graph and try to correlate. Even when we are correlating between different data sources, such as ER data and the natural data in this case, we actually are doing collaborative tracking, not a set of correlation. So thank, thank you very much. much. We're out of time. I know there's some more questions, but we can grab them after the break. Um, so if you guys could disconnect. And Brian, I believe you're up next. You connected. There we go. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I All right, I think I'm ready to go. I'm good to go. 
So I'm going to take kind of a change of pace here, and I'm going to talk about where I see things going, and that, that journey I've been on for three and a half decades now. But where I believe that we're going is towards full semantic graph analytics. So we've been working, uh, and this is just a graphic that to put the premise up front, uh, all the work that the TAC TC, the Threat Actor Context Technical Committee has been doing is meant to be vendor agnostic. Uh, the, the graphics that you'll see in this presentation were done by with Allegro Graph, which we heard done this awesome earlier talking about uh, LLMs and graphs and, and that. But the underlying technology is vendor agnostic. This just happens to be my platform of choice. I don't want to make that statement uh, clear up front. <laughs> I want to give you a little bit of an idea of who I am. Uh, back in the early 2000s, well, the, the late 90s and early 2000s, I, I was working at the Pacific Northwest National Lab in national security and working with large graphs at that point for the purposes of social theory. You know, why, why do terrorist groups uh, fragment? How do, they, how do they behave? So right from the beginning, in, in those days, I was looking at semantic graphs for the purpose of getting some insight into the behaviors of humans for national security purposes. Uh, that evolved into understanding insider threat at the, the National Laboratory. And that in turn evolved into the technology I was using seemed to be appropriate for monitoring nuclear proliferation, dual use, those kinds of analytics. Again, my background is I'm an electrical engineer on paper, but in this time frame, my acumen in the, the semantic technologies is evolving. Uh, from the nuclear fuel cycle, I went on to working within the laboratory's SOC, so the Security Operations Center. How am I taking inputs in from so many different appliances, fire eye appliance or um, the loss prevention appliance, or many different appliances, feeding data into these are sensors, unlike many of the, those that we've been talking about, detectors. Correlating those inputs so that I could tell and sort out the false positives. Anybody who's been working in uh, a similar environment, you're overwhelmed with false positives. We need to find ways to correlate the data, corroborative data, to understand whether or not we've got true positives that need attention. So, for 20 years, I've been working at the National Lab using knowledge representation and reasoning technologies. Invented some software to do reasoning <laughs> on very large graphs and keeping them logically consistent, which is an important part of uh, maintaining uh, a useful graph. And that led me to the point of spot an angel investor look at some of the things that were happening within the lab of those technologies. And I left the lab for 10 years to found a startup company based on these graph technologies. Until two years ago, when I started to work as a semantic technologist, a, a knowledge engineer at Semantic Arts. Five years ago, 2019, uh, Jane Yin, which we've I owe thanks to, and Basilios um, came together and, and formed the TAC-TC, the Threat Actor Context uh, Technical Committee. And that happened 
as, as I said, and on this timeline. I just wanted to give you an idea of who it was that was presenting. Who the talking head is up here? So as I said, we formed the Threat Actor Context Committee, uh, Technical Committee, back in 2019. The intent of the TAC TC was to take this underlying wonderful exchange language of sticks. And that's, that was the intent is to, to be able to, to exchange this threat intelligence structure, threat intelligence exchange, and extend it. Um, and the method of extension was to take this data and represent it in a semantic graph to create an ontology that as tightly as possible represented the 62.1 JSON uh, specification. So in representing that specification, we worked with some of the members of our, our uh, community, our TAC group. Uh, in particular, uh, we worked with Intel corporations, um, extension of their definition of threat actors. So the nice thing about the semantic graph is it allows us to extend the six language in a hierarchical sense. So now we can start classifying different types of threat actors. It, it, incredibly important, different types of threat actors have different indications of behavior. They have different patterns they follow. They have different motivations. They have all sorts of defining characteristics that we, if we examine those, if we do the graph analytics, we can start to classify and more know about the context of that threat actor to actually classify them. The nice thing about an ontology which governs the semantic graph is we can embed in that ontology, logic. It is not just a data store. We're storing the actual knowledge and the logic of the subject matter experts. In this case, the subject matter experts are really rare in our field. We all know this. You go find a, a, you know, a, a qualified cybersecurity analyst, and they're rare, and they've got a lot of knowledge about what it is that they're looking for and hunting for and how to find those things. And we can take some of the basic understandings that they have and embed that actually in the ontology so that we now are doing automated reasoning that simulates the subject matter experts to help them assist them. Those of us have been familiar with the pyramid of pain. This is the context within which we want to look at uh, threat actors. And, and it, consequently, it is how the threat actors tend to look at the, their targets. Things that are at the base of this pyramid are fairly easy. They're the antivirus stuff. They're the things that we can put hashes on, we can find you know, uh, particular IP addresses. These are the kinds of things that kitty scripters are capable of doing. But when you get to the top part of this pyramid, you get more sophisticated techniques, tactics, and procedures that the threat actors are using against the enterprise. The same is true if you invert this. So using that pyramid of pain, uh, we'll look at the fact that we can look at threat actors with that pyramid of pain. Likewise, the threat actors tend to look at the enterprises that they're attacking in the same way. I've inverted it here for purposes. And in between the threat actor and the enterprise, it's a lot of bit battleground here. The the point is, this is where all the activity happens. This is where we're looking for those indications of behavior. This is where we're looking for the interactions between that threat actor and the enterprise. This is where the evidence is going to come from. 
is where the appliances are looking for anomalies and behaviors. I've been a big fan of the, the Sun Tzu. What is this saying? It means that in our semantic graphs that we're storing data about the defenders and the aggressors is information about the enemy. What does behavior That's what threat intelligence is all about, right? What is it they're known to do? What can they do when they do it? As well as there's information about the local enterprise. Where are my crown jewels? What are my important business processes? You've got to know your enemy and you've got to know yourself. Far too few enterprises know themselves, I guess. Far too few know the, the attackers as well. But I've been a big fan of the sub -soup. An important thing that we wanted to do with the uh, threat actor context work was to build upon the sticks exchange language. This is really important. We, this was a body of work created over years to, to start to put together a language where we could exchange concepts in this domain. So what we wanted to do is build on that, not reinvent the wheel. We didn't want another, uh, another standard. We wanted to extend this standard, and that's what we built a 62.1 ontology on top of the 62.1 specification. And then we took that a step further and said, let's create a TAC ontology on top of that because the original Sticks ontology doesn't have those special classifications of threat actors, just got a threat actor. What if we want it to be extended so that there's an individual threat actor or a group of threat actors or a nation state threat actor or a mobster threat actor? We were able to create that for, in this case, the Intel Corp with these the threat actor context ontology, the hack ontology, sat on top of the six ontology, which sat on top of the six specification. And then as we got higher in the stack, we can start representing <coughs> other data sources that are important to understand the context. In this case, we actually went through four of the Intel Corporation and understood how they looked at threat actors and represented that. So what are the defining characteristics of these different classes of threat actors? This was all really very powerful, but what we found out by using a graph environment to represent the threat actor context, we got a big bonus. This wasn't just useful in understanding threat actors. This was useful in understanding the entire environment that we were working in. So analytics all of a sudden went on, uh, on high beams, if you will. I'm gonna quote this gentleman up here that you heard earlier in the day. Semantic knowledge graphs are the underlying framework for the ability to seamlessly connect to access and query all data sources relevant to the enterprise. So I firmly believe this. As I said, I've been working in knowledge representation and reasoning for 30 years, and I'm of the firm belief that the semantic graph has been underutilized. And in the last year, we've seen significant advancements. And with the generative AI capabilities that are happening now, as, as John talked about earlier, there are great rewards by building upon the semantic graph as an analytic structure.
So what was the real benefit? We started out representing additional information about threat actors and the context around threat actors. And we did that by putting much more information into a semantic graph that we could analyze. So really, basics of what we did and what we can demonstrate now is in the GitHub repository, which is poorly documented. I need some help. This is a recruitment statement. We really need some help in the threat hacker context committee to document the utilities and, and that which we are demonstrating here in these slides. Uh, because it's powerful, and I want it in the hands of people that will make use of it. But we've been able to take six 2.1 JSON, run it through some of the code that is on our GitHub, uh, in our GitHub repository to create a knowledge graph that conforms to the six specification. And that gives us, in, in this case, I'm showing you a little bit of information about the uh, Olympic destroyer uh, from a report that uh, many of you worked on uh, in this course of uh, putting together this uh, event here today. So what's the point? The point is sticks is being adopted. Sticks is being used. Companies are exchanging threat intelligence via sticks. And now we have a new way of looking at that. We can take that sticks, convert it into a graph, and put it into a platform where we can start analyzing. We can start looking for connections. We can start looking for patterns. We can start querying those. Here's a case where I started to look at a man hit report. This is on a, a ransomware group. How to conduct investigations, I guess, is the point. <laughs> What's really going on here? We, we need to find a way to make all these dispersed data sets, whether they be from MITRE and their attack framework, whether they be from NIST and their uh, cybersecurity uh, modeling framework, or from private sector. Uh, let's look at things like the, the Lockheed Martin kill chain. It's a, it's a, life cycle of a threat. We, we have tons of data from NIST, LIDAR, private sector. We have tons of data, but we need to make it semantically interoperable. They, they often speak different languages. So we need to bring them under, let's not make yet another standard. You know that I, I love the cartoon that we showed earlier in the day. You got 14 standards. Somebody will go, oh man, that's way too many. Let's write an overarching standard. Now we have 15 standards to go by. You know, we need the technology to bring these different languages together so that they're talking together. We don't need to invent another language. Let's let's make the ones we've got talk together. What are the cyber domains? We call it the cyber terrain. Uh, you know, you've got the enterprise who's surrounded. Literally, I, some months ago, I created this uh, graphic in about 10 minutes. So I, there wasn't a lot of thought into the logic of where this is not meant to be a real intensive Venn diagram here. But just in a few minutes, I started to say, well, around that enterprise, we've got a bunch of people that are trying to assess the risk. That enterprise. We've got a bunch of people and a, a bunch of standards around the controls to mitigate those risks. You know, you've got 853, their set of controls. You've got Center for Internet Security with all of their controls. You've got the private controls and policies of the enterprise themselves. You've got business processes. What, what's happening at that uh, enterprise? You've got the gold. The, the crown jewels, the assets of that country. You've got vulnerabilities in those assets and software that's being run and malware against that software. 
You've got techniques, tactics, and procedures of the threat actors. Every one of these, there's a group of people writing a bunch of information, forming a bunch of language around each one of those. We need to bring them all together. Not recreate them, but bring them all together. So we've got many sources of models and data. You've got National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, you've got MITRE uh, and their MITRE attack. Fortunately, a lot of these are already adopting the six format. For instance, MITRE, all, all of the information that you're going to see loaded in some of these graphs came in six format. We didn't have to do anything but just run it through that conversion software I talked about earlier. All of a sudden, we've got all of that available to us. You've got NSA, you've got CIS, you've got uh, Homeland Security, uh, you've got the OASIS standards, fix itself. Uh, you've got human subject matter experts who have developed the trade craft at each of their individual enterprises, and this is a big deal. This is a big deal because those human analysts have got a trade craft that they've tailored to that enterprise they're trying to defend. And the moment they get enticed by a higher salary or go to a different enterprise, the new guys have to relearn. It takes them about 18 to 24 months just to learn the specifics of that enterprise. But by adopting this kind of technology, you can onboard those new analysts quicker because the logic, the base logic is embedded in there. It's a training tool. So the point of this one is I repeated that screw in a diagram, but we've got data from lots of different sources. Now with TAC, we've got, a, we've got an early adopter. We haven't even had the TAC released, the first official release yet. We need to get there. We need to get there. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at my cohorts. We all know we need to get there to get that first official release. But the company I work for, we've decided to be an early adopter of the TAC ontology and start to make the connections between all of these different sources. We need to be able to connect the dots. So this happens to be a graphic, looks like a big, uh, maybe a flower garden for all I know. Um, but on one side of this graphic, I've got data that talks about the CVE, the Common Vulnerability Enumeration, and how a CVE is connected to, you know, a record of that CVE. And as we start to look through, maybe created an animation here. As we start to look through the different kinds of connections there are, we're connecting the dots all the way from a CVE, which we might get from a vulnerability scan, and that's a scan of our system that says, hey, you've got these pieces of equipment that are subject to vulnerabilities from these CVEs. I can actually do an analytic on this underlying knowledge graph to understand who might be uh, an intrusion set that will capitalize on that CVE. Who can exploit it? Not that they, they have exploited. We're not trying to do uh, attribution at this point, but who could it be? Those are the kinds of questions that these analytics can answer for us. If you looked at that pattern, that uh, big flower garden that we just looked at, it connected the common vulnerability exchanges down to specific intrusion sets that might take advantage of that. With the technology of the knowledge graph, we can create queries to say, I want to look for that pattern. Maybe this pattern isn't this one from CVEs or intrusion sets, but maybe this is a query that identifies indication behavior. 
or it might be a query that says, I'd like to know what cacao playbooks are effective against this sort of situ situation. And we can get visualizations, and this is important. I'm a visual guy. I want to see things in a, in a form that makes sense to me. A lot of text running through in front of my screen is good, but I like to see graphical representations of that. And that's what I've got kind of centered out here, the, the lower left-hand side. Sequoia Stakes Report just converted information that's there. Here's an IOB sticks data indication. Started to look into that, do some visual queries against that data, and pulled up in this particular case one of the particular uh, patterns that illustrate the steps of this, this uh, indication of behavior. One thing I will note here Another plug for recruitment, okay, is that we have in our software the ability to uh, translate the six 2.1 specification, six data, into the six ontology to represent it. But the extensions, in the case of cow playbooks, in the, in the case of indications of behavior, they're not recognized yet, but it's really just a matter of time at the keyboard. So that's one of the next things that we need to do is to get the conversion software that TAC has developed to recognize the cow playbooks and indications behavior. And a lot of other extensions made by the minor program, you know, anything X dash. Yeah, go ahead. Couldn't they write their own ontology to augment and add on? Repeat the question, and you have five minutes. Couldn't, couldn't they, any, any group, whether it be minor or whether it be any others, write their own ontological extension so that it's available? And the answer is yes, they could. And it's, it's not difficult. We could, we could put together the process for doing that. Thank you for the straight hand question. Good. Um, we want to start uh, supporting investigation. A lot of these observations uh, come from humans in the loop. So we've got to have a platform that, that enables the human in the loop to add new uh, observations, to add new data. Uh, we need to extend this so that case management is supported. Um, we need to work on developing the canned queries that we know go along with the general type of investigation. These are all things that are easily doable. Again, just a little bit of time up keyword. Uh, Sparkle queries. And graphical queries, I think between um, what I can what I can demonstrate, I chose not to do live demonstrations. I chose to use slides, but certainly underneath the covers, we're running. Uh, I can run a live demonstration to show anybody that wants to do it. I really appreciated an earlier reference to the OODA loop uh, because it is a matter of collecting evidence. It's, Getting situational awareness about that evidence or analyzing that evidence, making a decision on that, and yet again responding to it. So the OODA loop is something I resonated with. And with that, I'm going to open up for questions. Maybe get us on, keep us on schedule. Any questions in the room? Yep. Yep. How similar is the, uh, the building of the of attack of the threat actor context to building of personas? Is it the, yeah, first, first at the individual level, 
And then how do you sort of uh, elaborate that to be in the class or abstract it to class level? And, and it's a really good question. So way back here in the way back machine, that's what you get for using animation. It takes you a while to get there. This is the classification schema that Intel Core came up with. And I know it's an eye chart. It wasn't intended to be that, but it is an eye chart. And what they did is they went down and said, to us, what, what's a reckless employee? To us, what's a competitor look like? To us, what is a, a government? They use the word spy. I'm, I'm not going to say it. You know, uh, but a nation state, I'm just quoting Intel Corps there. Um, what, what is an organized crime for actor look like? These were the defining characteristics that they associated with these different classes of threat actors. So what we do in the ontology is we just use formal logic to say that a competitor is a six threat actor and has these additional specific characteristics that work in the same industry as we do or all of the defining characteristics. So in this case, you're able to build a matrix or a set of algorithms that say, provide the classification scheme and that's embedded into the ontology. So no human analyst has to look at the data and say, oh, this is a competitor or this is a nation state. Those characteristics are all defined in the ontology and a reason automatically classifies them for you. Does that answer your question? So thank you very much, Ryan. We are now out of time, but the next thing up on the agenda is a break. So we have a 10-minute break at this point. So again, those on the phone, just hang tight, and we will uh, be back in 10 minutes. And those in the room, you can put by a break, grab something to drink, and obviously ask Ryan or any of the other speakers more questions if you want. Great. Uh, well, really sort of announcement to make is uh, we have discovered part of the audio, audio problems uh, that with the people on the phone is that is the five green lights in the in the roof that you're seeing here are all very good acoustical microphones. So this past session went really well because everyone was quiet and I was walking back and shutting people off. But just to be aware that now we're all really quiet. If you do have a side conversation, everybody on the phone's listening. So you probably don't want that. Oh.
Yeah. Yeah. Test test. There you go. We're on. So do it. Keep trying. Test test. Anybody can hear me online? Better now. So, yes. uh, as a part, as a part of our also, we have uh, created several uh, libraries that can be used in separation. So, one of them is energy validation schemas. It is now an official work um, um, offered to the Kakao TC um, that can validate playbooks in a quite easy manner. Um, we have also created with a Small uh, code snippet that you can run to actually validate your playbook. Uh, we have created the Kakao JavaScript library, it's actually TypeScript, so that the name came before the TypeScript came <laughs> to this project, uh, which uh, generally allows you to create Kakao uh, playbooks in an easy, more easily manner, uh, similar to how uh, the Python library for sticks uh, exist. To create to generate six uh, content. Um, uh, well, uh, <clears throat> the third library that we have created is the live extension. This is also a work that we have contributed to Kakao DC. It is now official work of Kakao DC and it's also come to uh, the community specification level. So then uh, we are thinking about to integrate that version to the next version of the Kakao so that we can. Uh, um, visualize the table the way we want to show it in the graph of the user interface. Since the workflow have a flow that you want to present. Uh, one more work that we have uh, published as a separate uh, report is also the execution status, and uh, I will uh, talk about uh, more about that later. But basically, we want to in the future, integrate this uh, code uh, roster with some orchestrator, and then we need to have the status of how did we perform, did we perform the action correctly, did it fail, did it success. So we have tried to uh, create a good standard of a template at least that we can follow so that we have all the information we need. Um, and showing, of course, we have the information to the user. So then uh, now I'm going to go a little back and forth. I hope you, uh, I will not hurt your eyes. So this is the, again, kind of uh, architecture of cacao. And this is uh, what I want to show that how we implemented all these parts inside the roster so that you can be, uh, it will be easier for you to utilize them. Like. So first of all, this is uh, metadata. Uh, these are metadata. Oh, okay. I need that one. So, this is the actual uh, web application. Um, when you open the application, you are presented with this view, which uh, can uh, allow you to either create a playbook, we need to do soon. We can import a playbook from a file, or we can import it as text. You can uh, simply copy paste a cacao JSON view, or you can put a uh, base 64 and put the cacao I will uh, show that shortly. Uh, at the bottom, we have uh, a user settings, which is this one is small configuration file. We have also implemented the configuration file itself, so you can populate these uh, uh, variables or constants uh, back there. So here we have the user identifier. This is the identifier of the creator of the table, so the user of these applications. Usually, people have uh, or organization create uh, six, uh, um, uh, six 
this uh, identities in here. <laughs> and uh, this um, identifier um, point into the identity. For the demo purposes, we have also integrated um, the configuration for private and public keys, which of course shouldn't be shared with the <laughs> screen. Uh, however, we have created one pair of keys so that you can play with the uh, rows that are here and you don't need to really generate the new keys. So you need to click here to use the demo keys and of course to remove them out of but uh, having that, we can then show how we can also digitally sign the playbook. So let's create a new playbook. Here is the view that we will be presented, and it is the workbench. So the whole uh, screen that you are seeing is in the context of one Kakao uh, playbook. And the first uh, um, field here that I showed you is so okay, pointing on the metadata. So for me, yeah, I see this, I will not do that too many times. It turns size. <laughs> so for the metadata, uh, we have a button here in the corner, implementing all the metadata from the cacao. And they are quite important, especially for the future when we're going to integrate this browser with other systems uh, like node management system for tables. So in there, you want to be able to filter and sort, uh, search for the label. For this uh, reason, you need to have some labels, some types, some what the what the label does, label activities. Label. We have also other um, properties for label processing summary. Meaning, you can summarize what the label does, what kind of capabilities does does it use. Does it use logic? Does it use loops? Does it use variables? Because especially when you're going to integrate that with a SOAR, you need to know what kind of capabilities you are able to use and if you can really parse and execute that. So all these um, properties are in the so side panel in the playbook level. It's therefore it's in the header in the top of the application to be easily accessible all the time. And uh, here we can see all the structure of the playbook uh, overall uh, encapsulating object. Because then we want to write. Oh, no. uh, <laughs> <laughs> as you can see, the Kakao playbook can encapsulate everything inside. So we have the metadata, we have the workflows. I will show the workflows right now. And then we have the other information authentication information, agent targets, data markets. Extension and digital signatures. Mm. So for uh, for uh, work process, it's what people will mostly use. Well, mostly, all, all of these things are super important. But the, what, what takes most of the screen here is are actually the work process. And all all work process from Kakao are presented here on the side panel here. Yeah. Which can be used as a drag and drop manner. So that should be super easy to generate whatever step you would like. And as you see, every time I'm dropping a new step, the workload, the workload step, a side panel is opening. So in the side panel, you can see all the properties specified in Kakao for that workload step. So this is uh, as easy as just drag and drop. Uh, we can connect it with. Uh, arrows for uh, which are the connections in the cacao uh, on different types of connections. I will also show that. Um, <coughs> yeah, so all the um, Drag and drop is one way of creating these labels, but there's also another way which I like more. It's what we call contextual menu, which, which are the small panel appearing here. Let me make it actually it's bigger. Uh, this panel shows you only the workflow steps and the connections that are allowed from this particular step. 
So by creating a batch of stuff, it's create automatically a, a connection between start and answer. So in start, we will see, okay, we will not see here, but I will show also how we find that. Because we, we can then see the connection between these two because it's irrelevant for uh, the human being to write in the ID of the next step. It is not a uh, good user experience. So we have hidden this part of the application because we can do it automatically. However, if you would like to see what this really is, we have also implemented the second that here with this uh, actual JSON representation of in the file format of that particular step. <coughs> you can see that this step has an ID of type, of type star, and it has an unconditioned uh, relationship, let's call it, connection with the action set. That is the uh, ID of the action set. So from here, now, uh, for example, if I end up the book, you can see immediately we have created an unconditioned set, uh, unconditioned um, relationship to the end step. And now when I click on the end step, there is nothing more I can do. I can only delete that set. Because this, uh, by specification, the last thing you will do in that particular branch and or type. So going further in the um, Kakao specification, uh, action step is uh, quite powerful, the workflow step. It can uh, do many things. <laughs> um, and it can perform that, these things by uh, having these um, sp uh, specific properties for that action, which are command, agent, and targets. And uh, the action step will then uh, execute the commands that are specified in the command property, send it to the uh, send it to the agent, and the agent will execute that uh, these commands on the target. So we can show that as well. So inside we have a uh, open vocabulary for uh, uh, different commands. So we can see we have a open school, possibly we can see open school, Kestrel, Jupyter, Sigma. HTAVI, hash, but also manual, because we know people want to automate, but we cannot automate from zero to 100. So actually, we can create a fully manual table, but it's included in cow format, which is standardized, and then we can automate as we go. So then we can change one and one step to actually be a command that will be sent to an agent and not people need to do it manually. So <clears throat> for the command, we have a description. Mm -hmm. Show lines. Uh, not super creative. And the command will be ls. So we have two uh, ways of putting commands. Either you want to put command in a normal plain text, or you want to put them in the base 64 and all the version, because as we know, uh, the spacing and uh, white spaces matter in different languages. So if you want uh, to have a multiple line command, use the uh, base64 command. And as we have said, uh, we are saying here, we are actually displaying in the playbacks. So you can really write commands here in multiple lines, but then when you confirm, it will be automatically included in base64. So that you don't need to bother that. We can also uh, choose what kind of uh, playbook activity it performs. Is it delivering content? Is it identifying audience? We have this is also an open vocabulary from uh, from um, specification. And then because of that, you can also filter of, uh, in the future knowledge management system for this particular step that perform isn't the uh, identifying audience. And of course, we can add external references, which is uh, quite yeah, referencing my track, for example. Um, yeah, so as we saw, we, as I told you previously, we have the JSON uh, tab to see the commands. 
uh, or let's see the real JSON of uh, this particular work was done. And here we can see that this command actually was basically 64 in code. So we have one command, but uh, we want to do something. It was a batch command, so we want to send to somebody. So here we can add an uh, agent. Uh, in specification, this is defined as I, uh, you need to put an identifier of an agent. But again, this is not good user experience. So we have created a way to do it to create new agent uh, here, or if we have um, existing agent labels, they will appear here. So, so you can just move on. So we, we can create a um, stage with a name. So, so we uh, now we see that this uh, preferred uh, uh, web browser is Chrome. <laughs> I'm just saying, I just uh, opened everything in uh, Safari for privacy reasons. <laughs> so, this is uh, an improvement point. <laughs> um, however, when you, you have again a list of uh, possible. Uh, Items to choose, we can have IPv4, IPv6, and to Mac, URL, and VLAN. Uh, and this an array of these addresses. So now we can put several addresses we want to send to. Um, and we can select that, confirm, and now we have an agent in this action step. So we have this command being sent to this server. And now we have two situations because the agent can actually be also the target, both you can execute something immediately on an SSH. Uh, however, uh, as it's written in um, Kakao, we have the uh, possibility to actually send the action that we want to be performed to an agent, so to an organization, and then inside the organization, somebody needs to do the command execution on that particular target. So the same uh, goes here for the target. You can create targets from the in the same manner. This uh, agent and targets are actually the same object. It's just the uh, semantic meaning here that is a bit different. So that we can also, uh, for example, it would be make more sense to actually provide the location for to be an agent and then the SSH to be a target in this particular case. Let me perform that action. <laughs> uh, during the steps, when we send in something, we are also expecting sometimes an answer. For that reason, we have the step variables that we can define to uh, get an answer from that uh, uh, agent. This will be the answer. We have the type. Type, I believe, from this will be string or M. And the value is empty for now because I want to use that variable as an out argument to get actually the answer from the agent if the action was performed successfully or not, or possibly they want to return me whatever IP address that I need to perform other actions. But uh, and of course other um, properties from the cloud like delay timeout and who owns that particular action. And uh, several, uh, several objects or constructs in the cloud can be extended. Here we can see that we have the step, step extension. Um, this is still a work in progress because that is quite uh, difficult. We need to actually know the schema of the extension to be able to show something in the in the um, uh, roster. However, we support or we have integrated the support for extension and in particular the layouting extension. In the metadata, um, uh, 
um, we can also define uh, other important things priority, severity, and impact of this particular value. We can uh, have uh, relate, uh, related papers. We can see also which paper this paper was derived from, um, which industry sector it uh, affects. We can add labels. Um, for example, and um, so we can see the labels of labels in the header, so we have better overview of what kind of what does what this label does because we can, um, yeah, it's like ads. Uh, also, when you send a uh, uh, command to an uh, SSH uh, agent, possibly you need to authenticate. So we have also the authentication information definition, where we can simply put the logging um, information for that particular system. And again, should you populate it here? Possibly not, but we have also um, support for the. Uh, uh, key management system. So we can just put an identifier and then the background populate with the keys. But this is then not part of the federal security. We can create the uh, data markings, TLP marking. We all know and like TLP. This can be green. And then in the um, so this is only the definition to actually use that, that marking we need to provide that information here. When we do that, then we have the indicator of that as well, both here and here. Since I have uh, created this playbook and I click this use uh, demo keys for private and public keys, but I, I populate them. I also have the ability to actually sign this playbook. Which is uh, quite fine. Um, let's say I'm signing in, so everybody trusts me, right? Uh, we can uh, choose the algorithm that we want to use and sign it. And then we, can, uh, we have this verify button where we can verify the uh, signature itself and to actually believe me. Uh, changed playbook with this type of he spelled it just like I did. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, the, the point was, was I manipulated the, play, the playbook and now the signature is not valid. So let's so remove the typo and the playbook is back to its original state and the play, and the uh, signature is valid. So this is quite important. Uh, Feature for the Kaggle playbooks because people uh, are going to start uh, create uh, uh, translators because Kaggle is standardized open source. So why do not, do not use that? So people will possibly in the future create uh, marketplaces for playbooks, but uh, now they can sell it in Kaggle format. They will include uh, their knowledge in a standardized manner. And also because we want to know if we can trust this playbook. If um, uh, we have a um, um, intrusion uh, in attack and we are essentially created a playbook, we would like to know who created that playbook. That's one thing. But also we would like to know if anybody else have been trusted this playbook. So if I get a playbook and I see that big layer A, big layer B, B and C has assigned this playbook, possibly I will believe that and want to use that playbook as well. Um, so to make it also easier to understand the playbook, um, we created the visualization, right? But here are things hidden as well to not pollute the graph. So we have uh, created a, what we call the expand mode, so especially for a uh, action step, what it does, it actually shows the uh, commands that we have put inside the action step and the agent and the targets. So you can 
that uh, gets quicker and better grasp of what this playbook actually is doing. You have a really complicated one in there. Once again, you have a really complicated <laughs> one in there. Yes. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we went, went through, through all these uh, things here. So you about five minutes, we can go a couple minutes over because we started just. Okay, thank, thank you very much. much. And I will go uh, super light. Uh, so here is a uh, more complicated actual uh, cacao playbook that was um, uh, executed in, a, in the context of a European project. Um, so thanks to us to provide that and i have it already open here so here we can take a look at how this playbook works or how it's created and what it is so this is a business continuity playbook for a false data injection <coughs> so the playbook start always with a startup and then we follow the flow and um, <clears throat> the first uh, step is to initiate the incident response, and these three steps happen in parallel, and or, or uh, this is how they are encoded. But what the uh, backend capabilities are, uh, and we cannot know. But these steps can be executed in parallel if your system supports that. So first, we go to the uh, management uh, management system to create a case. And uh, then we have the incident information and, and some tasks, and then this branch is over. So we backtrack to parallel set. And at the same time, we have not, not to, uh, notified about the, the trigger playbook, and we have this branch as well. So that these are quite important stuff, uh, um, the end steps, especially for the orchestrator to understand that we need to stop here. Uh, we have already plans to improve that, uh, the visualization here to not pollute the graph so possibly we can like hide the end steps where you don't need to see them and only include the end step for the end of the playbook. Um, yeah, the third step here is the software defined networks. Uh, we check, uh, we uh, do the segmentation, the uh, VLAN segmentation. We easily the cost we check if the host uh, is an advanced matter infrastructure. If it is, then we go downstairs on this is on two, and this is a conditional step. And then we activate standby the advanced meter infrastructure. And I was not part of creating this table, so uh, I need to remember what this all short uh, words means. Uh, when this completes, we go to isolate the host and smart meters, or this again the uh, uh, conditional step if it's actually isolated, or if yes, start a factory reset on smart meters and restore the smart meters off to the operation network. So, as I said, this is a business continuity play. If something happens, you want to take your business back to oper normal operation. So, this and uh, this uh, branch ends then. This front ends, and we uh, go back to the parallel step. And this parallel step go on condition here to the next parallel step. And we have these three actions that happens also simultaneously. Uh, two actions uh, running simultaneously. Yeah. Again, notification, update the case, export the report uh, of the incident. So th this is a uh, Real playbook a bit more advanced. Uh, I also promised Charles to use his playbook, <laughs> and um, uh, here I can show what I thought he would do. <laughs> um, so that uh, what we have implemented also from actually his um, uh, request or yeah use case. We can actually export this playbook as six two point one course of action playbook extension. So let's do that. And I also checked for export with coordinates. 
So we have the same structure when we work again. So we do that. Um, now it's a more advanced demo upcoming. Course of action is here. So here we can see this uh, six bundle. Where with, a, with one object is a first action object, with one extension is the playbook extension, and we have down there a base 64 encoded playbook. So that's right. Yeah, not using the um, So we are going back to our. Our roster, and now we can import text and we can import the base 64 and call it Kakao Playbook. And we wait. <laughs> the, as it decodes the base 64. Two or three minutes. Uh, actually, yeah. there it is. Way. So, Less uh, manual work for you. You can now just uh, it's, uh, it's write the several commands, just copy paste that label. Um, so we translated it from sticks it is, into this picture. We have created and published a sticks extension for labels, and inside there we have populated the properties. And we specify that this is a cow playbook, and then inside the playbook base 64 property, we have encoded a cacao in base 64. So we basically took that part and imported in the uh, in the uh, Yeah, but what next? We want to execute, but how? And then uh, here is what the uh, look at about the earlier Sparka. So is a uh, institute from the uh, research institute in Netherlands, you know. Um, they are creating uh, and already open sourced the orchestrator that supports uh, cacao. And uh, as those who mentioned the track earlier, it was not working until uh, almost this morning. <laughs> so this is a uh, quite 0 0.1 version of that integration. So now that we have these two open source projects, we have an open source way of executing standardized security labels. So a few words of, uh, on the demo. We have a target system. This is a Docker container with a Linux uh, file server running a web shop. Uh, and this web shop that contains a model that creates a vector. And we want to, uh, we have a small playbook that after accessing the uh, new server, stopping the process, and removing the malicious file. So it keeps the shell. Uh, how we do that? We click that button, and that button, and we go. <laughs> yeah, that should be enough. So here is the playbook. We delete, delete the model, we do the process. Yeah. Almost the same order I said. So we have the integration. This is the SORC integration. This is the endpoint that, uh, that I'm currently running the SORC backend. And we have some limitations. I will write a bit more here because this is what we support right now. So this is only the SSA agent and the HTTP API. And, uh, Variables are um, translated or transposed inside the commands, but we cannot really use that much six patterning yet because it needs to be supported for the market. So um, let's see if we can manage to do it. Up it on stick here. So we are in the network, we are sending. <laughs> And that was 200 OK. And uh, I already noticed that I forgot to actually show you the shell and the file server, which was running here. And it's the 
display because I haven't refreshed the website. So I think I need to go ahead and move that. And you don't see it. Okay. Um, so it was here. It's not here. So let us do it one more time. Uh, and we can do it like so. I'm putting up the web shell again. So we have this file server. We can, it's so secure that you can do actually the commands inside the URL. So this is the uh, process that we want to kill and, uh, uh, of it and remove the file, the web shell. And yeah, it's working as a normal web shell, so you can do whatever you like. You can see the processes. Yeah, so this is the process we are going to kill. So again, uh, not super <coughs> difficult integration, so Arca, boom. And uh, this uh, looks like it was 200, okay, again. And this hopefully is killed now. Yep. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> 30 seconds? 30 seconds. 30 seconds. But remember, you're holding everyone from yes. happy hour. Happy hour, yeah. Oh my God. I'll hold them after you're done. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the button on the front end. What happens in the back end is one of the architectures that Luca showed. So we have the front end here. This is the roster. We were tweaking the playbook, which is an API endpoint. And then uh, we have used this capability here, which is the SSH capability. So this is what actually happened uh, behind the scenes. Um, and why is this showing? Uh, so the work, uh, future work, let's call it, or the current ongoing work is that we are going, uh, working directly with TNO to actually connect these two uh, uh, open source projects. So we are uh, creating the report, that they are creating the report module that we can ask how this action development went, and we are going to put uh, create a more tight integration uh, by possibly yeah, other technologies that we can communicate more in the real time. And we will do it with a template schema that we have also developed to make that more standardized. Yes, that was it. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you very much. Just a couple of closing notes. Um, my 15 minutes, I'll do it in three. I wouldn't need it in 15, but I might in order than three. But I'll try not to stand between you and Happy Hour, which is being hosted by Baraton and is at the open road, which means to sort of follow the herd of everyone else going there or look it up on Google Maps. It's only uh, a couple blocks away. Um, I would ask if the presenters could send their slides to either of the Janes. Um, there's two Janes involved, Jane Hart in the back from Oasis and Jane Ginn, who's the secretary of CASP. Get it to either one of them and they'll get it to each other. We are going to put all the slides together some people. Uh, and even if the speakers for tomorrow, if they can give them to them ahead of time, it'd be even better. Um, but for those of you who did present, you can do it. I did note uh, that your slides were labeled DLP green. I did note that the Paraton slides were labeled Paraton proprietary. This is an open organization, so... Um, it's really all TLP white, right? Because anyone's going to get at it. So, um, so be aware of that and maybe change your markings or clean it up. Like they're going out on the internet either way. So. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and I just wanted to, to thank uh, everybody involved. I think it's been a great first day. Um, if you think back to the first one of these at uh, NSA Cyber Command, I think it was seven years ago, might even been longer. Um, we have come a really, really long way with what we have here. I think we really are at a cost where we're, we're about to really make a, a major um, uptick in, in the use of all this stuff. So thank you all. I hope to see you all over at the open road. Take care.